brothers and sisters, this is the Remnant Warrior from Kingdom Productions Network. I wanted to thank you all for watching this video and all Kingdom Productions Network content and ask that you please hit the like button because it truly helps the channel grow and new people see the content. And if you aren't already subscribed, please consider hitting the subscribe button and the notification bell so that you'll know each time we upload new content. Grace and peace. Muhammad, the founder of the Islamic religion, came on the scene about 600 years after Jesus and his apostles. He claimed he was the final prophet of the Abrahamic God, and that much of what the Jews and the Christians believed was wrong. He denied the Christian teaching of Jesus being God's divine son, thereby relegating Jesus to the status of a mere man, a mere prophet. Doing this, he also implicitly denied the Christian doctrine of the Trinity. He also denied Jesus' sacrificial death and resurrection for sins. Instead, he put his followers under a set of Islamic laws, which he claimed led to salvation, if followed. Such ideas resulted in his followers, the Muslims, claiming that the Jewish and Christian scriptures had been corrupted. In this documentary, we will examine whether Muhammad's views are true, and if he was a true prophet of God as Muslims believe. We will also discern if his book, the Quran, is from God. To do this, we will be scrutinizing the earliest Islamic sources on Muhammad's life and teaching. We will be studying the Quran, the Hadith or Sunnah literature containing the sayings and deeds of Muhammad, the early biographies or Sirah literature of Muhammad, and histories of Islam, as well as Islamic scholars and commentators. We will historically consider if Muhammad was correct in his denial of Jesus' deity, death for sins, and resurrection by approaching the ancient Christian sources using the criteria of authenticity historians use to discern historical truth. Was Muhammad the final messenger of God sent to correct, corrupted, and false teaching? Or was Muhammad a false prophet sent by Satan to mislead people away from the truth of salvation and Jesus Christ? Join us as we consider these crucial questions exegetically, historically, and rationally. When discerning if Muhammad was a true prophet, it is important to consider his character. According to Muslims in the Quran, Muhammad is a beautiful pattern of conduct and an exalted standard of character. In fact, Muslims claim Muhammad was the final prophet of God for all mankind in all time. In light of this, when we examine the early Muslim sources, we should expect to find a Muhammad who is a moral ambassador of God. However, we actually discovered countless abominable immoralities and examples of utter unnecessary ruthlessness in Muhammad's life. Muhammad is a man who married more women than his own revelations allow. He married the wife of his own adopted son. After Muhammad lusted after his adopted son's wife because of seeing her scantily dressed, his adopted son then divorced her and Muhammad shortly thereafter married her, claiming this was ordained by God. Surah 3337 of the Quran mentions this episode thus showing Muhammad believed his God supported this immorality, quote, Then when Zayd had dissolved his marriage with her, with the necessary formality, we joined her in marriage to thee, unquote. What a convenient revelation to suit Muhammad's desires. This is adultery according to the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 5.32 says, Everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery." Unquote. Muhammad, if he is a man for today, let me ask you, why is it he married a girl who was only six and then consummated when she was nine, and he was 53 years old? What did he do to the Jews in Medina? Look at what he did. He didn't even come from Medina. He came from Mecca. He moved to Medina in 622. By 624, he started confronting the Jews that were living there. And he threw out the Bonacan in the family in the first year. Uh, 624. A year later, in 625, he threw out the Bonacan in the other family. In 627, he took all 800 men of the Bonacan family, gave them spades, had them dig their own trenches, and then slipped their throats and let them fall into the trenches. 800 men in one afternoon. Is this a man that's a model for today? Do you really want to follow a man like that? See, I'd rather come back to Jesus Christ. You want a man who's for today? Come back to Jesus. He never let us, ever, he didn't let anybody, use, he never used violence himself, and even when violence was done against him, the one time that the disciples came to his defense, as he was being arrested there in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter comes up and cuts off the ear of the servant that's arresting him. What does Jesus do? He takes the ear, puts it back on the servant, turns toward Peter, and says, put away your sword. For he who lives by the sword, dies by the sword. Matthew 26, verse 52, Ooh, I love my Jesus. In the law of God, we're told that people are to love the Lord their God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength, and that we're also to love our neighbor as ourselves. This, Jesus said, for example, is the first and second greatest commandment of the law. Muhammad can be seen to have fundamentally violated this in any number of ways. Uh, we even see in the Islamic literature that Muhammad is uh, granted such an authority that he can even make the boast that he stipulated the terms or conditions of a covenant with Allah, and that Allah was not to transgress this. This is a fundamental violation of everything uh, biblical insofar as God is always the one who makes covenants and imposes them on people. People don't have the right to uh, 
stipulate the terms of a covenant and impose them on God and say that he has to follow them or else. And yet, uh, just to give an example of this in the Hadith literature, we're told in numerous Hadith that Muhammad would act, often lose his temper, and in the course of this he would end up cursing or even beating someone. And one particular case, we're told uh, Muhammad saw a slave or an orphan girl, and he cursed her. When her caregiver found out about this, she came to Muhammad and asked him what this was all about, and Muhammad smiled at her. And then he, he said this, he says, do you not know that I made a covenant or a condition, a term with Allah, that whoever I curse, you know, if they don't deserve it, then Allah is supposed to make it a source of blessing for that person. So you, know, you see what's going on here. It's, it's not simply that Muhammad is saying, don't worry about it. Uh, everything's going to be okay. If this person didn't deserve it, that's all right, because Allah is going to bless that person. What actually is going on here is in the course of covering his tracks for why he would do this sort of pernicious evil, Muhammad actually tells us that he made a covenant. He stipulated conditions or a term that Allah was not to transgress. This is the height of arrogance, and it's an arrogance not simply in vaunting oneself over and against somebody that uh, has greater authority than you, but in this case, the God of the universe, the God who made heaven and earth, Muhammad and all creatures, and yet here's one of his creatures pretending to be in a position to uh, dictate things to God. This same story also illustrates the immorality of Muhammad on the horizontal level. The very fact that Muhammad had to bring in this explanation of Allah blessing those Muhammad wrongly curses shows that Muhammad was immoral. He was given to uh, annoyance and fits of rage and outbursts, intemperate outbursts, uh, even against uh, poor orphan girls. Muhammad claimed the angel Gabriel gave him extreme sexual power and that people in heaven will have even more. In Ibn Sa'd's early 9th century biography of Muhammad, we read, quote, The Apostle of Allah said, Gabriel brought a kettle from which I ate, and I was given the power of sexual intercourse equal to 40 men. Also, quote, The Apostle of Allah was given the power equal to that of 40 men, and the people of paradise will be given the power equal to 80 men, unquote. Things like this show Islam is the product of a depraved 7th century desert man, as opposed to a holy god. He had sex with his slave girls. He supported idolatrous pagan practices like kissing the black stone and bowing down to the Kaaba. Um, he assassinated people for criticizing his religion. He executed people for making fun of him. He told his followers that women are stupid and that their testimony is unreliable. He tortured people for money. He supported his religion by robbing people. He preached a message of violence and cruelty, and he taught his followers to believe in a God who loves only them and no one else. This is the ideal pattern of conduct, according to chapter 33, verse 21 of the Quran. According to Quran 434, Muhammad allowed Muslim men to beat their wives, quote, but those wives from whom you fear arrogance, First advise them, then if they persist, forsake them in bed, and finally strike them. However, Muslim apologist Mustafa Zaid claims the original Arabic word merely means beat them lightly. This is false. The original Arabic word is wajra bakuna, and according to John Penderson, its primary meaning is simply, quote, to beat, strike, unquote. Moreover, the following scholarly Quran translations of this verse say beat, scourge, or strike, as opposed to beat lightly. Also, the following Quranic commentators translate the word as beat, as opposed to beat lightly. Quranic scholar and commentator Alama Usmani says this verse means a man can beat his wife as hard as he wants, as long as he doesn't break her bones or cause a scar. Now, in Sahih Bukhari, we read about a Muslim man beating his wife, quote, When Allah's messenger came, Aisha said, I have not seen any woman suffering as much as the believing women. Look, her skin is greener than her clothes. According to this hadith, Muhammad did not chastise the man at all for beating his wife. Instead, he sided with the husband concerning their dispute. Also, in the following hadith, Muhammad's wife Aisha recalls an event concerning Muhammad and her, quote, Muhammad struck me on the chest, which caused me pain, unquote. In fact, Abu Bakr seems to have learned similar behavior from Muhammad. For, in Sahih Bukhari, we read, Narrated Aisha, Abu Bakr came towards me and struck me violently with his fist and said, You have detained the people because of your necklace. But I remained motionless, as if I was dead, lest I should awake Allah's apostle, although that hit was very painful. What is more, in one hadith, Muhammad found it hilarious when his father-in-laws Abu Bakr and Umar slapped and abused various women, including his, that is Muhammad's, own wives, quote. He, Hadrat Umar, said, I would say something which would make the Prophet laugh, so he said, Messenger of Allah, I wish you had seen the treatment meted out to the daughter of Khadija when she asked me some money, and I got up and slapped her on the neck. Allah's apostle laughed and said, They around me, as you see, asking for extra money. Abu Bakr then got up and went to Aisha and slapped her on the neck, and Umar stood before Hafsa and slapped her, saying, You ask Allah's messenger which he does not possess. They said, By Allah, we do not ask Allah's messenger for anything he does not possess. Muhammad also said, A man will not be asked as to why he beat his wife. This saying is also attested in the following source. Lastly, in his tafsir, the 12th century Islamic scholar al zamak Shari notes Muhammad as saying, Hang the whip so your wives can see it. There's so much about Sharia law that just is not relevant for today. And if you have any doubt, just take a look at ISIS. ISIS is probably the best example of Sharia law today because what ISIS is doing, what Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the man who is leading ISIS, the, the, the leader of ISIS, he is going right back to the Quran, right back to the traditions, applying Sharia law as the prophet, his prophet did it. And it comes straight out of this book. And that's why it is so barbaric. That's why they are cutting off the heads 
of the prisoners, and that's right in Surah 47, Ayah 4. That's why they're crucifying. That's in Surah 4. That's why they're beating the wives. That's in Surah 4, Ayah 34. That's why they're cutting off the hands of thieves. That's in Surah 5, Ayah 38. And I could go on and on and on and on. It is barbaric. It is not relevant for today. It doesn't work. It eradicates my freedoms. That's why I don't want Sharia law today. It just doesn't make sense. Bring me back to that which Jesus gave in his example. That does make sense. And I say this all the time. Keith, I tell people, can you show me one thing that's irrelevant with Jesus Christ? And I've said that for 33 years. I've asked that question. In 33 years, I've yet to find anybody that can find anything wrong with Jesus. So if you want the best law, the best example, the best model, the best paradigm, come on back to Jesus. We've got it. Come on over. Muhammad allowed his followers to do muta. When Muhammad's soldiers were in battle and away from their wives and became desirous and impassioned, they sought Muhammad's advice. Muhammad's allegedly inspired solution from God was that they should engage in muta marriage. Muta marriage is a temporary marriage contract with a woman for the purpose of sex that would be quickly annulled after the man's sexual desires were taken care of. Bukhari reports, narrated Abdullah, we used to participate in the holy battles led by Allah's apostle and we had nothing, no wives with us. So we said, shall we get ourselves castrated? He forbade us that and then allowed us to marry women with a temporary contract and recited to us, O you who believe, make not unlawful the good things which Allah has made lawful for you, but commit no transgression. Quran 587, unquote. Muhammad allowed the rape of female war captives while their husbands were alive and present. This is taught in Quran 424, quote, Also prohibited are women already married, except those whom your right hands possess, unquote. The historical background about the giving of this verse is found in the following hadith. Abu Sayyid al-Qudri said, The Apostle of Allah sent a military expedition to Altas on the occasion of the Battle of Hunayn. They met their enemy and fought with them. They defeated them and took them captives. Some of the companions of the Apostle of Allah were reluctant to have intercourse with the female captives in the presence of their husbands, who were unbelievers. So Allah, the Exalted, sent down the Quranic verse, and all married women are forbidden unto you, save those captives whom your right hands possess. That is to say, they are lawful for them when they complete their waiting period. This is clearly rape since the Muslim is allowed to have sex with a captive woman while her husband is still alive and present. No sane woman would want to have sex with a warrior who just killed her tribesmen and while her husband was still present. Thus, such sex can be said to be rape. The true God hates rape and would never permit this. Deuteronomy 22:25 says, But if in the open country a man meets a young woman who is betrothed and the man seizes her and lies with her, then only the man who lay with her shall die." Unquote. Muhammad supped the tongues of the sons of his companions, which is immoral and perverted. Quote, Muwiyah said, I saw the Prophet sucking on the tongue or the lips of Al-Hasan, son of Ali, for no tongue or lips that the Prophet sucked will be tormented by hellfire. Also in a Bukhari hadith we read, Then he, Muhammad, said, Where is the little one? Call the little one to me. Hassan came running and jumped into his lap. Then he put his hand on his beard. Then the Prophet opened his mouth and put his tongue in his mouth. Then he said, O oh Allah, I love him, so love him and the one who loves him." Unquote. Now to save face, some Muslims read into the text the idea that this had to do with dehydration, but there is no evidence of this in the text. And if the boy was dehydrated, why was he running around excited, jumping in Muhammad's lap? Muhammad enjoyed making old women cry for fun. In Ibn Kathir's Life of the Prophet Muhammad, an old woman asked Muhammad to pray she would make it to paradise. Instead, he told her there would be no old women in paradise. She walked away crying. Later, as he laughed, he told one of his companions to go tell her what he meant was she would not be old in paradise, but turned into a virgin. Thus, Muhammad enjoyed seeing old women cry in fear of not making it to heaven. Muhammad lured converts with promises of women with swelling breasts in heaven. Quran 78, 31-33 says, Verily, for the pious is a blissful place, gardens and vineyards, and girls with swelling breasts of the same age as themselves." Unquote. Rather than a description of a holy paradise with Almighty God, this sounds more like some sort of celestial brothel imagined up by a depraved 7th century desert nomad. Moreover, Muhammad invented more convenient revelations along with the one we already mentioned, involving him marrying his adopted son's wife. For example, at first Muhammad would give his wives equal attention on separate nights, but then afterwards he began to favor certain wives, and Quran 3351 was then conveniently revealed to him, which says, Thou mayest defer the turn of any of them that thou pleasest, and thou mayest receive any thou pleasest, and there is no blame on thee if thou invite one of those turn thou hadst set aside." Unquote. Muhammad's wife Aisha, keen on what was taking place, then said the following in response, quote, I feel that your Lord hastens in fulfilling your wishes and desires, unquote. Moreover, one night it was Hafsa's turn to be with Muhammad, but she had to go somewhere. Muhammad therefore decided to instead have intimate relations with one of his slave girls he was not married to in Hafsa's bed, namely, Mary the Copt. Hafsa found out and she was very upset. In response, Muhammad claimed Quran 66.1 was revealed to him in order to justify his behavior. It says, quote, O Prophet, why do you ban for yourself that which Allah has made lawful to you, seeking to please your wives? Then Muhammad claimed Quran 66.3-5 was revealed to him, which was a stern rebuke of Aisha and Hafsa for being upset with Muhammad for his actions with Mary the Copt. These are but a few of Muhammad's convenient revelations. How do they square up with Muhammad's other claim that the Quran is eternal and meant for all peoples and times, if much of it was meant to merely serve Muhammad's desires? 
Not only was Muhammad incredibly immoral, but so were his companions and his first successors of the Islamic State, that is, the Caliphs. If Jesus' disciples acted the way Muhammad's companions acted, Christians would never hear the end of it. The fact is, Muhammad's cousin and close companion, Ibn Abbas, who was praised by Muslims as one of Islam's greatest commentators of the Quran, was actually a very wicked man. When Caliph Ali appointed him as governor of Basra, Iraq, Ibn Abbas betrayed Ali and stole a large amount of money and provisions from the Muslim treasury for himself and left to go live in Mecca. Now, Muhammad's early followers also murdered each other in order to gain leadership over the Muslim people after Muhammad died. For example, after Muhammad's death, Uthman, the third caliph, was assassinated by Egyptian Muslims and Abu Bakr's son, who supported Ali as the rightful caliph. Tabari reports, Muhammad b. Abi Bakr, Abu Bakr's son, came with 13 Egyptian men and went up to Uthman. He seized his beard and shook it until I heard his teeth chattering. Muhammad b. Abi Bakr said, Mubiya was no help to you, nor was Ibn Amir, nor your letters. Uthman said, Let go of my beard, son of my brother, let go of my beard. Then I saw Ibn Abi Bakr signaling with his eye to one of the rebels. He came over to him with a broad iron-headed arrow and stabbed him in the head with it. They gathered round him and killed him." Unquote. Then Ali became the fourth caliph. Now Muhammad's wife Aisha hated Ali for years because he accused her of being unfaithful to Muhammad, and thus she incited Muslims to fight against him. At the same time, Talha and al-Zubair, companions of Muhammad, wanted Ali dead and did not recognize his succession as caliph. This resulted in the Battle of the Camel, where Aisha, Talha, al-Zubair, and thousands of Muhammad's followers, family, and friends fought Caliph Ali and the Muslims under his leadership. Thousands of Muslims died in the battle, but Ali was eventually victorious. Talha and Zubair were killed, while Aisha was arrested. Next, a relative of Muhammad and writer of the Quran who was close to Uthman named Mubiyah accused Ali, the fourth caliph, of harboring the murderers of Uthman, the third caliph. This led to the Battle of Safain between Ali and Mubiyah where many Muslims died fighting each other. Then later a Muslim assassinated Ali and Muwiyah proclaimed himself caliph. It is because of events like this that the Sunni versus Shiite split occurred leading to mutual hatred and fighting between them even to this day. The Shiites support Ali and side with him against Muhammad's other companions who fought him while the Sunnis hate the Shiites for doing so. One of the biggest problems for Muslims is the spiritual reliability of Muhammad. Some of the descriptions of Muhammad receiving revelation sound like something straight out of the exorcist. Apart from that, there are a number of details in the Muslim sources that seriously call into question Muhammad's spiritual reliability. When Muhammad was young, his foster mother thought he was demon-possessed, since two beings threw him to the ground and he was found with a livid face. Moreover, Muhammad's first alleged revelational experience with the being that would come to be viewed as Gabriel was actually demonic. In Sahih Bukhari, we read about this early encounter in the cave of Hira between Muhammad and this being, quote, the Prophet added, The angel caught me forcefully and pressed me so hard that I could not bear it any more. Then he released me and again asked me to read, and I replied, I do not know how to read. Thereupon he caught me again and pressed me a second time till I could not bear it any more. Then he released me again and asked me to read, but again I replied, I do not know how to read or what shall I read. Thereupon he caught me for the third time and pressed me, and then released me and said, Read in the name of your Lord, who has created all that exists, has created man from a clot, read, and your Lord is the most generous. Another early report says here Muhammad was being strangled so hard he felt like he was going to die. We know from Muslim records that when Muhammad began receiving revelations, his first impression was that he was demon-possessed. We know that after his experience in the cave, he became suicidal, tried to hurl himself off a cliff. We know that it was his wife Khadija and her cousin Wadika who persuaded him that he wasn't possessed, he was a prophet of God. Now, what happened to Muhammad in the cave when the Quran started coming to him? I, I don't know. But I know this, when he ran out of that cave, uh, terrified, depressed, and suicidal, he was convinced that he had seen a demon, and that's a problem. Initially, Muhammad's wife's cousin Waraka correctly believed Muhammad was demon-possessed. After Muhammad's wife Khadija explained to Waraka what was happening with Muhammad after his first encounter with the being who would come to be seen as Gabriel, Waraka had a very interesting perspective, quote, Waraka expressed surprise and said Jibreel only came to prophets, the best of creatures, so he wished to meet the prophet. He said that sometimes the devil deceives people pretending to be Jibreel, and then he to whom the devil goes turns mad, unquote. This is correct, as 2 Corinthians 11.14 says, and no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Muhammad's revelations were clearly demonic possessions. During his alleged revelations, Muhammad would hear ringing in his ears and sweat profusely. He would turn red and breathe heavily. He would be choked. He would move his lips quickly. He would hear voices thinking trees and rocks were speaking to him. He would fall to his knees with trembling shoulders. He would feel dread and terror. He would have a racing heart with swollen veins on his shoulders and neck. He would have a severe fever. This is consistent with demonic possession and it's inconsistent with what is documented about the experiences of previous prophets who received actual revelations from God. And there are other problems. Think about the satanic verses, the verses that Muhammad delivered to his followers and later claimed were from Satan. Uh, when Muhammad, this is how the story goes, when Muhammad was preaching in Mecca, he, he didn't win very many converts, but he wanted his countrymen to accept Islam, and he was hoping to receive a revelation that would help them. And then one day, of course, he got the revelation he was looking for. It said, 
Have you not heard of Alat and Alusa and Anat the third, the other? These are the exalted cranes whose intercession is to be hoped for. So there are these three goddesses that are like birds. They're exalted cranes who can carry your prayers to Allah. This was originally part of Surah 53 of the Quran. Uh, Muhammad delivered these verses to his followers. He bowed down in honor of them, and his followers bowed down with him. But a little while later, Muhammad told his followers that these verses, which he had delivered as part of the Quran, weren't really from God. They were from Satan. And he replaced them with the words that we find in the Quran today. So when you read Surah 53, keep in mind the fact that it originally promoted polytheism and that Muhammad couldn't tell the difference between a revelation from God and a revelation from Satan. It's also interesting to note that at one point late in life, Muhammad was a victim of a magic spell, according to him, not according to me. Uh, several passages in Bukhari uh, report that someone stole a hairbrush and, from Muhammad and used it to cast a spell on him. Uh, Ibn Sa'd tells us that uh, Muhammad was bewitched during this time, and Bukhari adds that the spell made him delusional. So according to Muslim sources, God's greatest prophet was under a spell for, let's say, a year, and that's a problem. In Quran 6944-46, Muhammad stated if he fabricated false teachings, i.e. invented revelations not from God, then he would have his aorta cut, it says. And if he had fabricated against us some of the sayings, we would certainly have seized him by the right hand, then we would certainly have cut off his aorta. Well, it just so happens that the Muslim sources tell us Muhammad was poisoned by a Jewish person and then reported that it caused him to feel as if his aorta was being cut, quote, narrated Aisha, the prophet in his ailment in which he died used to say, O oh, Aisha, I still feel the pain caused by the food I ate at Kabar. And at this time, I feel as if my aorta is being cut from that poison. And so we look at the historical records, and we, we find that Muhammad, was origi Muhammad originally thought he was demon-possessed. Um, he became suicidal when he started receiving his revelations. He delivered verses from Satan, and people could cast spells on it. And, you know, Muslims, a lot of Muslims don't know anything about this, but even if you point it out, uh, they say, ah, it's no big deal. Uh, but I look at it and say, maybe there's something wrong here. According to Islam, the Quran is infallible, that is, it is free from error. Moreover, Islam teaches Muhammad's Sunnah, that is, his sayings and deeds in the Hadith literature, are to be followed by Muslims. This presupposes they are accurate and thus worthy to be followed. For example, Muhammad said, keep to my Sunnah. And there are many references in the Quran ordering Muslims to obey and emulate Muhammad's teaching and example. Thus, if there are historical, scientific, logical, and prophetic errors in the Quran and authentic Hadith material, this proves Muhammad was a false prophet and that Islam is false. The Quran is chock full of errors, whether logical, historical, scientific, mathematical. You name the category, the Quran probably has an error that would fit into it. An example of a logical contradiction appears when you compare, uh, for example, a handful of verses in the Quran, such as Surah 2, verse 221, where we are told that Muslims cannot marry idolaters and unbelievers. If we compare that to Surah 5, 5, where we're told that Muslim men can marry Christian women, we may infer from that that Christian women are not idolaters and unbelievers. That is, if Muslims cannot marry idolaters, and they can marry Christians, then Christians, as a matter of deductive certainty, can't be idolaters. However, according to Surah 9, verses 28 through 33, Christians are idolaters and unbelievers, so the Quran contradicts itself. Muhammad believed the reason the sun appears to move in the sky is because of the sun's movement and not the earth's rotation. In Quran 36, 38 we read, and the sun runs his course for a period determined for him. That is the decree of him, the exalted in might, the all-knowing." In the Hadith literature, Muhammad explains this verse, leaving no doubt this is what he believed. In Sahih Bukhari, we read, Narrated Abu Dar, the Prophet asked me at sunset, Do you know where the sun goes at the time of sunset? I replied, Allah and his apostle know better. He said, It goes, i.e. travels, till it prostrates itself underneath the throne, and takes the permission to rise again. And it is permitted, and then a time will come when it will be about to prostrate itself, but its prostration will not be accepted, and it will ask permission to go on its course, but will not be permitted but it will be ordered to return whence it has come, and so it will rise in the west. And that is the interpretation of the statement of Allah, and the sun runs its fixed course for a term decreed. Hence, it is clear Muhammad believed the reason it looks like the sun is moving in the sky is because of its movement and not the earth's rotation around the sun as science proves. This is a clear scientific error in the Quran and Ahadith. As the following modern science book confirms, the real reason behind the apparent motion of the sun through the daytime sky is the rotation of the earth. The earth orbits the sun." Unquote. One of the most popular Muslim arguments is the scientific accuracy of the Quran. The claim here is that Muhammad uh, revealed things that couldn't have been known during his time, and this was just nonsense. The Quran is a scientific catastrophe. Chapter 1886 of the Quran uh, says that the sun sets in, in a muddy pool. Uh, 86, 6 through 7 said that uh, semen is formed between the backbone and the ribs. 88, 20 says that the earth is flat. Uh, 65, 12 says that there are seven earths. Um, 2265 says that, that the sky would fall on the earth if Allah didn't hold it up. Um, 37, 6 through 10, and 67, 5 declare that stars are missiles that God uses to shoot demons who try to sneak into heaven. And, you know, Muslims look at all of this and then they tell us that uh, the Quran is known to be true because of the scientific miracles in it. And I just, I just want to know, what did Muhammad say um, that, you know, that, that an average person walking around wouldn't have known? Everything else beyond that, he got wrong. He got everything that he could possibly get wrong, he got wrong. 
Muhammad taught Alexander the Great was a righteous Muslim who believed in and obeyed Allah. In Surah 18 of the Quran, Dhul Qurnayn, which means two horns, is said to be a man who had Allah's support, was holy and righteous, and believed in and worked with and obeyed Allah. There is much evidence the author of the Quran viewed this Dhul Qurnayn as Alexander the Great. First, many of Islam's greatest commentators of the Quran affirm these verses are about Alexander the Great. Second, on ancient coins there are drawings of Alexander the Great with two horns on his head, which is significant since again, Dhul Qurnayn means two horns. Third, Arabs like Al-Asha, who was a poet living shortly prior to Muhammad, and Hassan ibn Thabit, who was contemporary with Muhammad, called Alexander the Great Dhul Qurnayn. Thus, the expert on Alexander the Great, Richard Stoneman, affirms, quote, The two names, Alexander the Great and Dhul Qurnayn, were already synonymous when Muhammad came to compose this surah of the Quran. In fact, modern scholars have shown the Quranic story of this Dhul Qurnayn in Surah 18 actually comes from a pre-Islamic mythical Syriac source called A Christian Legend Concerning Alexander, translated into English by Sir Ernest Alfred Wallace Budge in 1889. When one compares the Quranic story in Surah 18 to the Syriac tale of Alexander the Great side by side, there is no question this is where the Quran got the Alexander fable. There are more than 11 similar features between the two stories, such as Alexander having two horns, being given power, the sun rising on the people with no cover, punishment of the unrighteous, Gog and Magog spoiling the land, and the building of a wall as a defense. As Stoneman notes, quote, the commentators on the Quran universally assume that Dhul Qurnayn here in Surah 18 is the name of Alexander. Their assumption was clearly correct, since the two stories here in Surah 18 associated with Dhul Qurnayn are precisely those two stories associated with Alexander in the Syriac legend of Alexander, current shortly before the composition of the Quran. This proves unequivocally the Quran is not of divine origin, but instead stole earlier uninspired mythical stories or legends. Moreover, Surah 18 also proves the Quran is historically inaccurate for claiming Alexander the Great was a righteous man who believed in and obeyed Allah. For the historical evidence concerning Alexander the Great shows he was actually an unrighteous polytheistic pagan. The two earliest extant and most reliable biographies of Alexander the Great were written by Arian and Plutarch. According to Arian, quote, Alexander offered sacrifice on the following day to the gods who had revealed the signs and assured him, unquote. Similarly, Plutarch relayed, quote, The empire of the Persians was thought to be utterly dissolved, and Alexander, proclaimed king of Asia, made magnificent sacrifices to the gods, unquote. Arian also reported, quote, I pity Alexander for his mishap, because on that occasion he showed himself the slave of two vices, anger and drunkenness, unquote. Finally, Plutarch relayed Alexander engaged in drunken homosexual acts, quote, He, Alexander, was once viewing some contests in singing and dancing, being well heated with wine, and that his favorite, Bagoas, won the prize for song and dance, and then, all in his festal array, passed through the theater and took his seat by Alexander's side, at sight of which the Macedonians clapped their hands and loudly bade the king kiss the victor, until at last he threw his arms about him and kissed him tenderly, unquote. An example of a scientific error in the Quran can be found in Surah 596. According to that passage, Muslims can eat anything that swims in, in the seas or the oceans, the waters. And this is in contrast to other foods that Allah has forbidden. However, if this verse is true, then it would be okay. There'd be no problem in eating things like uh, stonefish, pufferfish, or blowfish, a triggerfish, uh, poison dark frog, barracuda, a marble cone snail. All of these things are poisonous uh, for human beings. And yet Allah says, eat up. Uh, that's a very clear scientific error. The Quran claims mountains were placed down onto earth as pegs. Quran 31.10 says, quote, He has created the heavens without any pillars that you can see, and he has placed in the earth firm mountains that it may not quake with you, unquote. Quran 78.6-7 also says, Have we not made the earth as a bed, and the mountains as pegs, unquote? Darya Badi translates the last Arabic word as stakes. These texts teach the way mountains appeared was that God placed them down onto earth from the sky, like pegs or stakes. The scientific problem is mountains are actually formed by tectonic plates colliding together. As we read in the science book, Physical Geography, quote, The world's highest mountains, the Himalayas, were formed when the Indian plate collided with the Eurasia. The Alps were formed in a similar manner in a collision between the African and Eurasian plates, unquote. Muhammad taught the traits of children are determined by which parent climaxes first during sexual intercourse. Muhammad said, quote, As for the resemblance of the child to its parents, if a man has sexual intercourse with his wife and gets discharged first, the child will resemble the father, and if the woman gets discharged first, the child will resemble her." Unquote. This is a serious scientific error proving Muhammad was a false prophet. A child's traits are determined by genes inherited by the mother and the father, and it has nothing to do with who climaxes first during sexual intercourse. As one modern science textbook on heredity points out, quote, Every person has two copies of most genes in their genome. One copy of the gene comes from their mother, and the other one comes from their father. The two copies of the genes are not exactly the same. They contain small changes in the sequence of DNA bases. These two different versions of the same gene are called alleles. The small differences in the alleles cause offspring to resemble their parents without looking exactly the same as either parent. An example of a mathematical error in the Quran arises from Surah 4 verses 11 through 12 where we're given the inheritance law in Islam. And so if you read that passage, the way it works out is, for example, if a person left a wife, two daughters, a father and a mother behind, then the wife would get one-eighth of the inheritance the daughters would get two-thirds, the father would get one-sixth, and the mother would get one-sixth, and if you do the math, it comes out to 
uh, I think it's 27 and 24, which of course doesn't jive. That is, they're due to inherit more than the person actually has. The Quran falsely teaches that the New Testament Virgin Mary was the sister of the Old Testament figure Aaron, and that she was the daughter of Imran, who was Aaron's father. The reason the Quran made this serious mistake was because Aaron's sister was also called Mary, just like Jesus' mother was, and Muhammad therefore confused the two. This historical error shows the Quran is not inspired by God. Muslims offer different unconvincing responses to this, but the Muslim scholar Muhammad Assad claims the Quran only referred to Mary's ancestral relationship to Aaron when it called her the sister of Aaron. However, this response won't work because Quran 3, 35-38 explicitly says, the wife of Imran, i.e. Aaron's mother, literally gave birth to Mary, the mother of Jesus. In Quran 1886, which, as we noted, concerns Alexander the Great, we read, quote, until when he reached the setting of the sun, he found it set in a spring of murky water. Near it he found a people, unquote. This is clearly a scientific error since the sun does not and is not small enough to set in a spring of water. In response, Islamic commentator Malana Daryabadi argues the Arabic word for found here, wajada, should be taken in a subjective sense meaning he perceived it setting in water, even though Daryabadi admits the word can have an objective meaning corresponding to fact, i.e. he found it setting in water. However, Daryabadi is mistaken because right after this verse says Alexander found the sun setting in water, it then continues and says he also found a people, using the same Arabic word for found, wajada. Thus, according to the Quran, the same way Alexander literally found a people, he literally found the sun setting in water. And lastly, in a sound hadith in Sunan Abu Dawud, Muhammad said the sun literally sets in water, not that it's only perceived to do such, quote, Narrated Abu Dar, I was sitting behind the messenger of Allah who was riding a donkey while the sun was setting. He asked, Do you know where the sun sets? I replied, Allah and his apostle know best. He said, It sets in a spring of warm water, unquote. The Quran is full of other logical errors or contradictions. For example, did creation take Allah eight days as Quran 41, 9 12 clearly shows, or six days as Quran 25, 59 clearly says? Is it possible for Muslims to treat their four wives justly, tadlu, as Quran 4, 3 indicates, or is it not possible to treat them justly, tadlu, as Quran 4, 1, 29 indicates? It depends on what verse you read. Will the food for people in hell be from a tree with fruit stalks like the heads of devils as Quran 37, 62 to 66 says, or will it only be foul pus as Quran 69, 36 says, or will it only be bitter dari as Quran 88, 6 says? Will there be no questioning and inquiry of earthly acquaintances on that day, i.e. the Day of Judgment, as Quran 23, 99, 101 clearly says? Or will such questioning and inquiry indeed take place on that day, as Quran 37, 26 to 28 clearly says? Did Allah create the earth first and then the heavens second, as Quran 2, 29 says? Or did he create the heavens first and then the earth second, as Quran 79, 27 to 32 says? Because Muhammad was a false prophet, he made many false prophecies. Deuteronomy 18, 22 says, When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him, unquote. In Quran 32-4, Muhammad taught the Byzantines would defeat the Persians within three to nine years after the Persians first defeated them. It says, The Byzantines have been defeated in the nearest land, but they, after their defeat, will overcome within three to nine years, unquote. That the Arabic phrase, fi bidi sina, does indeed refer to three to nine years, is evidenced by many sources. As quoted, the Sahih International translation of the Quran renders the phrase as three to nine years, as do the Mushan Khan and Pikthal translations. Moreover, Abdul Manan Omar's Dictionary of the Holy Quran affirms the word means, quote, few, range between three and nine. Also, the Islamic scholar Alama Usmani confirms, in lexicon and in the tradition, the word bidi is applied to a period ranging from three to nine years, unquote. Moreover, Yusuf Ali also confirms, quote, bid in the text means a short period, a period from three to nine years, unquote. So there's no question. However, the first battle Muhammad talked about was in AD 614, when the Persians shockingly conquered Jerusalem and defeated the Byzantines, who were led by Emperor Heraclius. Then the Byzantines did defeat the Persians afterwards, but it was 13 years later in AD 627 at Nineveh, not three to nine years later, as Muhammad falsely prophesied. This is a major false prophecy proving Muhammad was a false prophet. Next, in Quran 3, 150 to 151, Muhammad predicted the Muslims would be victorious in the Battle of Uhud, with the Meccan pagans, quote, Nay, God is your protector, and he is the best of helpers. Soon shall we cast terror into the hearts of the unbelievers, for that they join companions with God, for which he had sent no authority. Their abode will be the fire, and evil is the home of the wrongdoers, unquote. So according to Muhammad, God would protect the Muslims in this battle, terror would be cast into the hearts of the opposing army, and the abode of the opposing army would be hell. This indicates the Muslims would win the battle. Indeed, the commentator Ibn Abbas explained this was a prophecy of triumph regarding the Battle of Uhud. However, the Muslims went on to lose this battle in a devastating fashion, as Muslim scholar Ibn Kathir affirmed, quote, as Sudi said, when the disbelievers attacked Muslim lines during the Battle of Uhud and defeated them, some Muslims ran away to El Medina, unquote. This is a major false prophecy. Now, in Sahih Muslim, Muhammad falsely predicted the last hour would happen during the lifetime of a young boy who was present with him, quote, Anas reported a person asked Allah's messenger as to when the last hour would come. He had in his presence a young boy of the Ansar who was called Muhammad. Allah's messenger said, if this young boy lives, he may not grow very old till he would see the last hour coming to you, unquote. Moreover, Muhammad predicted the end of the world would happen very shortly after his life, quote, Anas reported Allah's messenger as saying, I and the last hour have been sent like this, and 
While doing it, join the forefinger and the middle finger. Muhammad said this about 1400 years ago, which is clearly incorrect. Also, Muhammad predicted, quote, the last hour would come when the Romans would form a majority amongst people, unquote. However, the largest people group in the world is by far the Han Chinese, who have over a 1.2 billion person population. Thus, Muhammad was wrong since the Han Chinese far supersede any ethnic group, including Romans, in terms of population number and growth. Because Muhammad was demon-possessed and also under the control of black magic, he went mad and produced some of the most crazy and irrational teachings ever known. Muhammad taught spitting to the left stops bad dreams. In Sahih Bukhari we read, Narrated Abu Karta, the Prophet said, A good dream that comes true is from Allah, and a bad dream is from Satan. So if any one of you sees a bad dream, he should seek refuge with Allah from Satan, and should spit on the left, for the bad dream will not harm him." Unquote. This is strange and superstitious. Muhammad taught quite a number of absurd things that no uh, modern person could possibly hold to. For example, he taught that Adam was created 90 feet tall. We have no evidence for that. And Although Muhammad doesn't say, I suppose it follows that Eve was also created 90 feet tall. Otherwise, that would have made for a very awkward relationship, to say the least. But so apparently, according to Muhammad, since the time of Adam and Eve, people have been decreasing in stature, so that we've been getting shorter and shorter. Um, even if it were the case that people have been getting shorter, it hasn't been from an original starting point of 90 feet, uh, but something substantially lower than that. Muhammad commanded a grown woman to breastfeed a younger man she was not married to. In Sahih Muslim, we read, Salha, daughter of Suhail, came to Allah's Messenger and said, Allah's Messenger, I swear by Allah, that I see in the face of Abu Hudayfa the signs of disgust on account of entering of Salim in the house. Whereupon Allah's Messenger said, Suckle him. She said, He has a beard. But he again said, Suckle him, and it would remove what is there, expression of disgust, on the face of Abu Hudayfa. This is twisted. Moreover, Muhammad taught some adult breastfeeding is okay. In fact, Muhammad's wife Aisha claimed verses discussing this in the Quran got lost, thereby corrupting the Quran. Quote, Aisha reported that it had been revealed in the Holy Quran that ten clear sucklings make the marriage unlawful, then it was abrogated and substituted by five sucklings, and Allah's apostle died, and it was before that time found in the Holy Quran and recited by the Muslims." Unquote. Muhammad taught that unbelievers eat in seven intestines, whereas believers, which he meant Muslims by, eat in two intestines. He's taught that people are not to sleep on their left side or on their stomach because Satan sleeps on his left side and stomach. He also taught that you're not supposed to eat with your left hand or drink with your left hand because Satan eats and drinks with his left hand. Muhammad commanded people to drink camel urine. In Sahih Muslim we read, Anas B. Malik reported that some people of the tribe of Ukul or Urena came to Allah's Messenger and they found the climate of Medina uncongenial. Allah's Messenger commanded them to milk she-camels and commanded them to drink their urine and their milk." Unquote. We see a similar command in Sahih Bukhari to drink camel urine as medicine. However, according to the Australian Department of Health, quote, the World Health Organization advises that people should avoid drinking raw camel milk or camel urine, unquote. Now, in the Quran, it is said Muhammad was the seal of the prophets. This means Muslims believe he was the final prophet. Muslims are very proud the Quran says Muhammad was the seal of the prophets. All the prophets have, uh, which Allah wanted to send, have all been sent, and now the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa as though he was the last, and he's, he's put a seal on this whole life of, of, of prophethood. That is the significance of the seal. But the identity of the seal is where things get quite bizarre. In Sahih Muslim, we're told Muhammad's seal of prophethood was a bunch of hairy moles between his shoulders, quote. Abdullah B. Sargis reported, I then went after him and saw the seal of prophethood between his shoulders, on the left side of his shoulder having spots on it like moles. This was supposed to be the proof of Muhammad's prophethood. As Muslim writer Muhammad Said Abdullah Rahman said, quote, Between his shoulders was the seal of prophethood, which was a sign of his truthfulness, and that he was indeed the promised prophet, unquote. Yet the biblical prophets did not have moles proving they were prophets. There is no pre-Islamic prophecy claiming a future prophet will have moles. This is a bizarre Islamic innovation and a very inadequate proof of prophethood. Muhammad taught that people who listened to music were on the risk of being crushed by Allah with a mountain. Allah could make a mountain crush over them, or he may turn them into apes and pigs. This, of course, is the is Darwinism in reverse. He taught that you're to inhale water up your nose and, and blow it out uh, after you've slept, when you wake up from a, a nap or from sleeping overnight, because Satan lodges in your nose. No doubt he's sleeping on his left side or on his stomach up there, uh, but in order to get Satan out of there, you're supposed to exhale water violently from your nose. Although embarrassed Muslims interpret this in different metaphorical ways to defend Muhammad, it should be noted the distinguished Muslim scholar Muhammad Khan explains this hadith saying, quote, We should believe that Satan actually stays in the upper part of one's nose, though we cannot perceive how. In another hadith in Sahih Bukhari, we read, quote, Narrated Abdullah, it was mentioned before the Prophet that there was a man who slept the night till morning after sunrise. The Prophet said, he is a man in whose ears or ear Satan had urinated, unquote. Muhammad taught men in heaven will have eternal erections. In Sunan Ibn Majah, we read, quote, Abu Umama narrated, the Messenger of God said, everyone that God admits into paradise will be married to 72 wives. 
Two of them are virgins, and seventy of his inheritance of the dwellers of hell. All of them will have a pleasant vagina, and he will have a sexual organ that does not bend down. This shows Islam is not from a holy god. In a radio debate, Muslim apologist Jalal Abul Arab limited the Islamic concept of jihad to personal struggle. Jihad means to struggle. It doesn't mean to fight. Moreover, a popular pro-Islamic website similarly claimed jihad, quote, has nothing whatsoever to do with holy war. There is nothing holy about wars. This is a common tactic by Muslim apologists in the West. The Islamic propaganda organization, the Council on American Islamic Relations, or CARE, even engaged in an ad campaign where they put up banners on buses with slogans such as, My Jihad is to stay fit, in order to convey the idea jihad has nothing to do with holy war. However, there is much authoritative and scholarly Islamic material proving jihad can also refer to holy war. Abdul Manan Omar's Dictionary of the Holy Quran notes one of the meanings of jihad is fighting or holy war. Penrose's A Dictionary and Glossary of the Quran confirms jihad can mean, quote, a going forth to fight in the holy war, unquote. Moreover, in Sahih Bukhari, the most authentic hadith collection, jihad is explicitly defined as religious fighting, holy battles, holy fighting, one who strives to be martyred, and fighting in Allah's cause. Moreover, one of Islam's most respected scholars, Ibn Kathir, stated bluntly in his commentary on the Quran, quote, jihad involves killing and shedding the blood of men, unquote. Now, Muslim apologists in the West often quote peaceful Quranic verses Muhammad produced in Mecca when he was weak and didn't have an army, or one in Medina prior to implementing offensive jihad. However, the Quran clearly teaches the principle of abrogation, meaning previous revelation sometimes gets cancelled out for later revelation. Now, what you need to do is you need to go to the first part of the Quran, which is the Medinan material, because that is the most authoritative part of the Quran, primarily because that's where, that's the latter part of the revelation that was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, their Prophet Muhammad, between 622 and 630 to the last 10 years of his life, when he was in Medina. That's why it's called the Medinan surahs. And in those surahs, you will find verse after verse after verse after verse that talks about jihad. Slay the unbeliever wherever ye find them. Besiege them. Lay in wait for them with every kind of ambush. That's Surah 9, Ayah 5. Make war on the unbeliever. Slay the unbeliever until there is no more fitna in the land. That's Surah 8, Ayah 39. Cut off the heads of the unbeliever. Surah 47, verse 4. And it goes on and on and on and on. There are so many verses. There's about 150 verses in the Quran that are violent. When you have any contradictions in the Quran, you have what they call law of abrogation. Surah 2, Ayah 106 and Surah 16, Ayah 101, which stipulates if you have a first verse, that's Mansuk, and you have another verse that comes after, that's Nasik. Nasik is strong, Mansuk is weak. A Nasik verse always abrogates a weak verse. So if they contradict each other, you always, always, always go with the later verse, which would be, of course, the Medinan verses. And these are all Medinan. And then the last, uh, the, the, the late, or the last surah to be revealed to Muhammad was Surah 9. So it abrogates anything that comes before. So anything that comes and stands against it, it takes precedence. And surah 9, do not read before you go to bed. It is probably the most violent chapter. It is the most violent chapter in the Quran. It is full of verse after verse after verse, like Surah 9, 5, and Surah 9, 9 29. Thus, when Muslims quote Surah 1096, for example, when Muhammad said to the pagans, to you your religion and to me mine, in order to try to prove Islam is peaceful, it must be noted this was abrogated by Muhammad's later violent teachings in verses he gave after his migration to Medina when he got powerful. As the influential Islamic commentary Tafsir al-Jalalain says concerning that early peaceful verse, quote, This, Surah 1096, was revealed before he was commanded to wage war against the idolaters, unquote. This is abrogation. Such violent verses which abrogate earlier peaceful ones include, but are not limited to Surah 9.5, and 929. Let's go to Surah 9, Ayah 29. There's a good one. Surah 9, Ayah 29 says, very clear, to make war on the people of the book, Al-Qadab. I'm a, al uh, as a Christian. They're going to make war on me. Now to ask me if that's supposed to be very peaceful. Offensive jihad is something that developed over time in Islam and represents the last teachings of Muhammad on jihad. Since there are no prophets after Muhammad, according to Orthodox Islam, no one can overturn Muhammad's final teaching on the matter. And Muhammad's final teachings, again, are offensive. They're found in Surah 9. There are other sources, but Surah 9 being the last of the chapters that Muhammad claimed were revealed to him that were included in the Quran, those final chapters clearly teach offensive warfare, and that's the program then that Muslims are to follow uh, until the end of time. When we study jihad, the most important thing to keep in mind is that jihad proceeds in stages, and there are three main stages that we can uh, break down. Uh, stage one applies when Muslims are completely outnumbered. They can't hope to win a physical confrontation with unbelievers. Muslims are taught to proclaim a message of peace and tolerance, and chapter 109 of the Quran is a good passage to, to study in light of this. It commands Muslims that if someone disagrees with them, you say, to you be your religion and to me be my religion. Very peaceful. But that's only under those circumstances. When Muslims can fight, when they can fight unbelievers but aren't in a position to subjugate those unbelievers, here we have stage two. And in this case, Muslims are to engage in defensive jihad. They're allowed to fight and they have to fight if they're being attacked or persecuted or if people are making fun of Islam, something like that. Muslims are to fight but the unbeliever has to do something. It has to be some sort of provocation. But that isn't the end of the story. There's also stage three, when Muslims are in the majority. They are commanded to fight offensive jihad. And uh, the most important verse um, for Christians here would be chapter 9, verse 29 of the Quran. It says, fight those who do not believe in Allah. And it specifically refers to Jews and Christians. It commands Muslims to violently subjugate us until we pay the jizya, until we pay, until we pay tribute money to Muslims. 
So this offensive jihad stage is what is commonly denied by Muslims in the West, uh, but it was certainly present. It's present in the Quran, it's present in the life of Muhammad, and it's been uh, present in Islam for 14 centuries. And we're seeing uh, the ramifications. Surah 9.5 concerns pagans, quote, And when the sacred months have passed, then kill the polytheists wherever you find them, and capture them and besiege them, and sit and wait for them at every place of ambush. But if they should repent, establish prayer, and give zakah, let them go on their way. Indeed, Allah is forgiving and merciful, unquote. The context of this verse is the Meccan pagans had already been subjugated and beaten by Muhammad's armies at this time. But Muhammad was not happy with them remaining pagan, so he produced this verse nullifying every treaty or agreement with them, ordering them to become Muslim or be killed. This is confirmed by some of the greatest and most respected Muslim scholars of history. For example, Ibn Kathir stated, quote, This honorable ayah 95 was called the ayah of the sword, about which Al-Dahaq bin Muzahim said, it abrogated every agreement of peace between the Prophet and any idolater, every treaty and every term, unquote. Muslim scholar Ibn Juzay also said, quote, Kill the mushrikeen wherever you find them, abrogating every peace treaty in the Quran, unquote. And Islamic scholar Asiyuti affirmed, quote, This Quran 9.5 is an ayat of the sword which abrogates pardon, truce, and overlooking, unquote. In Sahih Bukhari, Muhammad interpreted this verse by saying, quote, The statement of Allah, but if they repent by rejecting shirk polytheism and accepting Islamic monotheism, narrated Ibn Umar, Allah's messenger said, I have been ordered by Allah to fight against the people until they testify that none has the right to be worshipped but Allah and that Muhammad is Allah's messenger, and offer the prayers perfectly and give the obligatory charity. So if they perform that, then they save their lives and property from me. Now concerning Surah 929, which again says, Fight those who do not believe in Allah or in the last day, and who do not consider unlawful what Allah and his messenger have made unlawful, and who do not adopt the religion of truth from those who were given the scriptures, fight until they give the jizya willingly while they are subdued, unquote. Muslim scholar Ibn Kathir explains how this is jihad, and what exactly it means, quote, Allah ordered them to wage jihad against the people of the scriptures, unless they believed or agreed to pay the jizya, unquote. Now, an earlier verse Muslim apologists in the West cite in order to deceive people to think Islam is peaceful is Surah 2, 256, which says, There is no compulsion in religion. However, again, the later verse, Surah 9.5, abrogates this since it says to kill the pagans unless they convert, repent, establish prayer, and give zakah. As Ibn Kathir noted, quote, This verse, 2, 256, is abrogated by the verse of fighting. Western Muslim apologists also cite Quran 68, quote, Allah does not forbid you from those who do not fight you because of religion, and do not expel you from your own homes, from being righteous toward them and acting justly toward them. Indeed, Allah loves those who act justly." Unquote. However, Tafsir al-Jalalain explains this verse, quote, was revealed before the command to struggle against them. Unquote. Now, Muhammad clearly taught offensive jihad in the following Sahih Muslim hadith, quote, It has been narrated by Umar e al-Khattab that he heard the Messenger of Allah say, I will expel the Jews and the Christians from the Arabian Peninsula, and will not leave any but Muslim. Unquote. In the same book, Muhammad also said, quote, I have been commanded to fight against people, so long as they do not declare that there is no God but Allah, and he who professed it was guaranteed the protection of his property and life on my behalf. Muslim scholar Ahmed Hassan explains this means, quote, Muslims are allowed to fight with unbelievers until they utter the credo of Islam, unquote. In Sahih Muslim, we also read, quote, It has been reported from Suleiman B. Barayd through his father that the Messenger of Allah would say, Fight in the name of Allah and in the way of Allah. Fight against those who disbelieve in Allah. Make holy war, unquote. Now, it's important to consult the Muslim scholars of history and today who seriously studied the Quran and Ahadith their whole lives to see what conclusions they came to on this issue of jihad. The 8th century Islamic law scholar Abu Yusuf, who lived quite close to the time of Muhammad, said, quote, one fights Arabs only to oblige them to embrace Islam without making them pay the poll tax. The decision in respect to non-Arabs is different because they are fought not only to convert them, but also to oblige them to pay the poll tax." Unquote. Moreover, commenting on Surah 2, 256, Islamic scholar Ibn Kathir stated, quote, Therefore, all the people of the world should be called to Islam. If any one of them refuses to do so, or refuses to pay the jizya, they should be fought till they are killed. Unquote. <laughs> لمرحلة الاستخلاف والأمن والتمكين بل والفتوحات الدعوية والعسكرية التي ستفتح عواصم العالم بأسره وعما قريب إن شاء الله ستفتح روما كما فتحت القسطنطينية ببشارة نبينا محمد نقطة متقدمة للفتوحات الإسلامية التي تنساح في أوروبا كلها ثم تلتفت إلى الأمريكتين the 12th century Islamic sheikh, Ruhun ad-Din Ali, remarked, quote, The destruction of the sword is incurred by infidels, although they be not the first aggressors, unquote. This is offensive jihad. Influential Islamic scholar and commentator of the Quran, Abul Maududi, who died in 1979, said, quote, The ultimate objective of Islam is to abolish the lordship of man over man and bring him under the rule of Allah. This purpose is called jihad. Undertake jihad and establish Allah's rule on earth. Let us come forward and fight in Allah's cause with whatever we possess, unquote. The 14th century Islamic historian Ibn Khaldun said, quote, In the Muslim community, the holy war is a religious duty because of the universalism of the Muslim mission and the obligation to convert everybody to Islam, either by persuasion or by force, unquote.
استعن بالله وقاتلهم عندما يقاتلونك لا عندما يرفضون التطبيق عندما يرفضون دخول الاسلام ويرف... او يرفضون دخول أه... تطبيق دفع الجزيه Lastly, Robert Spencer notes the four major schools of Islamic law teach offensive jihad quote All four principal Sunni schools of jurisprudence the Shafi'i, Maliki, Hanafi and Hanbali schools agree on the importance of jihad warfare against non-Muslims who refuse to convert to Islam Ibn Abi Zaid al Rawana, a Maliki jurist declared that it is preferable not to begin hostilities with the enemy before having invited the latter to embrace the religion of Allah except where the enemy attacks first they have the alternative of either converting to Islam or paying the poll tax jizya, short of which war will be declared against them. Ibn Taymiyyah, a Hanbali jurist who is a favorite of bin Laden and other modern-day jihadists, explained that the aim of jihad was that the religion and God's word is uppermost, therefore according to all Muslims, those who stand in the way of this aim must be fought. The other schools echo these teachings. The Hanafi school stipulates, if the infidels upon receiving the call to convert to Islam neither consent to it nor agree to pay the capitation tax, it is then incumbent on the Muslims to call upon God for assistance and to make war upon them. The Prophet moreover commands us to do so. Likewise, the Shafi scholar Abdul Hassan al-Mawardi taught that once infidels refuse the invitation to convert to Islam, war is waged against them and they are treated as those whom the call has reached." Unquote. <laughs> In regards to terrorism, in a 2014 online speech translated by Memory TV, the Sudanese cleric Muhammad Ali Al Jazuli said, ولذلك نحن في الإسلام واسمع مني هذه وهذه فتوى شرعية الإسلام في عربه مع الكفار لا يعرف الفرق بين الجيوش النظامية والمواطنين المدنيين The Hadith al-Jazuli paraphrase can be found in Sunan ibn Majah, quote, It was narrated from Abu Huraira that the Messenger of Allah said, Whoever helps to kill a believer, even with half a word, he will meet Allah with the words written between his eyes. He has no hope of the mercy of Allah, unquote. This gives Muslims justification for blaming civilian taxpayers for the death of Muslims, since soldiers, their taxes fund, fight and kill Muslim soldiers. Thus, Muslim scholars say Western civilians can be murdered in jihad because of this. This is why we see Muslims murdering soldiers and civilians in the street in the West. Islamic theologian Abu al-Ghazali said, one may use a catapult against them non-Muslims. When they are in a fortress, even if among them are women and children, one may set fire to them and or drown them." Unquote. This is based on two ahadith at Sahih Muslim where Muhammad permitted the murder of unbelieving women and children. Quote, it is reported on the authority of Sab B. Jathama that the Prophet of Allah, when asked about the women and children of the polytheists being killed during the night raid, said, They are from them. Unquote. The 14th century Islamic scholar Ibn Taymiyyah said unbelieving women and children can be murdered by Muslims if they merely, quote, fight with words, e.g. propaganda. Unquote. Moreover, the reason Muslims engage in terrorist attacks against those who draw cartoons of Muhammad or who speak against Islam in Muhammad is because Muhammad allowed his followers to murder anyone who insulted him. For example, Muhammad allowed a blind man to stab his slave mother to death for merely criticizing Muhammad, and he allowed a man to strangle a Jewish woman to death merely for disparaging Muhammad. Moreover, Muhammad said the people who will receive the severest punishment from Allah will be the picture makers." Unquote. So it's because Muhammad taught terrorism, which is why, according to the Clarion Project poll study, more than 42 million Muslims support the terrorist organization ISIS. These Muslims realize the ISIS caliphate and its brutal ways were actually sanctioned and practiced by Muhammad and his early caliph successors. Also, just concerning suicide bombings alone, 3,400 people were murdered in Islamic attacks in 2014, with 529 bombings. This is again because Islam teaches terrorism. Moreover, one could mention the Charlie Hebdo cartoonist massacre, which left 12 dead, the Ottawa parliament attack, which left a Canadian soldier dead, the Muslim convert who did a lethal hit and run on a Canadian soldier in Quebec, the Muslim in France who drove his car through a crowd screaming Allah Wakbar, the Muslim who murdered three people at the Brussels Jewish Museum, the two black Muslims in Britain who ran over and then beheaded an innocent soldier named Lee Rigby in broad daylight with a machete, the Muslim in Oklahoma who beheaded his female co-worker after being fired for trying to convert people to Islam, the Nigerian Muslim terror group Boko Haram murdering close to 2,000 people in an attack on the city of Baga and surrounding villages in Borno state, the four Jewish hostages killed by Muslims in a parish kosher grocery store, the 10-year-old suicide bomb-strapped girl who murdered 19 in Madaguri, northeastern Nigeria. The 10 murdered and 45 churches torched during protests over a Muhammad cartoon in Niger. The Libya hotel attack where Muslims massacred 9 people. The Detroit man who stabbed 2 people at a bus stop after asking them whether or not they were Muslim. The Kenyan al-Shabaab Islamic militants who killed 148 people at a university. The Taliban massacres of 145 boys at a school. And the Muslim who murdered 4 marines after storming military facilities in Chattanooga, etc. These are just some of the Muslim terror attacks inspired by Muhammad's teachings, which occurred during the production of this documentary. I also want to speak tonight directly to Muslims throughout the world. We respect your faith. His teachings are good and peaceful. Islam teaches peace. 
Now, if it can be shown that Muhammad and his early successors, the Caliphs, i.e. the heads of the Islamic State, engaged in offensive jihad warfare, that would prove jihad is part of Islamic teaching, and also that the Quran they were following teaches jihad. Muhammad said, quote, keep to my sunnah and to the sunnah of the rightly guided Caliphs, cling to them stubbornly, unquote. The sunnah of Muhammad and the early Caliphs, Muhammad said, must be followed, are their teachings and actions. Hence, if they engaged in offensive jihad, then offensive jihad is a valid Islamic practice. The historian Will Durant notes, quote, during his 10 years in Medina, he, Muhammad, planned 65 campaigns and raids, and personally led 27. In AD 625, Muhammad ordered an offensive invasion against the Jewish Banu Nadir tribe. After the slaughter, Muhammad then expelled the remaining survivors from Arabia. As an excuse to attack them, Muhammad claimed he received a revelation from Gabriel that they supposedly wanted to assassinate him. However, the context shows why he really attacked them. Historian William Montgomery Watt notes, quote, The main underlying reason for the expulsion of the clan of al Nadir was Jewish criticisms endangered the ordinary Muslims' belief in Muhammad's prophethood and in the Quran as revelation from God. It should also be kept in mind that the attack was made only a few weeks after the Muslim loss of life at Al-Raji and Bir Mauna, when many people in Medina must have been entertaining gloomy feelings. It is also possible that the allegation that the Banu Nadir tribe wanted to assassinate Muhammad was no more than an excuse to justify the attacks." Unquote. Now in AD 627, Muhammad sent his adopted son Zayd bin Haritha to lead an offensive, unprovoked jihad raid at Al Jamun, where the Muslims captured a group of non-Muslims and stole a bunch of their camels and goats. Again in AD 627, Muhammad sent Abdul Rahman bin Auf to lead an offensive expedition of 700 Muslim men against the Christian Banu Kalb tribe. The reason was to get them to submit to Islam, pay the poll tax, or die. Before sending Abdul Rahman bin Auf out on this attack, Muhammad said to him, quote, fight everyone in the way of God and kill those who disbelieve in God, unquote. Al-Waqidi confirms, quote, at first they refused all but the sword, unquote. Now in 8630, Muhammad sent Al-Dahaq ibn Sufyan to lead a Muslim force to al zuji to command the people of the Banu Kilab tribe to embrace Islam or die. Al-Waqidi reported, quote, the messenger of God sent an army to al karata They met them in Zuji. They invited them to Islam, but they refused. So they fought them and defeated them, unquote. Ibn Sa'd confirms the same thing, quote, they invited them to embrace Islam. They refused, so they attacked them, unquote. In 8631, over a dozen men of the Banu Azad clan led by Sarad bin Abdullah became new converts to Islam. Muhammad's response was to order them to attack their non-Muslim neighboring tribes, that is, the people of Jarash in Yemen. Ibn Sa'd notes, quote, He, Sarad, invited them, the neighboring tribes, to embrace Islam, but they declined, unquote. The historian Al-Tabardi notes the Muslim Sarad therefore, quote, inflicted a heavy loss on them, unquote. In 8632, Muhammad sent Jarir ibn Abdullah al-Bajali on an offensive expedition to destroy the Dual Kalasa, which was a religious temple of the Yemenite pagans. Muhammad's soldiers slaughtered those trying to defend their temple. In Sahih Bukhari, we read, The Prophet said to me, Won't you relieve me from Dual Kalasa? So I set out with 150 riders, and we dismantled it and killed whoever was present there. Then I came to the Prophet and informed him, and he invoked good upon us and al amas tribe, unquote. In Hisham al-Kalbi's The Book of Vitals, we also read of this campaign's offensive nature, quote, the apostle addressed him, Jarir ibn Abdullah, saying, O Jarir, wilt thou not rid me of Dual Kalasa? Jarir replied, Yeah. So the apostle dispatched him to destroy it. He set out until he got to the Banu Abmas of the Bajali tribe, and with them he proceeded to Dual Kalasa. There he was met by Katham and the Bahila, who resisted him and attempted to defend Dual Kalasa. He therefore fought them and killed a hundred men of the Bahila, its custodians, and many of the Katham. While of the Banu Kubafa, Ibn Amir ibn Katham, he killed two hundred. Having defeated them and forced them into flight, he demolished the building which stood over the Dual Kalasa and set it on fire. Unquote. We will now turn our attention to some of the offensive jihad campaigns undertaken by Muhammad's early caliph successors, that is, the rightly guided caliphs. In AD 628, Muhammad sent his first caliph successor, Abu Bakr, to lead an offensive expedition against people of the Arab Banu Kilab tribe. Muslims began hostilities with this tribe by murdering some of their innocent men. In Sunan Abu Dawud, we read about a later Muslim attack after those innocent men were murdered, quote, The Apostle of Allah appointed Abu Bakr, our commander, and we fought with some of the people who were polytheists, and we attacked them at night, killing them. Our war cry that night was, put to death, put to death. Salama said, I killed that night with my hand polytheist belonging to seven houses, unquote. Now after becoming caliph in 8632, after the death of Muhammad, Abu Bakr engaged in various offensive campaigns. According to the book Biographies of the Rightly Guided Caliphs, which is a compendium from the works of Muslim historians like Ibn Kathir al-Tabari, as Suyuti and others, the mindset behind Abu Bakr's conquests was the following, quote, The basic aim of Muslim conquests was to spread the call to Islam to all nations in all lands, calling on people to embrace Islam or to enter a peace agreement and lead life under the protection of the Muslims. If they rejected both options, war would be the only choice left, unquote. This brings us to the conquest of Iraq ordered by Abu Bakr, specifically the Battle of the Chains. Abu Bakr ordered Khalid ibn al-Walid to march to Iraq in the region of Obala with a Muslim force. The governor of this district of Iraq was Hormuz. Khalid sent Hormuz a letter saying, quote, Surrender to Islam and you will live in peace. In the alternative, you may agree to the payment of jizya, and you and your people will be under our protection. Otherwise, you will have only yourself to blame for the consequences. I have brought you a people who desire death as ardently as you desire life." Unquote. This is offensive jihad. This battle led to thousands of non-Muslims being killed. 
Moreover, Abu Bakr had Khalid engage in offensive jihad against the people of Al-Anbar, which was a town where caravans from Asham and Persia came. In regards to the Muslim motivation for waging this battle, the book Biographies of the Rightly Guided Caliphs explains, quote, Khalid grew impatient, he wanted to spread Islam everywhere. So he looked westwards along the banks of the Euphrates and saw Al-Anbar, unquote. Although the governor of that district, Shirzad, tried his best to defend the town, the battle was ultimately lost. Regarding the second caliph, Umar, who reigned from AD 634 to 644, it is necessary to mention his harshness towards Christians of Asham after they were put under Muslim rule. Ibn Kathir provides us with the terms of his treaty with these Christians. Under these terms, the Christians could not erect churches, monasteries, or sanctuaries for monks. They could not restore any place of worship that needed restoration. They could not publicly practice shirk, i.e. teach Jesus and the Holy Spirit are divine, or invite anyone to such beliefs. If a Muslim wanted to sit where a Christian was sitting, the Christian had to move and let the Muslim sit there. They could not erect crosses on the outside of their churches, and they could not bury their dead next to Muslim dead. Moreover, Al-Bukhari tells us the following story of Ibn Umar. Quote, Abdul Rahman said, Ibn Umar passed by a Christian who greeted him, and Ibn Umar returned the greeting. He was told the man was a Christian. When he learned that, he went back to him and said, Give me back my greeting. Unquote. This is because, as Al-Bukhari reports, quote, Abu Huraira reported that the Prophet said, Do not give the people of the book the greeting first. Force them to the narrowest part of the road. Unquote. Thus, it is quite clear Muhammad and his caliph successors practiced offensive jihad and subjugation, which means it is part of Islam. In some, the historian Robert Hoyland observes, quote, In just over a hundred years, from the death of Muhammad in 632 to the beginning of the Abbasid Caliphate in 750, the followers of the Prophet swept across the whole of the Middle East, North Africa, and Spain. Their armies threatened states as far as the Franks in Western Europe and the Tang Empire in China, unquote. Muhammad himself taught that unbelievers should be offered conversion or subjugation or war. Those are the only things. That choices. is false. That is absolutely false. Wow. Unfortunately, it's true. understanding and inclusion. No, and you it's have to look at the, 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 the Quran. I am reading the Quran. Chapter 9, verse 29. Chapter 9, chapter 9 verse 29. This. Now, modern Muslims claim the Christian scriptures are corrupted because Muhammad contradicted Christian teachings and because later Muslim writers attacked the preservation of the Bible. I would say that uh, the New Testament in, in particular and the Bible in general uh, contain some messages from the previous prophets, including Jesus. Uh, but uh, these messages are mixed up with the commentaries and writings of other persons and redactors and, uh, and editors that came later on in such a manner that today we cannot uh, simply just take anything at face value that Moses wrote this or Jesus said this. However, despite this, the Quran itself actually teaches the Christian scriptures of Muhammad's time which are the same ones we have today, were to be followed and were not corrupted. In Quran 4, 136 we read, quote, O ye who believe, believe in Allah and his messenger and the scripture which he hath revealed unto his messenger and the scripture which he revealed aforetime. Whoso disbelieveth in Allah and his angels and his scriptures and his messengers in the last day, he verily hath wandered far astray, unquote. Commanding people to believe in Christian scriptures presupposes they were intact and uncorrupted. Moreover, in Quran 568, the Muslims are told the 7th century Jews and Christians ought to listen to Allah and, quote, perform the Torah and the gospel in Jeel and what was sent down to you from your Lord." Unquote. How could they do so if it was corrupted? Such texts could be multiplied. In fact, the earliest Muslim biographer of Muhammad's life, Ibn Iskak of the 8th century, helps us know what Muhammad meant by his references to the Gospel or Injil of the Christians. Quote, Among the things which have reached me about what Jesus the Son of Mary stated in the Gospel, which he received from God for the followers of the Gospel, in applying a term to describe the Apostle of God is the following. It is extracted from what John the Apostle sent down for them when he wrote the Gospel for them from the Testament of Jesus Son of Mary. Unquote. The Gospel of John of Muhammad's time is the exact same one we possess today. Also again, in Ibn Iskak's Life of Muhammad, we are told Muhammad affirmed the Torah of the 7th century is the truth from God, quote, Rafi b. Haritha and others came to him, Muhammad, and said, Do you not allege that you follow the religion of Abraham and believe in the Torah which we have and testify that it is the truth from God? He replied, Certainly, unquote. Still more, in Sunan Abu Dawud, we are told Muhammad believed the Torah he possessed in the 7th century, quote, He then withdrew the cushion from beneath him and placed the Torah on it, saying, I believe in thee and in him who revealed thee, unquote. Hence, although modern Muslims claim the Bible is corrupt and Muhammad contradicted its teachings, the fact is Muhammad still nevertheless affirmed the authority, inspiration, and pristine form of the Jewish and Christian scriptures. Now, Muslims claim Christians do not know who wrote the Gospels and that the authors of them were not eyewitnesses. This is what you assume that Matthew wrote. This is what you assume Mark wrote. This is what you assume Luke wrote. This is what you assume that John wrote. Therefore, according, 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 according. However, history refutes this. Indeed, two Gospels, i.e. Matthew and John, were written by eyewitnesses and Mark and Luke were written by people who had access to eyewitnesses and eyewitness testimony. Although a similar case can be made for Mark and Luke, we will discuss Matthew and John. That Matthew the eyewitness and apostle wrote the Gospel of Matthew is affirmed by the first century extra-biblical writer Papias, who knew apostles of Jesus and eyewitnesses of the apostles. Matthean authorship is also affirmed by Irenaeus writing around AD 180, Pantanus who died in AD 200, and Origen 185-254. That this tradition about Matthean authorship is uniform in the early church, with no early rival authorship theories existing, is evidence Matthean authorship is true. This can be proved internally as well. For example, in numerous Mithian passages, financial transactions are discussed, and none of this content contradicts what a first century tax collector like Matthew would know about finance. Also, we see in chapter 2219, 
the Gospel of Matthew alone not only uses the word denarion, but also the more precise Greek term, nomisma, or state coin. In contrast, when discussing the same event, the other synoptic gospels only use denarion, not showing the same concern for the precise financial term Matthew does. This is what we would expect of a tax collector author, such as Matthew. Also, in Luke 5.29, we are told that Matthew made a great feast in his house, where Jesus then reclined and ate. Likewise, Mark 2.15 says, his house. However, in Matthew's account, Matthew 9.10, we read that Jesus and the disciples reclined at the house. This is consistent with one writing of their own house in a third-person narrative. Regarding John, son of Zebedee, the disciple of Jesus being the author of the Gospel of John, this is affirmed by the second-century writer Irenaeus, sourcing his contemporary acquaintance Polycarp, a pupil of the apostles such as John. Justin Martyr, AD 103-165, references John 3-3-5, while in the same work speaking of the Gospels, including John, in terms of memoirs of the apostles in the plural most likely referencing John and Matthew, since he indicates Mark and Luke were written by those who knew the apostles. Moreover, the author of this gospel affirms he was an eyewitness of Jesus. In fact, in John 21, 20 to 24, the author of this gospel affirms he was an eyewitness known as the beloved disciple. That this beloved disciple was the apostle John is easily proven. Earlier comments in chapter 21 narrowed down the list of possible beloved disciple candidates to Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, James, son of Zebedee, John, son of Zebedee, and two unnamed disciples by placing them at this post-resurrection appearance where the beloved disciple was present. Of these seven, scholars have easily ruled out Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, and James as being the beloved disciple. In supporting the orthodox belief that it was John, son of Zebedee, and not one of these two unnamed disciples, is the fact that in the fourth gospel, the beloved disciple and the apostle Peter are linked closely together. Interestingly, the non johannine New Testament data very strongly links John, son of Zebedee, and Peter as well. Thus, the beloved disciple is John. Moreover, in light of John the Baptist being identified simply as John, this presupposes the author of the fourth gospel's audience would identify the apostle John with another name i.e. the beloved disciple, who was an eyewitness and the writer of this gospel. We can further know that the beloved disciple is John, based on the special relationship three apostles had with Jesus. Out of the twelve apostles, three of them had a very unique relationship with Jesus, and it's fitting one of them should therefore be called the beloved disciple. These three are Peter, James, and John. We know Peter and James are not the beloved disciple who wrote this gospel, since Peter is distinguished from the beloved disciple in various texts in John, and James died around AD 44, which is too early to compose the fourth gospel. That leaves the apostle John to be the one named as the beloved disciple. Now, Muslims claim the gospel biographies about Jesus were written too late to be reliable. The gospels that we have of Jesus were, comp were compiled within uh, 40 to 60 years after the crucifixion. Mm -hmm. So that means in the late decades of the first century. And if you say 40 years for the first and earliest of the four gospels, that means that for 40 years, uh, the Christian community did not have these written documents. So how did they think about Jesus? How did they recollect his words? How did they preach about him? However, their Quran was written 600 years after Jesus, and yet Muslims claim it offers reliable historical information about him. Moreover, in regards to the details of the life of Muhammad, their earliest extant writing is Ibn Ishaq's biography, Life of Muhammad, written around AD 750, which is 118 years after Muhammad's death. So Muslims are inconsistent. The fact is the dating of the Gospels is not at all a problem. They were written between 40 and 65 years after Jesus lived. This is the same amount of time between the end of the Vietnam War in 1975 and now. Yet, there are many reliable eyewitness accounts of the Vietnam War from survivors written today. Compared to other ancient writings we have about prominent figures, the Gospels were written far closer to Jesus' life than they were. For example, our earliest biographies of Julius Caesar are Plutarch and Suetonius, who wrote around 140 to 160 years after Julius Caesar's death. Now, another reason the dates of the Gospels are not a problem is because the culture of Jesus' early followers was a skilled, memorizing culture that specialized in preserving oral tradition. This is why we can know the oral Jesus tradition that made its way into the written Gospels is trustworthy. There is much evidence of ancient Mediterranean memory skill in the environment of Jesus' followers. Ancient education was very focused on memorization, unlike today. The first century Roman elder Seneca noted he was able to recall over 100 recitations he learned from his youth, as well as list 2,000 names he memorized as a child in perfect sequence. Also, in another ancient source, we're told an elderly sophist was able to name 50 names in perfect sequence after only hearing them once. Moreover, the first century rhetorician Quintilian noted orators memorized whole speeches, which were oftentimes several hours long. What is more, communal memory, which is what Jesus' disciples engaged in, was even more reliable because the individual disciples who all heard the same teaching would help remind each other of different points. We know this took place in the ancient Mediterranean. In regards to young Jews, they would practice memorizing the Torah at home and in school. In regards to the Jewish disciples of rabbis, which is what the apostles were to Jesus, they were expected to memorize the rabbi's teaching and sayings through intense repetition exercises. We, we do not have on record that anyone went about in the early decades of the first century uh, memorizing the, the actual words of Jesus. However, the evidence we just amassed proves that is exactly how Jesus' environment was. And ancient disciples often also engaged in note-taking while their teacher or rabbi was speaking. The ancient Jews of Jesus' time did this. Scholars note Matthew, as a tax collector, would have done this since he would know how to read and write. In fact, the first century writer Papias confirms this since he noted, quote, Matthew collected the oracles in the Hebrew language, unquote. In fact, at a conference, the classicist scholar George Kennedy showed a group of New Testament scholars his research on how ancient disciples would write notes when listening to their teacher. One form critical scholar who was present, Reginald Fuller, 
said that these findings weren't an entire revision of the skeptical attitude on the New Testament passing of oral tradition. Now, the Gospel writers used earlier written sources too, which further helps to bring the dating of the content of the Gospels earlier. Scholars note Matthew and Luke used what is known as the earlier Q source. Luke used the earlier L material and other written eyewitness sources. And Matthew used his own source, known as M. Likewise, Mark used a pre-Markan source. So for Muslims to only mention how the Gospels were written down 40 to 65 years after Jesus, without mentioning these earlier sources they used, is dishonest. What is more, the fact the genre of the Gospels is Greco-Roman historical biography, and that this ancient genre is seen to be quite reliable by scholars, is evidence for the reliability of the Gospels, despite their date of composition. The consensus of scholars now is the Gospels are Greco-Roman historical biography, due to the works of Charles Albert and Richard Burridge. Burridge's book, which demonstrates this, is called What Are the Gospels? One example proving this is the Gospels have the same amount of words ancient biographies had, i.e. between 10,000 and 25,000 words. Other genres had a different amount of words. Another example proving this is ancient biographies often started with or focused on the person's adult career, which is what we have with the Gospels. This is significant because the intended genre of the Gospels was not novel, mythography, drama, fiction, or tragedy, etc., as some sometimes allege but instead, serious Greco-Roman historical biography. This is also significant because ancient histories and biographies generally showed great care for accuracy. Luke Acts is a multi-volume history, the first volume being biography, and Mark, Matthew, and John are Greco-Roman historical biography. Proof ancient historians and biographers were concerned with accuracy will now be shown. Ancient historians affirmed histories were to be truthful. The second century Lucian of Samosata wrote that good historians did not falsify events, showing there was an expectation not to do so at that time in history. In fact, he said, quote, if you are going to write history, you must sacrifice to truth alone, end quote. Ancient rhetorical historians affirmed they should not only be skilled rhetoricians, but also good researchers. Likewise, in the first century BC, Cicero said, quote, Everybody knows that the first law of history is not daring to say anything false, that the second is daring to say everything true, unquote. Pliny the Younger was contemporaneous with the Gospels, and noted histories should be based on genuine facts. The Greek historian of the second century BC, Polybius, noted historians ought to be acquainted with the places they write about, that they should do thorough investigation of what they write about, that they should not get facts wrong, and that they should not fabricate sources. Ancient historians thought it best to report recent events based on eyewitness oral tradition or to be an eyewitness themselves. Material can be multiplied. Now, Muslims claim the disciples were illiterate, and thus could not do note-taking to help preserve oral tradition, or write the Greek New Testament Gospels attributed to them. Even if you read the Greek in 1 Peter, it's very highly advanced for unlettered Galilean fishermen to be writing in such sophisticated Greek and using the Greek Old Testament rather than the Hebrew. They often quote agnostic critic Bart Ehrman on this who claims, quote, something like 90% of the general population was completely illiterate, that is, unable to read and write at all. In the end, it seems unlikely that the uneducated lower-class illiterate disciples of Jesus played the decisive role in the literary compositions that have come down through history under their names, unquote. However, such a view has been challenged by recent scholarship. As Craig Keener notes, quote, Certainly the supposition that few Palestinian Jews could write has been challenged and shown inaccurate." Unquote. One evidence we will cite is there were Jewish synagogues in first century Palestine according to Josephus, Philo, Luke, Acts, the Theodosius inscription, and the discovered remains of pre-70 AD synagogues at Galma, Herodium, Masada, and Qumran. And these synagogues functioned as education centers for young Jews, so they could learn to read Torah and write. This refutes the idea first century Palestinian Jews were illiterate. We already argued since Matthew was a tax collector, he would have been able to read and write. Moreover, Luke as a doctor and historian would have known how to read and write. Regarding Mark, we know from early and late 2nd century historical evidence that he wrote down Peter's testimony for his gospel, which of course requires the ability to read and write. In regards to other early disciples of Jesus, Eddie and Boyd note, quote, Luke notes quite incidentally that many before him had attempted to write accounts of what went on among the early Christians. On top of this, there are sayings in Paul's letters that parallel sayings in the gospel traditions. This may suggest that sayings were written down and circulated well before the gospels were written. Even more forceful, however, are the strong verbal similarities between Matthew and Luke when recording material not found in Mark. These similarities can be accounted for most easily by supposing that Matthew and Luke shared a common written source. In light of all this, it does not appear that the disciples were altogether illiterate." Unquote. Finally, Muslims and others often misunderstand Acts 4.13 to teach the disciples Peter and John were illiterate. However, the text doesn't mean that. As the exegete Craig Blomberg points out, quote, it is a myth that most first century Jewish men were illiterate, an idea sometimes based on a mistranslation of Acts 4.13, which implies only that the first disciples, Peter and John, were not formally apprenticed to a rabbi after reaching the age of 13." Unquote. Now, Muslims often claim the disciples did not know Greek to be able to write the Greek Gospels. However, in light of the disciples being from rural Palestine, Kina relays, although Aramaic was probably the first language of most Galileans outside the urban centers, even in Lower Galilee, Greek was widespread in Palestine. Even the Semiticist Gustav Dahlmann long ago recognized the use of Greek in Jerusalem." Unquote. To prove this, Keener cites the following studies. Secondly, New Testament scholar and Greek expert Stanley E. Porter argues, quote, Among Jesus' disciples, not only Andrew and Philip had Greek names, but the names of Simon, Bartholomew, and Thaddeus may well have derived from Greek or gone easily into Greek. This scenario of Greek speaking is consonant also with the fact that several of Jesus' disciples were fishermen, for example, Peter, Andrew, and the sons of Zebedee, James, and John, which would have required that they conduct much of their business of selling fish in Greek, unquote. For his source showing fishermen needed to know Greek, Porter cites the following study. 
Thirdly, even if not all the early disciples knew Greek, there is good evidence, contrary to the claims of some, that in the first century, scribes were paid to write for people. Thus, such disciples would have paid a scribe to compose their gospel, or epistle, in Greek. To quote Maillard on some of the evidence, quote, Nevertheless, scribes continued to do most of the writing, and that was still the case in the first century. By the New Testament times, most scribes still earned their living through clerical tasks, in administrative offices or on the street. The letters and legal deeds from the Bar Kashma Caves, which are often signed by the scribe, illustrate their work. Outside official circles, commerce, legal matters, and family affairs all called for secretarial skills, providing a livelihood for the multitude of scribes in Palestine. There are references to private letters in various sources from 1st Maccabees onwards, the Babylonian Talmud recalling how Rabbi Gamaliel II, about 8100, dictated them to an amanuensis. See also Paul's use of Tertius in Romans 16.22. Actual examples of papyri survive in Palestine from the early 2nd century, and there are short notes in Hebrew and Greek from Asanda. The Bar Kochba caves have also yielded legal deeds in Greek and Aramaic. In one case, the scribe was a husband of the woman involved in the deed and signed on her behalf. She, it is said, borrowing the writing. For the Greek documents, their editor stated, the quality of writing in these subscriptions differ. One man's hand may be described as that of a practiced, experienced writer. While the majority of these deeds date from the beginning of the second century, they continue a type current earlier. The deed dated in Nero's second year bears the name of the scribe, with the preserved names of two witnesses and a fragmentary Aramaic deed in a late Herodian hand as the name of five in the first century." Unquote. Now, Muslims claim there are irreconcilable contradictions in the New Testament documents, which allegedly prove the Bible to be false. However, rarely do Muslims study the bulk of scholarly Christian works which address the so-called contradictions unbelievers bring up. For example, Gleason Archer's Encyclopedia of Bible Difficulties, Geisler and Howe's Big Book of Bible Difficulties, Haley's Alleged Discrepancies of the Bible, Arndt, Harbers, and Rohr's Bible Difficulties and Seeming Contradictions, etc. In-depth conservative exegetical commentary sets also do a good job of addressing alleged contradictions. Now, one of the lists of alleged contradictions Muslims like to parrot comes from Bert Ehrman. He often offers the following. What day did Jesus die on? And what time of day? Did he die on the day that, uh, the day before the Passover meal was eaten, as John explicitly says? Or did he die after it was eaten, as Mark explicitly says? Did he die at noon, as in John, or at 9 a.m., as in Mark? He lists more, but here we will address two. Did Jesus die the day before the Passover meal was eaten, as John explicitly says? Or did he die after it was eaten, as Mark explicitly says? Well, John does not explicitly say Jesus died the day before Passover meal was eaten. He says Jesus died on the, quote, day of preparation of the Passover, John 19, 14, which refers not to the day of preparation for the Passover meal, which was on Thursday. The phrase is paraskiu tau pasha, and it instead refers to the day of preparation of Passover week, which was indeed on Friday. D.A. Carson proves this with the following ancient references. So when Mark says Jesus died the day after Passover meal, which was Friday, there is no contradiction because John is saying he died on the day of preparation of Passover week, which was also Friday. Both agree. Now did Jesus die at noon as in John, or at 9 a.m. as in Mark? Well, Mark does not say Jesus died at 9 a.m. Mark 15.25 says Jesus was crucified at 9 a.m. Big difference. However, Mark goes on to say in Mark 15.34-37 that at the ninth hour, or 3 p.m., Jesus, quote, uttered a loud cry and breathed his last, unquote. So Jesus died at 3 p.m. according to Mark. John 19.14 says Jesus was carried away to be crucified at about the sixth hour. This is going by Roman time since John wrote in Ephesus, the Roman province of Asia. This means Jesus was carried away to be crucified at about 6 a.m. according to John, and was actually crucified at 9 a.m. according to Mark. And again, he died later that day at 3 p.m. according to Mark 15, 34 to 37. Hence, there is no contradiction. Now, a popular alleged contradiction Muslims bring up has to do with how long Jesus was dead before rising. After quoting Matthew 12, 39 to 40, which says Jesus would be dead for three days and three nights, Muslim apologist Ahmed Adidat wrote, quote, Jesus was supposed to have been crucified on a Friday afternoon. So Friday night, he is supposed to have been in the grave. Next morning, Saturday day, he is supposed to be in the grave. Saturday night, also, he is supposed to be in the grave. But Sunday morning, the first day of the week, when Mary Magdalene visits the sepulchre, she finds it empty. The answer we were after was three days and three nights, but unfortunately, we are getting one day and two nights." Unquote. However, Dida did not understand the Hebrew method of reckoning days Jesus was using, which is why he came up with those figures. As D.A. Carson observes, quote, In rabbinical thought, a day and night make an onah, and part of an onah is as a whole. Thus, according to Jewish tradition, three days and three nights need mean no more than three days, or the combination of any part of three separate days." Unquote. Thus, Gleason Archer concludes, quote, According to ancient parlance then, when you wished to refer to three separate 24-hour days, you said three days and three nights, even though only a portion of the first and third days might be involved." Unquote. Now, Muslims wonder why the Gospels tell the same story a bit differently at times. Well, this was common in ancient biography and did not render the work erroneous. For example, the first century writer Plutarch penned many biographies, yet among his various biographies the same story is often told a bit differently on purpose because he was using common compositional devices. The Gospels used these as well, and they were not regarded as erroneous. These devices included spotlighting, where one main figure is focused on in an account, whereas in another account, more figures might actually be present. Another device is called compression, where events are portrayed as happening in a shorter period of time than they actually occurred. Another is called transferal, which is when words or deeds of a person or group are transferred to the dominant person in the story. Another is called displacement, which is when the author removes an event from its context and places it to another. 
And lastly, there is simplification, which is where although in one biography an event may be very detailed, in another it may not be, because detailing it is not essential to that work's objective, which is the subject's character, etc. Michael Lacona has demonstrated these are not contradictions. They are simply ancient compositional devices, and they account for many of the so-called New Testament errors Muslims and other unbelievers bring up. Plus, the Quran tells the same stories in different places with different words and details. In fact, for 200 years, they've been trying to sell the Bible. They've been trying to use historical criticism, redacted criticism, source criticism, literary criticism, every kind of doctrine, uh, the uh, documentary hypothesis, all these different criticisms have been forced against the Bible since the late 1800s. Every one of them have an answer. I love this book. You've got the right man at the right place doing the right thing in the right time. And that's why this book is such a great foundational book for us today. Now, Muslims like to make a big deal out of the fact that there are around 400,000 textual variants in the thousands of ancient New Testament manuscripts we have. However, because of their lack of understanding of the field of textual criticism, they severely overstate the significance of this. It must be noted there are a lot of variants because there are a lot of manuscripts. Scholars affirm about 99% of these variants are not viable or meaningful, meaning they don't change the meaning of the text or reflect the original reading. The vast majority of these variants are minor spelling differences or nonsense errors that have no impact on the meaning of the text and which are easily spotted to not be the original reading. The second most common variants are ones that do not affect translation or which involve synonyms. For example, some manuscripts will mention names like Mary or Jesus, while others use the definite article with the name saying the Mary or the Jesus. These all count as variants, but of course don't affect translation. Moreover, sometimes manuscripts will have words in different order, even though scholars know what is being conveyed, whatever word order is used in the manuscript. The third most common variants are ones that affect the meaning of the text but are not viable or reflective of the original reading. And lastly, there are those variants which both affect the meaning of the text and are viable or a possible reading of the original. But these only make up about 1% of the variants. So noting there are around 400,000 variants in the thousands of New Testament manuscripts without mentioning this is dishonest. As Timothy Paul Jones notes in his refutation of one of Bart Ehrman's books, quote, most of these 400,000 variants stem from differences in spelling, word order, or the relationships between nouns and definite articles, variants that are easily recognizable. In the end, more than 99% of the 400,000 differences fall into this category of virtually unnoticeable variants. Of the remaining 1% or so of variants, only a few have any significance for interpreting the biblical text. Most important, none of the differences affect any central element of the Christian faith." Unquote. Now, in their book Jesus Prophet of Islam, Muslim authors Muhammad Atta ur Rahim and Ahmed Thompson falsely claim it was the Council of Nicaea of 8325 which selected which books would be included in the New Testament, and that there were allegedly hundreds if not thousands of Gospels they chose from. However, this is historical fiction. Their book provides no sources for these claims. The Council of Nicaea dealt with combating Arianism, not the canon of the New Testament. As even the non-Christian critic Art Ehrman states, quote, the Council of Nicaea did not deal with the matter of canon, unquote. Now, if one looks at the historical evidence regarding which books were accepted among the early Christians prior to the formation of the canon, there were not hundreds or thousands of books which were being considered as legitimate. The Muratorian canon of AD 170, Origen's canon of the mid-3rd century, and Eusebius's canon of the early 4th century, accepted basically all the New Testament books Christians today accept, and the books they list as unreliable or forgeries to not be regarded as canon are few in number, not hundreds or thousands. Moreover, they were mostly a few dubious Gnostic forgeries of the 2nd century, not serious 1st century Orthodox books. Church historian and theologian Gregor Allison explains how the canon of the early Christians from the 2nd to the 4th century prior to canonization actually looked, thus refuting this dubious Muslim claim, quote, It should be noted that nearly all the New Testament writings that we consider canonical were viewed similarly by the early church, the four gospels, the acts of the apostles, 13 letters of Paul, 1 Peter, 1 John, and at least in many circles the revelation of John. Several writings that are now considered canonical, James, 2 Peter, 2 and 3 John, Jude, Hebrews, were on the fringe of the early church's canon. Still other writings were on the margins of the early church's canon, but ultimately were not included in the New Testament. The letter of Barnabas, the shepherd of Hermes, the Didache, and several other works appeared with some consistency in some of the lists of canonical writings. The church eventually recognized that none of these passed the tests of apostolicity and antiquity, and thus they could not be part of the canonical scriptures composing the New Testament." Unquote. This is the true picture of the canon of the early church, not this Muslim lie that there were hundreds or thousands of books being seriously considered as canon. This is the consensus of scholarship. The aforementioned letter of Barnabas, written between AD 100 and 130, is important to discuss now. This document various Christians in the early church liked is not the same as the later Gospel of Barnabas, which modern Muslims like and exploit, even though Muslim writers often confuse the two documents. Because many early Christians liked the theologically sound Epistle of Barnabas, and because there is a later separate forgery called the Gospel of Barnabas, which is sympathetic to aspects of Islamic theology, Muslim writers often confuse the two writings and claim the early Epistle of Barnabas is the one that teaches Islamic themes, even though it doesn't. Both texts are easily accessible online, and anyone can read them to see they are different. The early Epistle of Barnabas does not deny Jesus' crucifixion or deity, as the later Gospel of Barnabas does. For example, the Epistle of Barnabas says, quote, If therefore the Son of God, who is Lord of all things, and who will judge the living and the dead, suffered, that his stroke might give us life, let us believe that the Son of God could not have suffered except for our sakes, unquote. 
and quote, if the Lord endured to suffer for our soul, he being Lord of all the world, to whom God said at the foundation of the world, let us make man after our image and after our likeness, understand how it was that he endured to suffer at the hand of men, unquote. So the early epistle of Barnabas affirms God the Father spoke to Jesus in Genesis 1.26, saying, let us make man in our image, thus affirming Jesus' deity, and it also affirms Jesus' sonship and sacrifice for sins. Now, although the later separate gospel of Barnabas does deny Jesus' crucifixion and deity, that doesn't matter because this document is a medieval forgery, not written by the historical Barnabas. As the scholar of Islam Cyril Glass notes in his book, The New Encyclopedia of Islam, quote, as regards the Gospel of Barnabas itself, there is no question it is a medieval forgery. A complete Italian manuscript exists, which appears to be a translation from a Spanish original, which exists in part. Written to curry favor with Muslims of the time, it contains anachronisms which can date only from the Middle Ages and not before, and shows a garbled comprehension of Islamic doctrines, calling the Prophet Muhammad the Messiah, which Islam does not claim for him. Stylistically, it is a mediocre parody of the Gospels, as the writings of Baha Allah are of the Quran." Unquote. Michael Lacona lists some of these anachronisms contained in this document, quote, the year of Jubilee is said to occur every 100 years, chapter 38. However, the year of Jubilee was celebrated every 50 years until the papal decree in AD 1343, placing the date of writing sometime afterward. Medieval feudalism is mentioned in chapter 122, and medieval court procedures in chapter 121. Someone in the first century would not have known about these things. Wooden wine casks are mentioned in chapter 152, instead of wineskins which were used in first century Palestine." Unquote. Thus, the modern Muslim appeal to this document as early proof for Islamic theology is totally erroneous and ridiculous. Now, certain Muslims claim various verses deny Jesus was crucified. Others who believe Jesus was crucified claim Jesus survived crucifixion, did not die, and was raised up to Allah after being injured instead. Muslims sometimes claim while Jesus was in the tomb, the spices the women brought for him were actually medicines which supposedly healed the injured but alive Christ. This is ridiculous since in the Old Testament, dead kings were anointed with aromatic spices to honor them. This is what is going on here. The women were displaying Jesus' kingly dignity and removing any disgrace of his crucifixion. It was not to revive him. New Testament scholar James R. Edwards confirms, quote, The Jews anointed corpses with oil mixed with myrrh and aloes. The purpose of anointing was to perfume the decaying corpse as an act of devotion, unquote. Moving on, Muslims also claim Jesus is presented as dying too quickly in order for Jesus to have actually died. For example, Ahmed Dida quoted Mark 15, 44, where Pontius Pilate marvels that Jesus died so soon. Didat also noted how in John 19.32-33, the soldiers do not break Jesus' legs to finish him off, but only those of the criminals next to him. However, to answer these arguments, John 19.33 says Jesus' legs were not broken because the soldiers, quote, saw that he was already dead, unquote. Moreover, after Pilate marveled Jesus died so soon, Mark 15.44-45 says he summoned a centurion and asked him if Jesus was dead, and the centurion confirmed he was. This is significant because centurions were professional executioners, and it was their job to kill and know if someone was dead. Moreover, the testimony of the narratives are explicit Jesus died from crucifixion here, and there were eyewitnesses who were present who confirmed it, such as Jesus' women followers. Also, there are many reasons to affirm Jesus died by crucifixion because of the brutality of the method of crucifixion itself, despite the short amount of time Jesus was on the cross. Victims of crucifixion were tortured ruthlessly by flogging. Josephus notes people would be whipped until their intestines were exposed. Seneca explains crucifixion victims had, quote, battered and infective carcasses, and were maimed, misshapen, deformed, nailed, and drawing the breath of life amid long drawn out agony, unquote. After flogging, the victim was nailed to a cross or tree. There is only one report of a man ever surviving crucifixion in the ancient Roman world, and it's because he was removed from his cross quickly and given Rome's best medical care. According to this report, Josephus pleaded with Titus the commander to remove three of his crucified friends from the cross. Of the three who were quickly removed after crucifixion and provided with Rome's best medical care, two died and only one survived. So even if Jesus was removed from the cross while alive, his chances of survival were slim, especially since he was not provided with any medical attention, much less Rome's best, and was put in a dark tomb with no air or water. After reviewing the material concerning Jesus' crucifixion, medical experts wrote in the Journal of the American Medical Association, quote, Interpretations based on the assumption that Jesus did not die on the cross appear to be at odds with modern medical knowledge, unquote. A strong positive case can be made for Jesus' crucifixion. In Quran 4, 157, Muhammad denied the historical event. However, the most powerful rebuttal to Muhammad's denial of this is to note there are four indisputable sayings of Jesus which meet the criteria of authenticity where Jesus predicts his own crucifixion. We will discuss one of these. In Mark 8.31, Jesus says he, the Son of Man, must be rejected, killed, and then rise from the dead. Now, in the immediate context, Jesus rebukes one of his leading apostles, Peter, and calls him Satan for defying what was to take place. This is an embarrassing feature about Peter later Christians would not invent. Thus, we know this text is authentic because it meets the criterion of embarrassment. Moreover, Jesus' use of the title Son of Man in this text is dissimilar to how later Christians identified Jesus, which shows they didn't invent Jesus' statements here. Thus, the text also meets the criterion of dissimilarity. Also, there are Semitisms or Semitic elements in the text and in the parallel texts in Matthew 16, 21 to 23 and Luke 9, 22, showing Jesus' statement truly does originate in a Palestinian Jewish environment. Lastly, the saying meets the criterion of multiple attestation, since the sayings in Matthew 16, 21 to 23 and Luke 9, 22 are independent. Thus, there's no question the historical Jesus predicted his own crucifixion, which utterly refutes Muhammad. Another proof is the Gospels mention Jesus' weakened state in a request for the cup to pass him. 
This is not how fictitious Jewish accounts of martyrs were at the time of Christ. Instead, such martyrs were presented as extremely brave and strong as they endured their torture and execution. The fact the Gospels do not follow this pattern, but instead admit embarrassing features about Christ's true humanness during his crucifixion, helps show these accounts are genuine. They meet the principle of embarrassment and plausibility historians look for. Surah 4, 157 of the Quran, where we're told that the Jews boasted that they killed Jesus, the Messiah, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. But then Allah says they neither crucified nor killed him, but so it was made to appear to them. On the basis of this verse, Muslims have historically denied that Jesus was crucified. And yet this is the best attested fact about Jesus from the not only the standpoint of, of Christians, but even the most radical skeptics. Now, early extra-biblical Christian testimony of the historicity of the crucifixion includes 1st Clement, written around AD 101, Ignatius of Antioch, AD 110, and Polycarp of Smyrna, written between AD 110 and 135. These writers knew Jesus' original disciples and learned this truth from them. Moreover, early non-Christian extra-biblical sources confirming the historicity of Jesus' crucifixion include the Stoic philosopher Mara Bar Sarabian, writing sometime after AD 73, the 1st century Jewish historian Josephus, the Roman historian Tacitus, who wrote around AD 117, the 2nd century Greek satirist Lucian of Samosata, and the Babylonian Talmud. Liberal skeptical scholar Paula Fredrickson says Jesus' crucifixion is one of the, quote, undisputed facts about Jesus. Atheist New Testament historian Gert Ludemann wrote, quote, Jesus' death as a consequence of crucifixion is indisputable, unquote. Non-Christian Jewish scholar Giza Vermes affirmed, quote, the passion of Jesus of Nazareth is part of history, unquote. Another non-Christian Jewish scholar, Pincus Lapid, said Jesus' death by crucifixion is, quote, historically certain, unquote. Agnostic scholar Bart Ehrman stated, quote, one of the most certain facts of history is that Jesus was crucified on orders of the Roman prefect of Judea, Pontius Pilate, unquote. Liberal New Testament critic John Dominic Crossan said there is not the, quote, slightest doubt about the fact of Jesus' crucifixion under Pontius Pilate, unquote. Plus, the Messiah's death for sins is predicted in the Old Testament in Isaiah 53, 5-11. Now, a final comment on the verse of the Quran which denies Jesus' death, Quran 4, 157, is necessary. The verse says, And because of their saying, We slew the Messiah, Jesus' son of Mary, Allah's messenger, they slew him not nor crucified him, but it appeared so unto them, and lo, those who disagree concerning it are in doubt thereof, and they have no knowledge thereof, save pursuit of a conjecture, they slew him not for certain, unquote. Now, there's no inspired ahadith commentary on this verse, and Muslims can't even agree on what it means. Some claim it means Jesus was crucified but survived and did not die. These would include people like Ahmad al dibat Shabir Ali, Osama Abdullah, and others. Other Muslims claim the text teaches Jesus was not even on the cross at all. What does it mean it appeared so unto them that Jesus was killed and crucified? We're not told. The common Muslim idea someone was substituted to go on the cross is not attested in the early Islamic literature. As the commentator Muhammad Assad notes, quote, there exists among Muslims many fanciful legends telling us that at the last moment God substituted for Jesus a person closely resembling him. According to some accounts, that person was Judas, who was subsequently crucified in his place. However, none of these legends find the slightest support in the Quran or in authentic traditions." Unquote. Thus, many Muslims disagree it appeared so unto them, even means someone was put on the cross in Jesus' place. Muslims like Darya Badi and Usmani will claim Jesus was taken up bodily to heaven during his life before he could be crucified. Based on Quran 4, 158, the next verse, Yet, Muhammad Assad observes, God exalted him to himself. Here does not refer to God taking Jesus up bodily during his life. Rather, it simply refers to God honoring Jesus. Why do these Muslim disagreements and issues exist if the Quran is clear, and if its verses are fully detailed elsewhere in the Quran, something the Quran claims of itself? In light of all this Muslim confusion, contrary to Quran 4.157's claim, it's not the Christians who are in doubt and pursuing mere conjecture regarding Jesus' crucifixion. It's actually the Muslims who are in doubt and pursuing mere conjecture when they try to figure out what Quran 4.157 even means. Moreover, even if we go along with Muslims and pretend that Jesus wasn't crucified, contrary to all historical evidence, the verse is still in error because it has it puts in the mouth of the Jews that they killed the Messiah, the Messenger of Allah. And yet, the very reason that the Jews would have had for killing Jesus is not that he was the Messiah. No Jew would have made that boast. They, in fact, would have killed him for claiming to be the Messiah if they had rejected that claim. So when the Quran says that, that their stated reason for uh, or what they state about him is that he was the Messiah and they killed him, uh, that just doesn't square with historical reality. In their book, Jesus, Prophet of Islam, Muhammad Atta Urahim and Ahmed Thompson claim because of Paul, quote, Jesus was deified, unquote. However, the teaching of Jesus being God or God being multipersonal is affirmed in the Old Testament, in pre-Christian Jewish literature, and by Jesus and his disciples prior to Paul. In regards to the Old Testament, in Proverbs 33-4, we read about a father and son who are called the Holy Ones, persons who are incomprehensible in their nature. The text says, I have not learned wisdom, nor have I knowledge of the Holy Ones, who has ascended to heaven and come down, who has gathered the wind in his fists, who has wrapped up the waters in a garment, who has established all the ends of the earth, what is his name, and what is his son's name, surely you know, unquote. All the deeds listed in this passage are applied to Christ in the Bible. For example, Jesus ascended to heaven and comes down. Jesus gathered the winds in his fist and wrapped the waters in a garment. And Jesus established the ends of the earth. So this son is Jesus Christ. Moreover, when the author asks what his and his son's name is, this is very important. 
God's name in the Old Testament signified his divine presence, essence, or nature. Hence, when this biblical writer asks what the names of these two persons are, and asks who has knowledge of them, he is affirming he, as well as humanity, is incapable of fully comprehending the presence, essence, or nature of these two holy ones, God and his Son. Old Testament scholar Alan P. Ross notes various Midrash writings prove ancient Jews understood this son of Proverbs 33-4 to be a divine figure alongside God called the Logos, which is who Christ is identified as in the New Testament. Another Old Testament text is Isaiah 9-6, where mention is made of a son who would be given, which presupposes he existed before his birth, into who is called the Mighty God, or El Gabor in the Hebrew. This is the same Hebrew word applied to God himself in the very next chapter, namely Isaiah 10-21. So there's no question the sun is divine, and the ancient Jewish Targum of Isaiah affirms this text is about the Messiah, as does Targum Jonathan and Midrash Rabbah Deuteronomy. Next we read in Daniel 7, 13-14, quote, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should worship him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed, unquote. Jesus applied this text to himself in the Gospels. In fact, James R. Edwards notes, quote, Daniel 7, 13 and on is never understood in early Judaism as a collective expression of people of the Holy One, but always as the individual Messiah, unquote. That the Son of Man of Daniel 7 is deity is proved by his coming with the clouds of heaven, which is always what God does in the Old Testament. Also, the fact the Son of Man is worshipped by all people proves he is deity. The word for worship here in the original Aramaic is Pelach. Old Testament scholar Stephen R. Miller notes that, quote, in every other instance where the verb Pelak occurs in Biblical Aramaic, it has reference to service, worship, rendered a deity, unquote. Jesus receives worship rendered deity. Another Old Testament text is Isaiah 48, 16, where Yahweh is said to send Yahweh and his spirit. This is the Trinity in the Old Testament. Two persons are identified as Yahweh, and you have the divine Holy Spirit. Moreover, in Isaiah 63, 8-10, there are three distinct persons, the messenger or angel, the sender of the angel who is God, and the spirit. In this text, God sends his messenger, and the messenger and his Holy Spirit then save God's people. The messenger is said to be the messenger of his face, which was a Hebrew idiom, meaning this messenger is God's face, i.e. he is the expression of God's self-revealing presence. This brings us to the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. On the one hand, we're told this angel is a distinct person from God, and yet he is described as God or divine. For example, Hagar identifies the angel as God himself after he appeared to her. In fact, here the angel claims he would multiply her descendants, which is what God himself says. The angel appears in a burning bush to Moses, and when he speaks, he is said to be God speaking. Then in Exodus 4 5, we're told it was actually God himself who appeared to Moses in the burning bush. Moreover, God's name is said to be in the angel of the Lord. The name of God again is God's divine nature. The angel appears to Gideon and Gideon makes sacrifice to him. In fact, he fears he would die after seeing this divine being. Gideon thought this because the Jews believed if you saw God face to face, you would die. Thus, the angel is deity. The reason Gideon survived was because although the angel is God, he is not the same person as the father. Lastly, the angel appeared to Manoah and his wife, and then Manoah offered a sacrifice to him. Now, what do the pre-Christian Jews and non-Christian Jews shortly after the time of Jesus think about such issues as the angel of the Lord and God being multipersonal? Well, modern Jewish scholars such as Daniel Boyron and Alan F. Siegel have proven in their books that pre-Christian Jews and non-Christian Jews shortly after the time of the New Testament affirmed that the one God was comprised of multiple persons, just as Christianity teaches. This proves Paul or later Christians did not invent this idea as Muslims falsely claim. For example, Boyron's conclusion of his research into this matter was that ancient Jews, quote, believed that God had a divine deputy or emissary or even son, exalted above all the angels, who functioned as an intermediary between God and the world in creation, revelation, and redemption, unquote. Likewise, Alan F. Siegel's findings are summarized as follows, quote, the ancient Israelite knew of two Yahwehs, one invisible, a spirit, the other visible, often in human form. The two Yahwehs at times appear together in the text, at times being distinguished, at other times not. Early Judaism understood this portrayal and its rationale. There was no sense of a violation of monotheism, since either figure was indeed Yahweh. There was no second distinct God running the affairs of the cosmos. During the Second Temple period, Jewish theologians and writers speculated on an identity for the second Yahweh. Guesses ranged from divinized humans, from the stories of the Hebrew Bible, to exalted angels. These speculations were not considered unorthodox. That acceptance changed when certain Jews, the early Christians, connected Jesus with this orthodox Jewish idea. This explains why these Jews, the first converts to following Jesus the Christ, could simultaneously worship the God of Israel and Jesus, and yet refused to acknowledge any other God. Jesus was the incarnate second Yahweh. In response, as Siegel's work demonstrated, Judaism pronounced the two powers teaching a heresy sometime in the second century AD. We will now provide some of the early evidence these Jewish scholars have put forth in their works to prove this. At the time of the book of Daniel, an extra-biblical Alexandrian Jew named Ezekiel the Tragedian affirmed the presence of a second divine figure on God's throne. In the first century Jewish book, the book of Enoch, the Messiah is described as pre-existing and being worshipped by humanity. Then in the same book of Enoch, the Messiah is expressly identified as God and not counted among them, i.e. humans. In the first century Jewish book, Fourth Ezra, mention is made of a divine man who conquers evil armies at the end of the age and is then presented with offerings by the saints. Fourth Ezra got this idea from Isaiah 66.20, which says, 
offerings will be brought to God. Now, a second century tradition preserved in the Mechalita Midrash on the book of Exodus combats an earlier Jewish view of God, which said he was multi-personal according to various Old Testament texts, i.e. that there were two Yahwehs making up the one God. First century Jewish historian Josephus combated the Jewish belief that God had assistance in creation, which shows such a belief existed in his day. The late first century Jewish book, Apocalypse of Abraham, presents a figure named Yahuel as the second power in heaven who has God's name in him. Having God's name in you, again, refers to God's divine presence or essence. Thus, Exodus 23:21 says the angel of the Lord has God's name in him, the same name of God, i.e. presence or essence, which resided in the very temple of God. In a portion of the first century Jewish text known as Prayer of Joseph, preserved for us by origin, both the prophet Jacob and an angel named Uriel claim ascendancy as the pre-existent second Yahweh or divine angel of the Lord who appeared to men in the Old Testament. This is the religious milieu in which Jesus appeared. The earliest Christians rightly identified Jesus as this pre-existent second divine Yahweh of the Old Testament, who assisted the Father in creation and appeared to men on behalf of the Father. Jesus applied numerous Old Testament texts about God to himself, thus proving he is God. In Isaiah 43, 2-3, God tells his people not to be afraid when they pass through the waters, for he is the Lord their God. Well, in Matthew 14, 24 to 27, the disciples were afraid because the waters were beating against their boat. Then Jesus said, Take heart, I am, do not be afraid. Moreover, in Malachi 3, 1 and 4, 5, a messenger, that is a voice crying in the wilderness, is said to precede Yahweh's coming to his people. In Matthew 11:10, however, Jesus applies this text to John the Baptist and himself, meaning John the Baptist makes the way for Jesus, who is Yahweh, who comes to his people. Jesus' disciples likewise apply to him Old Testament texts about God. In Isaiah 8, 12 to 13, Isaiah calls men to sanctify Yahweh in their heart. Peter, however, applies this to Jesus and exhorts men to sanctify Christ in their heart. In Zechariah 12.10, Yahweh is the pierced one upon whom men would look and mourn. However, the Apostle John applies this text to Jesus at his crucifixion. Peter says there is no name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. This is because, as the background text proves, quote, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous man runs into it and is safe, unquote. Now this is the Paul who has rewritten the life of Jesus Christ. If we look, when I look at the origins of Christianity, to a great extent we have to look at uh, Paul of Tarsus yeah. as, as the person who originated Christianity. In other words, what is mainly considered Christian today owes uh, a lot to St. Paul, and these three, I, these three areas of inquiry, in fact, can be credited uh, very squarely uh, to uh, the emphasis that St. Paul has left uh, concerning these three areas in his writing. Many Muslim critics assert that the Apostle Paul was not a true apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. They erroneously argue that Paul came in after the real apostles and took over the scene corrupting Christianity. Many Muslims assert that the original message of Jesus and his true followers, their supposed Islamic teaching, was in complete disagreement with Paul's new theology. In contrast to this modern Islamic view, the Christian position is that history demonstrates Paul was truly converted to Christianity. Christians argue that the evidence shows he was accepted by the original apostles and by the earliest Christians as a genuine convert with sound theology who was given an important mission from Christ himself. When historians use the historical method, they will consult the earliest sources regarding the historical issue in question. The earliest sources pertaining to Paul are the first century documents that were canonized into the Bible in the fourth century. The Bible is not one source. It is a compiled collection of many separate documents written over a span of about 1,400 years. The first century texts that were canonized into the New Testament have much to say concerning the Apostle Paul and are thus very important to our study. Some Muslims may object and assert that one cannot use the Bible to prove Paul. However, such a surface level objection is based on ignorance since, again, the New Testament is a collection of valuable early historical documents, many of which speak directly to this issue. To discard the first century documents that are in the Bible and not include them in our study would be to neglect the earliest sources we have concerning this issue. That method would essentially be to irresponsibly throw away important data, which no serious historian or researcher would ever do. If historical sources don't count, then we can't know anything about history. First Century Biblical Sources with respect to the first century biblical evidence concerning Paul, we have Paul's writings, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus and Philemon, the history of the first century church known as Acts or Acts of the Apostles, 
in a Christian epistle known as 2 Peter. So, with respect to the first century biblical writings, we have Paul's epistles, as well as two other independent documents to work with. All of the first century biblical sources that mention Paul affirm that Paul was a genuine apostle. None of them question that. All throughout the book of Acts, we see Paul identified as a true apostle, and so we could quote numerous passages affirming this from Acts. However, one striking feature is that in the Acts 15 Jerusalem Council, Paul played a leading role with the other apostles such as James and Peter in answering the question about Gentiles being under the law. As the council was in session, we see the following. And all the assembly fell silent. They listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles, unquote. Acts 15, 12. Paul and Barnabas spoke after Peter, who spoke from verses 7 to 11, and right before James, who spoke from verses 13 to 21. James concluding the council and giving the final decision that the Gentiles are not under the law. This demonstrates that there was first century recognition of Paul's acceptance by the early church and by the apostles themselves as an authoritative voice. The book Second Peter is rejected by many liberal scholars and Muslims, but there is a strong case for its authority and for Petrine authorship. It is important to know that Second Peter itself is not an unnamed work. In chapter 1 verse 1 it states, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, unquote. Therefore, when early Christians alluded to it or quoted it as an authoritative text, they are given implicit recognition of its Petrine authorship, which it claims for itself. Many hold that the extremely early 1st century extra-biblical document known as the Letter to the Corinthians written by Clement of Rome alludes to 2 Peter 2.5. The Letter to the Corinthians chapter 7 states, Noah preached repentance, and as many as listened to him were saved, unquote. This seems to be an allusion to 2 Peter 2.5 which states, And spared not the old world, but saved Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, unquote. This demonstrates that those in the first century Church of Rome, like Clement, believed 2 Peter to be authoritative and petrine. Another extra-biblical Christian text from 100 AD, known as the Epistle of Barnabas in chapter 15 states, quote, This implies that the Lord will finish all things in 6,000 years, for a day is with him a thousand years, unquote. This is a quotation from 2 Peter 3.8 which states, With the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day, unquote. This shows that the Christian author of the Epistle of Barnabas held 2 Peter to be authoritative and petrine. Examples of patristic writings quoting 2 Peter include Irenaeus' quotation of 2 Peter 3.8 in his work Against Heresies, Book 5, Chapter 28. The 2nd and 3rd century church father Clement of Alexandria seems to allude to 2 Peter 2.5 in his work The Stromata, Book 1, Chapter 21. The 3rd century church father Cyprian quotes 2 Peter 2.11-12 in his work Treatise of Cyprian, Treatise 12, Chapter 11, and calls this work the quote-unquote Epistle of Peter. This shows that Cyprian and those around him viewed 2 Peter as Petrine. Papyrus 72 or P72 is a 3rd to 4th century Greek manuscript which was found in Egypt and it contains sections of 2 Peter, demonstrating that these early Christians regarded 2 Peter as canonical, authentic, and Petrine. The Coptic Sahidic translation of the Bible contains 2 Peter. Scholars like Dr. Horner and Dr. Hornack state that the Coptic Sahidic translation of the Bible is 2nd century. This again shows that early tradition has it so that 2 Peter was authoritative and authentic among many early Christians. The Apocalypse of Peter is a 2nd century extra-biblical Christian apocalyptic work, which drew from 2 Peter, demonstrating that the author believed 2 Peter to be authoritative and possibly Petrine. This text, 2 Peter, is another 1st century source that not only affirms that Paul was a true apostle, but it also identifies Paul's writings as scripture, quote, and count the patience of our Lord of salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters, when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures." Unquote. 2 Peter 3, 15-16 The best case scenario is that Peter wrote this and is accepting Paul. I believe this is the case. The worst case scenario is that this is another independent first century attestation affirming the reliability of Paul, which we can add to the list. Even if it were not from Peter, it is still an early attestation which was accepted by the early church and even added to the canon of scripture. Historians look for the earliest first century writings when it comes to Jesus and early Christianity. That there are no first century writings asserting that Paul is a false apostle discredits the Muslim position severely. The historical principle of early sources and multiple independent attestation is thus met with respect to first century biblical evidence for Paul. If Paul was a true apostle, we would expect his own letters to confirm that this was so. It must be asked, is there anything in Paul's writings that historians would accept as proving that he was genuine? there are many things to consider. For example, it is important to consider the principle of embarrassment, which is the principle that something or someone is more likely to be authentic if there are embarrassing themes that you wouldn't expect to be openly talked about. We see that Paul was quite open about his shortcomings, disputes with other apostles, and his flaws. Such things persuade historians of Paul's integrity and honesty, and thus his claims to apostleship gain credibility. Paul was open about his humanity and imperfection. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ, and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God, that depends on faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead, not that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Philippians 3, 8-12 and I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer, and a persecutor, and injurious, 
but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all longsuffering, for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. 1 Timothy 1, 12-16. So to keep me from becoming conceited, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. 2 Corinthians 12, 7-9 this information meets the principle of embarrassment which historians look for. Christ and the apostles had a very high view of holiness and sanctification, and so therefore we wouldn't expect Paul to admit his imperfection and need for grace if he was an imposter trying to usurp or lead people away from the moral teachers Jesus and the apostles. It is a human tendency to want to appear morally good in religious settings. This is especially true of those times. Although Paul was a sanctified model for morality and exhorted others to be moral, he was honest in admitting that he, like everyone else except Christ, was not perfect, and that he, like everyone else, relied on God's grace in his life. We know from history that later untrustworthy people who claimed to follow Christ, such as Pelagius, dishonestly claimed to be completely morally perfect. One would naturally expect something like this from Paul if he was trying to usurp Jesus and the apostles who taught holiness and sanctification. But Paul, being genuine, admitted his imperfection, as did the other prophets and apostles either explicitly or implicitly in scripture, and taught that one ought to strive for holiness in light of being imperfect. In being honest about his imperfection and his reliance on God's grace, Paul was doing the right thing, according to Jesus' teachings on salvation. Hence, this kind of material demonstrates that Paul was genuine, since if he was not, there would be no reason to include these types of admissions in his epistles, admissions that critics may twist or use against Paul. Paul recorded his rebuke of Peter. One thing you would not want to do if all you were was a false apostle pretending to be a true apostle is invent a story where you rebuke a major influential apostle in front of others for not handling the gospel accurately. However, this actually happened. Paul did just that to the apostle Peter, demonstrating that Paul genuinely cared about the gospel and would not compromise it for anyone, including major apostles he worked with who stepped out of line. Quote, but when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus, in order to be justified by faith in Christ, and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified." Unquote. Galatians 2, 11-16 Peter learned from this mistake and would go on to grow in grace, remain close with Paul, and eventually die as a martyr in Rome, where Paul was also martyred, proving that Peter was a genuine appointed leader of the early church. Jesus himself taught that Peter would die a faithful man following God in John 21, 18-19, which demonstrates that Peter learned from his mistake with Paul in Galatians 2, 11-14, and was put back on the path of righteousness for the remainder of his life. Quote, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me, unquote. John 21, 18-19. Moreover, there is early extra-biblical material which mentions Peter and Paul simultaneously teaching the Christians in Rome. This proves that Peter and Paul reconciled their past differences, the Galatians 2, 11-14 dispute. This is evidenced in the document known as the Letter to the Romans written by Ignatius of Antioch, who was a pupil of the Apostles, quote, I do not command you, as Peter and Paul did, unquote. Moreover, the second century church writer Irenaeus reports an ancient tradition about Peter and Paul's time in Rome together, demonstrating that they remained close, despite their conflict in Galatians 2, 11-14. Irenaeus states, by pointing out here the successions of the bishops of the greatest and most ancient church known to all, founded and organized at Rome by two most glorious apostles, Peter and Paul. That church which has the tradition of the faith, which comes down to us after having been announced to men by the apostles." Unquote. Their martyrdoms in Rome are documented by Clement's letter to the Corinthians chapter 5, quote, Let us set before our eyes the illustrious apostles. Peter, through unrighteous envy, endured not one or two, but numerous labors, and when he had at length suffered martyrdom, departed to the place of glory due to him. Owing to envy, Paul also obtained the reward of patient endurance, after being seven times thrown into captivity, compelled to flee, and stoned, after preaching both in the East and the West. He gained the illustrious reputation due to his faith, having taught righteousness in the whole world, and come to the extreme limit of the West, and suffered martyrdom under the prefects. Thus he was removed from the world, and went into the holy place, having proved himself a striking example of patience." Unquote. This evidence serves as weighty proof for the fact that despite Peter and Paul's dispute in Galatians 2, 11-14, they remained close friends and fellow apostles in life. This information tells us a lot about the integrity and reliability of Paul. One would not expect Paul to report that he publicly rebuked a fellow worker and major apostle, if in fact he was some usurper trying to fit in. You would expect him to want to avoid any unnecessary controversies or quarrels. This also meets the principle of embarrassment. 
disinterested comment about James. We can know Paul was a reliable true apostle because of his disinterested comment about the apostle James in Galatians 1.19 which states, Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him for fifteen days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother." Unquote. Notice the disinterested off-the-cuff remark from Paul about James. The point is, if Paul was a false apostle, inventing stories, we wouldn't expect him to just mention James in passing, without making a point. The fact that Paul merely mentions James in this off-the-cuff way, persuades historians that Paul is trustworthy, showing that he wasn't out to merely prove he was an apostle with fanciful, detailed stories, but that he was actually recalling real events about his association with the early church. Paul's Gospel in the 1 Corinthians 15 Apostles' Creed is the original gospel. We can know Paul was a genuine apostle preaching the original gospel because his 1 Corinthians 15 creed, which he received very early from the apostles Peter and James, is dated very closely to the time of Jesus' crucifixion by scholarship, which shows that Paul's message was not some later innovation. The creed states, For I delivered to you as a first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than five hundred brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. 1 Corinthians 15, 3-8. Here Paul reminds the Corinthian church that this gospel message or creed which he previously preached to them orally was first given to him. It is important to note that Paul mentions that he received this creed before giving it to them. The first century evidence demonstrates that Paul received this creed from Peter and James around AD 35 in Jerusalem. This demonstrates that Paul's gospel, Jesus' sacrifice for sins, the resurrection and appearances, was not some later corruption, but that it goes right back to the beginning, coming from the original apostles who walked with Christ. I will demonstrate this by constructing a timeline based on the early data. First, scholars put Jesus' crucifixion at about AD 30. After surveying the historical literature, Dr. Ben Witherington III affirms, quote, It makes sense to conclude that Jesus died on Nisan 14, April 7, in AD 30, unquote. In his work on the resurrection, Dr. Mike Lacona notes that 30 AD is the standard dating of Jesus' death among scholars. With that said, Paul's conversion to Christianity is dated one to two years after Jesus' death by scholars. Dr. Craig L. Blomberg puts Paul's conversion at 32 AD, two years after Jesus' death. One of the leading scholars on this subject is Dr. Gary Habermas, and he notes that scholars usually place Paul's conversion one to two years after the cross and goes with AD 32. He states, Paul's conversion is usually placed one or two years later, so let's just say two, that's 32 AD, unquote. The first century documentation shows that after Paul's conversion around AD 32, he then went to Arabia, and after three years, he went to Jerusalem to see Peter and James. Galatians 1, 15 and 19 states, But when he who had set me apart before I was born, and who called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me, in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went away into Arabia, and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas, and remained with him fifteen days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother." Unquote. With respect to this material, Dr. Howard Clark Key notes that it, quote, can be critically examined just as one would evaluate evidence in a modern court or academic setting, unquote. Therefore, when one does so, you can see that the information harmonizes into a consistent stream, in that you are left with a clear picture about where this creed comes from. Galatians 1, 15-19 shows that in AD 32, Paul was in Arabia for three years until AD 35, and then he went to Jerusalem. Paul went to Jerusalem in AD 35 to meet with Peter and James, five years after Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. In Galatians 1.18, it says something extremely noteworthy with respect to Paul's 15-day Jerusalem stay in AD 35. It says, quote, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas, Peter, and remained with him for 15 days, unquote. The word for visit there is actually a bad translation. The Greek word there is historio, where we get our English word history. According to the standard lexical work of today, the Bauer Arndt Gingrich Denker Greek English Lexicon, page 483, the Greek word historio means to get information from. It means to gain an account. Therefore, this first century data shows that in AD 35, Paul met with Peter in Jerusalem to inquire about the gospel, or gain a historical account of the gospel and confirm that what he had previously received from the Lord through Revelation in Galatians 1, 11 to 12 was the true account of the gospel preached by the apostles. That at this time Paul received the 1 Corinthians 15 creed from Peter and James is the position of the majority of scholars. The creed which talks about Jesus dying for our sins and rising from the dead. In the verses just preceding the actual creed in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 3, we see technical rabbinic terms denoting the passing of previously received oral tradition, which many scholars argue is in reference to Peter transmitting this creed to Paul in AD 35. Words like delivered or handed on, paradidomai, and received, paralambano, in reference to Paul receiving this creed from Peter and James in Jerusalem. It makes perfectly logical sense, along with the fact that Paul says he went to gain a historical account from Peter, that in his 15 days in Jerusalem with Peter and James, he received, paralambano, this creed. It is illogical to think that Paul would not be discussing such important issues with Peter and James after his dramatic experiences. Of course, Paul would want to confirm the gospel with Peter and James, gaining a historical account of the gospel from them, to see if it lined up with what he had previously come to believe in three years prior. This, I feel, along with the majority of scholars who have written on the subject, is the best explanation among a few as to where Paul got his transmitted 1 Corinthians 15 creed. 
If Paul received this creed from Peter in AD 35, then Paul's gospel is traced straight back to the beginning. This would mean that Paul's message is not some later innovation or novelty, but is instead traced back to those who walked and talked with Jesus, the apostles. This utterly refutes the modern Muslim claim that Paul came in later and corrupted Christianity with a new gospel. Moreover, there is absolutely no first century evidence questioning this event with Peter and James, or casting doubt on it. Scholars have much to say concerning this creed, its reliability, and its date in light of Paul receiving it very early. The British biblical scholar Michael Goulder states that the creed, quote, goes back at least to what Paul taught when he was converted, a couple of years after the crucifixion, unquote. Professor Yilrick Wilkins states that this material, quote, undoubtedly goes back to the oldest phase of all in the history of primitive Christianity, unquote. The scholar Walter Casper contends that this creed was circulating by the end of 30 AD. The notable atheist New Testament critic Gert Ludemann states, quote, the elements in the tradition are to be dated to the first two years after the crucifixion, not later than three years after the death of Jesus, unquote. Liberal scholar James D.G. Dunn states, this tradition, we can be entirely confident, was formulated as a tradition within months of Jesus' death, unquote. Gerd Thaysen and Annette Mertz state, quote, the analysis of the formula tradition about the resurrection of Jesus allows the following conclusion. A tradition in 1 Corinthians 15, 3b-5, which goes back very close to the events themselves, attests appearances to both individuals and groups. The credibility of this tradition is enhanced because it is in part confirmed by the narrative tradition, which is independent, and because in the case of Paul, we have the personal testimony of an eyewitness who knew many of the other witnesses, unquote. Reginald Fuller states, quote, It is almost universally agreed today that Paul is here citing tradition, unquote. The eminent scholar F.F. F. Bruce also argues that Paul received this creed from Peter and James in AD 35 in Jerusalem, quote, In the list, two individuals are mentioned by name as having seen the risen Christ, and two only. He appeared to Cephas, and he appeared to James, 1 Corinthians 15, 5 and 7. It is no mere coincidence that there should be the only two apostles whom Paul claims to have seen during his first visit to Jerusalem after his conversion in Galatians 1, 19. It is almost certainly during these 15 days in Jerusalem that Paul received this outline, unquote. In his 1999 work, The Acts of Jesus, The Search for the Authentic Deeds of Jesus, page 466, the radical liberal Jesus Seminar co-founder, Dr. Robert Funk, states that the 1 Corinthians 15 creed was formulated within, quote, two or three years at the most, unquote. Two or three years after Jesus' crucifixion, that is. Therefore, scholarship is quite clear on the 1 Corinthians 15 creed, being extremely early tradition, formulated close to the time of Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. This utterly refutes the concept of Pauline Christianity and demonstrates that Paul's gospel and theology, Jesus dying for sins and rising from the dead, is the original, early, apostolic gospel, according to the first century data. The original apostles confirmed Paul's gospel and apostleship. The first century historical documentation on this issue also shows that 14 years after the Jerusalem affair with Peter and James in Galatians 1, 15 and 19, Paul then went back to Jerusalem again with Barnabas and Titus. According to the first century data, Paul says the pillars of the church, James, Peter and John, quote, added nothing to me, unquote, Galatians 2, 6. This means that the original apostles of Jesus Christ added no correction to Paul's gospel message, which he was preaching after the Jerusalem affair in AD 35. Hence, the original apostles affirmed what Paul was preaching, namely Jesus' crucifixion as a sacrifice for sins and his resurrection as orthodox theology. Moreover, James, Peter, and John all extended their right hand of fellowship to Paul after seeing Paul's grace, Galatians 2.9. This extremely early data, AD 49-54, is a severe blow to the anti-Pauline crowd since it adds one more attestation to the conclusive first century case for Paul's reliability and apostleship. It must be stressed over and over because it is important that there is no clear first century documentation to the contrary, asserting that Paul was not a true apostle who was close to the original apostles or that he had a false message. With respect to scholarship's view on this issue, the secular historian William Durant states, quote, No one has questioned the existence of Paul, or his repeated meetings with Peter, James, and John, and Paul enviously admits that these men had known Christ in the flesh, unquote. Early Extra-Biblical Sources Affirming Paul's Apostleship Now that we have covered some of the biblical data that validates Paul's apostleship, I want to consider the early historical evidence outside of the Bible which affirms Paul is a genuine apostle. An important and often overlooked consideration to observe in this study has to do with expectations. If Paul was in fact genuine, as I contend, we would expect to find extremely early church writers affirming the apostleship of Paul, as well as quoting his epistles as being authoritative, on the same level as scripture, or directly as scripture. This is precisely what we find as the evidence is examined. If Paul was not a true apostle, then we would not expect to find numerous instances of the earliest extra-biblical writers, who were often students of the original apostles, affirming Paul's apostleship, and viewing his writings as scripture. If Paul was not a true apostle, but was instead a false usurper as the Muslims claim, we would expect at least some evidence from the first century followers of Jesus and the apostles to stake their case in opposition to Paul, relegating him to the status of imposter. However, the earliest evidence is conclusive in affirming Paul's reliability. Ignatius of Antioch Ignatius of Antioch was a first century pupil of the original apostles. In the early document known as the Martyrdom of Ignatius chapter 1 we read, quote, 
Ignatius, the disciple of John the Apostle, a man in all respects of an apostolic character, governed the church of the Antiochians with great care." Unquote. The 34th century church historian Eusebius states that Ignatius was the second bishop of Antioch after the apostle Peter, Evodius preceding him, which shows that Ignatius was in very close proximity to the apostles. Eusebius states, at this time Ignatius was known as the second bishop of Antioch, Evodius having been the first. Simeon likewise was at that time the second ruler of the church of Jerusalem, the brother of our savior having been the first, unquote. And, quote, Ignatius, who was chosen bishop of Antioch, second in succession to Peter, unquote. The 4th to 5th century Christian Theodoret also states, quote, You have no doubt heard of the illustrious Ignatius, who received the episcopal grace by the hand of the great Peter, and after ruling the church of Antioch, wore the crown of martyrdom, unquote. This is important because if Paul is a false teacher and usurper, Ignatius, being a follower of the apostles and their gospel, he often quoted the gospels of Matthew and John as well, would have pointed out Paul's supposed theological errors or commented on Paul being a supposed false apostle. However, this first century martyr bishop offers early data in support of Paul's association with the other apostles, as well as Paul's rightful authority in the church. Ignatius wrote the following in AD 110 to the Christians in Rome, quote, I do not commend you as Peter and Paul did, unquote. This extremely early material is affirming that Paul worked alongside Peter in leading and commanding the Christian church in Rome. Ignatius has other valuable remarks affirming the reliability of Paul. For example, in writing to the Christians in Ephesus, Ignatius relays that Paul accurately gave the gospel to the Ephesians, that Paul was martyred for his faith, which also shows Paul's reliability, as well as his deep respect and honor for Paul. Quote, you are initiated into the mysteries of the gospel with Paul, the holy, the martyred, the deservedly most happy, at whose feet may I be found when I shall attain to God, who in all his epistles makes mention of you in Christ Jesus." Unquote. Ignatius often quotes Paul's epistles as authoritative writings, thus demonstrating that Paul was viewed positively in the earliest strand of first century Christianity. For example, in Ignatius' letter to the Ephesians chapter 18, Ignatius quotes 1 Corinthians 1.20, he states, Where is the wise man? Where is the disputer? Where is the boasting of those who are styled prudent? For our God, Jesus Christ, was, according to the appointment of God, conceived in the womb by Mary, of the seed of David, but by the Holy Ghost. He was born and baptized, that by his passion he might purify the water." Unquote. 1 Corinthians 1.20 states, Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Unquote. In Ignatius' letter to the Magnesians, chapter 11, he quotes 1 Timothy 1.1, 1, 1, he states, Jesus Christ, who is our hope, from which may no one of you ever be turned aside, unquote. 1 Timothy 1.1 1, 1 states, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by command of God our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, our hope, unquote. In Ignatius' letter to Polycarp, chapter 5, he quotes Ephesians 5.20, he states, In like manner also, exhort my brethren, in the name of Jesus Christ, that they love their wives, even as the Lord loved the church, unquote. Ephesians 5.25 states, Husbands, love your wives, as Christ loved the church, and gave himself up for her, unquote. In the same letter to Polycarp, chapter 1, Ignatius quotes 1 Thessalonians 5.17, he states, Give yourself to prayer without ceasing, unquote. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 states, Pray without ceasing, unquote. We know that Ignatius was fed to lions in a Roman Colosseum for his faith since Christianity was being persecuted by the Roman state. This shows that Ignatius so firmly believed in his theology, which included Paul as a true apostle with inspired doctrine, that he was willing to be martyred for it. The fact that Ignatius was willing to die for his faith in theology, which included Paul as an inspired apostle, comes to us from various early texts. Chapter 5 of his epistle to the Romans ironically is titled, quote, I desire to die, unquote. In the early document known as the martyrdom of Ignatius, chapter 6, we read, quote, Then being immediately thrown in, according to the command of Caesar given some time ago, he was thus cast to the wild beasts, close beside the temple, unquote. The 3rd to 4th century church historian Eusebius also mentions Ignatius' martyrdom, quote, Reports say that he was sent from Syria to Rome and became food for wild beasts on account of his testimony to Christ, unquote. If Ignatius knew that Paul was an imposter or deceiver, he would not be willing to be martyred for his faith. As the saying goes, liars make poor martyrs. If he wasn't absolutely sure that Paul was a genuine apostle, he would not be willing to die for a faith or theology which included Paul as a true apostle. Hence, the conspiracy hypothesis won't work, nor will the lack of certainty hypothesis. It is absurd to say that early fathers like this were in on some conspiracy to introduce Paul to people, while supposedly knowing that he was an imposter. The only way to get around the evidence would be to discard the evidence, which is extremely irresponsible, or to assert that Ignatius was misled or deceived to accept Paul. But that doesn't work either, because Ignatius was very familiar with the theology of John and the other apostles, other apostolic texts, as well as Jesus' teachings in the Gospels. So if Paul was teaching something contrary to the apostolic first century message and was not accepted by the original apostles, Ignatius would not have supported Paul the way he did. Ignatius gives no indication that there were any early disputes amongst the first century Christians about Paul's reliability. Clement of Rome Clement of Rome was a first century Christian secretary of the Church of Rome, responsible for correspondence with other churches. There is also evidence to suggest that he was a prominent presbyter of the Roman Church. Some believe he was the fellow worker Paul mentions in Philippians 4.3. In his letter, the first epistle of Clement, also known as the first epistle to the Corinthians, written in AD 96, Clement states the following about Paul, quote, owing to envy, 
Paul also obtained the reward of patient endurance after being seven times thrown into captivity, compelled to flee and stoned. After preaching both in the East and the West, he gained the illustrious reputation due to his faith, having taught righteousness to the whole world, and come to the extreme limit of the West and suffered martyrdom under the prefects. Thus he was removed from the world and went into the holy place, having proved himself a striking example of patience." Unquote. Quote, take up the epistle of the blessed apostle Paul. What did he write to you at the time when the gospel first began to be preached? Truly, under the inspiration of the Spirit, he wrote to you concerning himself in Cephas and Apollos, because even then, parties had been formed among you." Unquote. Notice that Clement, in representing the beliefs of the first century church at Rome, grants Paul's reliability. He mentions Paul's labors for the gospel, his persecution for the faith, and his martyrdom. He states that Paul was a, quote, striking example of patience, end quote, or in other words, endurance. Notice also, in the second citation, that Clement attests to Paul's reliability, in that he calls him a, quote, blessed apostle, unquote, and takes Paul's epistle to the Corinthians as authoritative and valid with respect to gospel truth, and states that Paul wrote this letter, quote, under the inspiration of the Spirit, unquote. This means that Clement, and subsequently those in the first century church of Rome, believed Paul's letters to be inspired God-breathed scripture, canon. We know that Clement followed the teachings of the apostle Peter and honored him deeply. Clement states, quote, let us set before our eyes the illustrious apostles, Peter, through unrighteous envy, endured not one or two but numerous labors, and when he had at length suffered martyrdom, departed to the place of glory due to him." Unquote. Therefore, why would Clement, who, being familiar with the original apostolic message of Peter and the other apostles, grant Paul's reliability if Paul was preaching something other than what Peter and the other apostles were preaching? Evidence for Clement's familiarity with the teachings of Peter and the other apostles comes from the fact that in his letter to the Corinthians, he quotes or alludes to numerous texts from Peter, the Gospels, and the Apostles. For example, in chapter 2 he appeals to 1 Peter 2.17, in chapter 11 he appeals to 2 Peter 2.6-9, to in chapter 24 he appeals to Luke 8.5, in chapter 27 he appeals to Matthew 24.35, in chapter 31 he appeals to James 2.21. He knew of and followed these apostolic texts and teachings, and so if Paul was opposed to them and was not accepted by the Apostles, Clement would either expose Paul or not support him, or both. Since Clement knew of Peter and his teaching, why would he affirm Paul if Paul was just some imposter? If Paul was not a genuine apostle with the true original gospel, then Clement, knowing the message of Peter and the original apostles, would have either exposed Paul as an imposter or pointed out his theological errors. There is no indication from Clement's pen that there were any first century disputes amongst the first century Christians about Paul's reliability. Polycarp of Smyrna Polycarp was a first century bishop like Ignatius. He was also a student and pupil of the apostle John and the other apostles. We know this from his writings as well as his contemporary who knew him, Irenaeus. We also know this from Tertullian. Polycarp's contemporary Irenaeus makes mention of the fact that Polycarp was a pupil of John and a pupil of the Apostles, being appointed bishop of the church in Smyrna by the Apostles themselves. Irenaeus also mentions that Polycarp was martyred for the Christian faith. Irenaeus states, For while I was yet a boy, I saw you in Lower Asia with Polycarp, distinguishing yourself in the royal court, and endeavoring to gain his approbation, for I have a more vivid recollection of what occurred at that time than of recent events, inasmuch as the experiences of childhood, keeping pace with the growth of the soul, become incorporated with it, so that I can even describe the place where the blessed Polycarp used to sit and discourse, his going out too, and his coming in, his general mode of life and personal appearance, together with the discourses which he delivered to the people, also how he would speak of his familiar intercourse with John, and with the rest of those who had seen the Lord, and how he would call their words to remembrance, whatsoever things he had heard from them, respecting the Lord, both with regard to his miracles and his teaching, Polycarp having thus received information from the eyewitnesses of the word of life, would recount them in all harmony with the scriptures." Unquote. And when the blessed Polycarp was sojourning in Rome in the time of Anicetus, although a slight controversy had arisen among them as to certain other points, they were at once well inclined towards each other with regard to the matter in hand, not willing that any quarrel should arise between them upon this head, for neither could Anicetus persuade Polycarp to forego the observance in his own way, inasmuch as these things had been always so observed by John the disciple of our Lord, and by other apostles, with whom he had been conversant. Nor, on the other hand, could Polycarp succeed in persuading Anicetus to keep the observance in his way, for he maintained that he was bound to adhere to the usage of the presbyters who preceded him. And in this state of affairs, they held fellowship with each other, and Anicetus conceded to Polycarp in the church the celebration of the Eucharist, by way of showing him respect, so that they parted in peace, one from the other, maintaining peace with the whole church, both those who did observe this custom, and those who did not." Unquote. Quote, but Polycarp also was not only instructed by the apostles and conversed with many who had seen Christ, but was also, by apostles in Asia, appointed bishop of the church of Smyrna, whom I also saw in my early youth, for he tarried on earth a very long time, and when a very old man, gloriously and most nobly suffered martyrdom, departed this life, having always taught the things which he had learned from the apostles, and which the church has handed down, and which alone are true." Unquote. In his epistle to the Philippians, Polycarp seems to indicate that he and his church were instructed directly by the apostles, quote, let us then serve him in fear, and with all reverence, even as he himself has commanded us, and as the apostles who preached the gospel unto us." Unquote. A second century document, written around AD 156, known as the Martyrdom of Polycarp, reported his brutal martyrdom, showing that he was willing to die for his faith in theology, which included Paul as a true apostle. A burning at the stake failed, and he was stabbed. Quote, at length, when those wicked men perceived that his body could not be consumed by the fire, they commanded an executioner to go near, and pierce him through with a dagger." Unquote. 
Therefore, in light of all this early evidence which demonstrates that Polycarp knew the original apostles, knew their original first century gospel message, was appointed bishop of the church in Smyrna by the apostles, and suffered brutal martyrdom for his faith, it is indeed interesting that he would then affirm the apostle Paul as genuine and sound theologically if Paul was a false apostle. Polycarp states, quote, For neither I nor any such one can come up to the wisdom of the blessed and glorified Paul. He went among you accurately and steadfastly taught the word of truth in the presence of those who were alive then, and when absent from you, he wrote you a letter, which, if you carefully study, you will find to be the means of building you up in that faith which has been given you, and which, being followed by hope, and preceded by love towards God and Christ, and our neighbor, is the mother of us all." Unquote. Quote, I exhort you all, therefore, to yield obedience to righteousness, and to exercise all patience, such as you have seen set before your eyes, not only in the case of the blessed Ignatius, and Zosimus, and Rufus, but also in others among yourselves, and in Paul himself, and the rest of the apostles." Unquote. Quote, for if a man govern himself in such matters, how shall he enjoy them on others? If a man does not keep himself from covetousness, he shall be defiled by idolatry, and shall be judged as one of the heathen. But who of us are ignorant of the judgment of the Lord? Do we not know that the saints shall judge the world, as Paul teaches? But I have neither seen nor heard of any such thing among you, in the midst of whom the blessed Paul labored, and who are commended in the beginning of his epistle. For he boasts of you in all those churches, which alone then knew the Lord. But we of Smyrna have not yet known him." Unquote. If Paul was an impostor, then Polycarp, knowing John and the other apostles, as well as their orthodox theology, would have spoken out against Paul. On the other hand, if someone asserts that Polycarp was a liar or conspirator, trying to mislead people to follow Paul for some nefarious, absurd reason, then Polycarp would not willingly go to his death for such a faith. This evidence is a fatal blow to the egregious falsehood of anti-Pauline critics. Polycarp also identified Paul's writings as sacred scripture, showing that Paul was viewed as an inspired apostle by Polycarp and those around him in the first century. For example, Polycarp says the following about Ephesians 4.26, quote, For I trust that you are well versed in the sacred scriptures, and that nothing is hid from you. But to me this privilege is not yet granted. It is declared then, in these scriptures, be ye angry, and sin not and let not the sun go down upon your wrath, Ephesians 4.26, unquote. It is germane to note that the early church writer, Tertullian, also relayed some pertinent information about Polycarp's status, he states, quote, For this is the manner in which the apostolic churches transmit their registers, as the Church of Smyrna, which records that Polycarp was placed therein by John, unquote. This shows that it was widely known that Polycarp knew the original disciples. Therefore, the case is quite clear for Polycarp being a student of the original apostles. That the blessed Polycarp affirmed Paul's reliability is irrefutable. Frequent Gnostic claims to authority mean Paul is not reliable? One response Muslims have offered is that there were second century Gnostics like Valentinus, Montanus, Maximilla, and others who claimed to have authority or receive divine prophecy and revelation. Therefore, Muslims argue, since it was common for people to lie and claim to receive prophecy, authority, and revelation, one should not accept Paul. However, this is just the logical fallacy known as the problem of induction fallacy. Just because it is doubtful that these second century people had true apostolic authority and received visions and revelation, it doesn't therefore prove that Paul was false. That would be like me saying, because my cat is orange, therefore all cats must be orange. Secondly, this is a fallacious argument because such Gnostics are second century. Paul is first century. There are no meaningful, multiply attested first or early second century sources saying that these people or their followers knew the original apostles and were accepted by them. There is a wealth of multiply attested first and early second century evidence affirming that Paul and his followers knew the original apostles and were accepted by them. There is no meaningful first century evidence that Valentinus, Montanus, and Maximilla saw visions of the risen Lord. There is a wealth of first century evidence that Paul saw a vision of the risen Lord. There is no evidence whatsoever that Valentinus, Montanus, and Maximilla were willingly martyred for their faith. There is reliable 1st and early 2nd century evidence that Paul and his followers were willingly martyred for their faith. Historians are interested in early multiply attested accounts. That is why Paul is reliable. To discard these historical principles is to show incredible bias and demonstrate that one is not interested in what the earliest data says. In light of these facts, one cannot compare Paul to these later 2nd century Gnostics, since the historical evidence is clearly in favor of Paul. Are the Ebionites and their claims 1st century? Since it is clear that the first century case for Paul's apostleship is strong, Muslims have tried to find some kind of clear first century proof that would legitimately discredit Paul as a true apostle. Their main argument, or claim, is that an early sect called the Ebionites rejected Paul while claiming to have apostolic authority. It is true that this aberrant sect rejected Paul, and there is some evidence to suggest that they claimed to have apostolic authority, in that they believed their views were sanctioned by the Apostle James. However, what I will be demonstrating is that the Muslims are incorrect for dating this sect in their gospel slash beliefs to the first century, that the Ebionites were complete antichrist heretics not only according to Christianity, but according to Islam. And finally, I will show that their absurd reason for denying Paul is not reliable historically. The original gospel of the Ebionites is lost, and we have no early works from any of their followers. What we do have is quotations of their gospel and refutations of their beliefs from a 4th century work known as the Panarion, which was written by the Christian writer Epiphanius of Salamis. It is agreed that the Ebionite gospel was a forged, mutilated document which quoted from Matthew, Luke, and Mark. 
In it are insertions and interpolations of their own narrations and beliefs as well. Various writers like the 2nd century church father Irenaeus wrote on the Ebionites in his work Against Heresies, Book 1, Chapter 26, asserting that, quote, They practice circumcision, persevere in observance of those customs which are enjoined by the law, and are so Judaic in their lifestyle, unquote. The same source also affirms that they, quote, repudiate Apostle Paul, maintaining that he was an apostate from the law, unquote. However, Irenaeus does not indicate that the Ebionites go back to the first century. In his work, De Principis, Book 4, the early Christian writer Origen mentions the Ebionites and says that their name, Ebion, means poor. Origen also mentions them in his work Against Celsus. The 34th century historian Eusebius also mentions them in his work Church History, etc. And the Ebionite Church dates back to the second century. No, that, that's not true. It dates back to the first century. This is first century uh, documentation that we're looking at. Although Muslim apologists like Nadir Ahmed assert that the Ebionite testimony is first century testimony, scholars like Dr. Ron Cameron date the Gospel of the Ebionites to the mid second century. In his work, The Other Gospels, Non Canonical Gospel Texts, Dr. Cameron states, quote, The Gospel of the Ebionites was composed sometime after the Gospel of Matthew and Luke, and before the first reference to it in the writings of Irenaeus toward the end of the second century. A date of composition in the middle of the second century, when several other Gospel harmonies were also being written, is most likely, unquote. Cameron also notes that the Ebionites were, quote, a group of Greek-speaking Jewish Christians who were prominent throughout the second and third centuries, unquote. Dr. Jeffrey W. Bromley notes that the Ebionites were, quote, flourishing in the second, third, and fourth centuries AD, unquote. In the same work, Dr. Bromley also states that the gospel of the Ebionites is second century. In his work, Apocryphal Gospels, in introduction, Dr. Hans Joseph Clark states that the gospel of the Ebionites was, quote, composed most probably in the mid-second century, unquote. It must be stressed that it is widely acknowledged that there is no firm historical material proving that the Ebionite sect itself dates to the first century. Dr. Bart Ehrman has offered some speculation on this issue, however, because he feels that some of their beliefs are somewhat similar to those of the first century Galatians that Paul was in opposition to, that maybe the Ebionites are the physical and spiritual descendants of the Galatians. However, Ehrman doesn't attempt to trace such a line of descent with any meaningful historical evidence. One Muslim apologist, Sami Zatari, feels that this speculation from Ehrman is enough to prove that, quote, the Ebionites do have a foundation, even during the time of Paul, unquote. However, Ehrman himself is not even sure if there were Ebionites at the time when Paul disputed with the Galatians in the first century, since he he says things like, quote, if these Christian Jews were in existence before the destruction of the Jewish temple in 70 AD, unquote. The fact is that there is just no real solid evidence tracing the Ebionite tribes to the first century. Scholarship holds that they emerged in the second century, and so therefore, their assertions about Paul not being a true apostle are merely late opinions far removed from the time of the apostles. The evidence shows that it wasn't until Paul was already dead when their fanciful distortions about him emerged. In fact, the earliest mention of their rejection of Paul comes from Irenaeus' second century work against heresies, and so therefore we have no evidence that their rejection of Paul wasn't just some second century novelty. Some people claim that the Ebionites can be traced back to first century Jerusalem because in Against Heresies, Book 1, Chapter 26, Irenaeus reports that, quote, they even adore Jerusalem as if it were the house of God, unquote. However, Sakari Hakkinen states that the, quote, expression means the typical prayer orientation towards Jerusalem, and it cannot be used as evidence of the origins of the Ebionites in Jerusalem. As the Ebionites were committed to Jewish traditions, it was natural that they also prayed like Jews, unquote. In his detailed treatment on the subject, Dr. Joseph A. Fitzmaier sums up the current scholarly position saying, quote, there is simply no evidence for their existence in the first century AD, either before or after the destruction of Jerusalem, unquote. Damaging heresies of the Ebionites. The fact that the Ebionites were abominable heretics, according to both Islamic and Orthodox Christian theology, should make people question why Muslims use their late singular non multiply attested testimony against Paul as evidence. Paul warned about potential heretics who would come and forbid the eating of meat and things of this nature. 1 Timothy 4, 1-3 says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the later times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them, which believe and know the truth." Unquote. The Ebionites altered Mark 14, 12 to 15 in their second century gospel, the gospel of the Ebionites, to try to make Jesus a vegetarian, suiting their heretical practices. As Epiphanius notes, quote, And the Lord himself says, Go ye into the city, and ye shall find a man bearing a pitcher of water, and ye shall follow whithersoever he goeth, and say ye to the good man of the house, Where is the guest chamber, where I shall keep the Passover with my disciples? And he shall show you an upper room, furnished, there make ready. But the Lord says in return, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you. And he said, This Passover, not simply Passover, so that no one would practice it in accordance with his own notion. Passover, as I said, was roast meat and the rest. But of there, the Ebionites' own will, these people have lost sight of the consequence of the truth, and have altered the wording, which is evident to everyone from the sayings associated with it, and made the disciples say, Where wilt thou, we prepare for thee, to eat the Passover? And the Lord, if you please, says, Have I desired meat with desire, to eat this Passover with you? Unquote. This severely damages the credibility of the Ebionites, showing that they were deceptive and dishonest in altering the text to suit vegetarianism. This gives further reason to question their claims about Paul as well. Moreover, in Origen's work against Celsus, he notes that there were different sects of Ebionites, many of which denied the virgin birth of Jesus. Origen mentions the quote, 
twofold sect of Ebionites, who either acknowledge with us that Jesus was born of a virgin, or deny this and maintain that he was begotten like other human beings, unquote. This is heresy. Isaiah 7.14 predicts that, quote, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, unquote. Luke 1, 32-35 also condemns the Ebionites, quote, He will be great, and will be called Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God, unquote. The abominable Quran also condemns the Ebionites by admitting that Jesus had a virgin birth in Quran 19, 19-22, which states, He said, I am only a messenger of thy Lord, that I may bestow on thee a faultless son. She said, How can I have a son, when no mortal hath touched me? Neither have I been unchaste. He said, So it will be, thy Lord saith, It is easy for me, and it will be, that we may make of him a revelation for mankind, and a mercy from us, and it is a thing ordained. And she conceived him, and she withdrew with him, to a far place." Unquote. The Ebionites held to numerous heresies about Jesus, including their claim that Jesus was the person of Adam, or a created spirit, who was higher than the angels. Epiphanius states, quote, For some of them even say that Adam is Christ, the man who was formed first and infused with God's breath. But others among them say that Christ is from above, that he was created before all things, and that he is a spirit, higher than the angels, and ruler of all, that he is called Christ, and the world there is his portion. But he comes here when he chooses, and he came in Adam, and he appeared to the patriarchs with Adam's body on. And in the last days, the same Christ who had come to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, came and put on Adam's body, and he appeared to men, was crucified, rose, and ascended." Unquote. This type of apostasy is condemned in John 1, 1 3, which affirms that Jesus is the incarnate God when it states, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made." Unquote. See also Philippians 2, 6-11. This Ebionite heresy is also condemned by Islamic teaching. Quran 575 asserts that Jesus was just a human messenger, like those who passed away before him, not Adam or a pre-existent exalted spirit. Quote, the Messiah son of Mary was no other than a messenger. Messengers, the like of whom had passed away before him. Lastly, a Muslim writer named Abdullah Smith claims that the Ebionites, quote, did not believe Jesus was God or the son of God, unquote. However, historians realize that the Ebionites did believe Jesus was the adopted Son of God, a heresy according to both Christianity and Islam. The Gospel of the Ebionites alludes to the baptism of Jesus saying, quote, A voice sounded from heaven that said, You are my beloved Son. In you I am well pleased. I have this day begotten you. Unquote. They took this and affirmed a form of adoptionism. According to Christianity, Jesus is the eternal divine Son of God, bearing the nature of God. See Proverbs 33 and 4, Isaiah 9, 6, and 1 John 5, 20. Not the adopted Son of God. And according to Islam, Jesus is not the Son of God in any sense. See Surah 6, 101 and Surah 112, 14. Therefore, one must question the integrity of any Muslim who would appeal to these antichrist heretics for reliable information on Paul. These second century apostates are unreliable heretics according to both Islam and Christianity. And therefore, the Muslim apologists ought to stop appealing to them and their late opinions as if they somehow represented early Orthodox Christian belief. They clearly did not. The absurd Ebionite charge against Paul. One would expect some kind of meaningful, widely acknowledged reason as to why the Ebionites would reject Paul, in light of all of the early evidence proving that he was reliable. However, the reason given to us by the Ebionites as to why they asserted that Paul is not a true apostle is so absurd and outlandish that it makes me question why any Muslim would appeal to their late opinions as an argument. Epiphanius, writing in the 4th century, reports the following Ebionite charge, quote, The Ebionites declare that he, Paul, was a Greek. He went up to Jerusalem, they say, and when he had spent some time there, he was seized with a passion to marry the daughter of the priest. For this reason, he became a proselyte and was circumcised. Then, when he failed to get the girl, he flew into a rage and row against circumcision and against the Sabbath and the law." Unquote. Obviously, this is a late concocted fable. It is quite remarkable that this is the basis for their bold rejection of Paul. This absurd charge reported in the 4th century by Epiphanius comes from an earlier lost Ebionite source called the Ascents of James. However, this source, which is the original source that this Ebionite fable comes from, is neither early nor reliable. Dr. George Strecker and Dr. Robert Van Voorst date this document to AD 150 to 200 and affirm that it was written in Pella in Transjordan. In their work, the brother of Jesus, James the Just in his mission, Bruce Chilton and Jacob Neusner, note that this is the, quote, consensus view on the date and place of origin of the ascents, unquote. Therefore, this charge against Paul is not reliable historically, and thus we have great reason to question the Ebionite claims about Paul. This Pauline fable is not multiply attested by any other source in the first or second centuries. Therefore, this charge against Paul not only fails the historical test of early accounts and early eyewitness testimony, but it also fails the test of multiple independent attestation. The first century evidence that I discussed earlier flies in the face of this absurd claim as well, rendering it impossible, since the orthodox evidenced view as Paul as a true apostle and martyr for the faith. Based on the nature of this fanciful charge, it seems that the Ebionites were hard pressed for any real convincing evidence or argumentation against Paul's reliability. And so after Paul was dead and not able to defend himself, 
the Ebionites invented this story to justify their heresies and their rejection of Paul's first century apostolic teachings of grace and faith. There is no evidence to suggest that this kind of anti-Pauline Ebionite thinking was part of any major strand of early first century Christian teaching, none whatsoever. There is a wide and broad scholarly view for this Ebionite charge against Paul being a later fabricated legend, story, or development as opposed to historical reality. John Gager states that the Ebionites, quote, developed a legend to explain Paul's opposition to the law, unquote. Bruce Chilton and Jacob Neusner state, quote, Epiphanius reports a legend among the Ebionites that Paul accepted circumcision in the first place only to marry the daughter of the high priest, unquote. AFJ Cligen and GJ Reinink identify this Ebionite charge as a, quote, story, unquote. In reference to this specific Ebionite charge, Harold W. Attridge states, quote, Another category of legends pertains to stories that characterize various aspects of an apostle's character. Christians opposed to Paul told the following story, unquote. Commenting on this charge, Matthew A. Jackson McCabe states, quote, Epiphanius transmits some new, fictitious stories that illustrate the Ebionites' anti-Paulinism. For instance, the Ebionites explain that Paul's antipathy toward the law and circumcision was caused by his unfortunate love affairs, unquote. Richard N. Longnecker states that this Ebionite charge is one in a, quote, cycle of stories fostered in Ebionite circles of the late 2nd and early 3rd centuries, unquote. In this section, I will seek to demonstrate that modern Muslims are in error for rejecting the Apostle Paul, since there are major strands of early Islamic tradition that grant Paul's reliability. Let us first turn our attention to the Quran itself. Many are unaware that the Quran gives an indirect argument for Paul's reliability. Surah 355 states, Behold, Allah said, O Jesus, I will take thee and raise thee to myself and clear thee of falsehoods of those who blaspheme. I will make those who follow thee superior to those who reject faith to the day of resurrection. Then shall ye all return unto me, and I will judge between you of the matters wherein ye dispute." Unquote. Surah 61, Ayah 14, quote, O ye who believe, be ye helpers of Allah. As said Jesus the son of Mary to the disciples, who will be my helpers to the work of Allah? Said the disciples, we are Allah's helpers. Then a portion of the children of Israel believed, and a portion disbelieved. But we gave power to those who believed against their enemies, and they became the ones that prevailed." Unquote. Here the Quran demonstrates that Paul was a true apostle, as well as a true follower of Jesus Christ, since these two texts state that the true followers of Jesus will be superior until the day of resurrection, and that the true early Israelites who followed Jesus would be given power against their enemies and prevail over all other beliefs. However, we know historically that the followers of Jesus who prevailed and who were superior were those who followed apostles like Paul, along with the rest of the twelve apostles. This means that Paul's message was the true message since it became dominant and prevailed along with the Christians who affirmed it. Muslim apologist Nadir Ahmed demonstrates the point and unknowingly proves that Paul is a true apostle and that his followers were correct according to the Quran. Quote, to make a long story short, Paul's church eventually beat out its competitors and arose as the sole victorious church which is present today. Unquote. Moreover, the Quran nowhere mentions the Apostle Paul by name or condemns him by name. Muhammad's ignorance of the first century may explain why this is so. But for the sake of argument, I would pose the following question to the Muslims who believe that Allah is the author of the Quran. If Paul was a false apostle and major corrupter of early Christianity, then why didn't Allah mention this explicitly and warn people about Paul or inform Muslims about how he supposedly corrupted Christianity? I contend that this is a later development. In fact, it seems that the Quran had absolutely no knowledge of these issues. In my debate with the Muslim apologist Nadir Ahmed, he posed a response to the previous argument without actually dealing with the substance of Surah 355 and 6114. He argued that Muhammad taught that there was no prophet between Jesus and Muhammad, and since Paul fits the description of prophet, Islam therefore rejects Paul indirectly. So he must Muslim, Book 30, Number 5834 states, quote, Abu Huraira reported Allah's messenger, may peace be upon him, as saying, I am most akin to the son of Mary, among the whole mankind, and the prophets are of different mothers, but of one religion, and no prophet was raised between me and him, Jesus Christ, unquote. However, all this shows is that the Islamic sources contradict themselves, nothing more. On the one hand, the Quran affirms Paul's reliability indirectly. On the other hand, the Hadith rejects him indirectly. All this does is show a contradiction in the Islamic sources that Muslims need to reconcile. It doesn't refute the fact that the Quran indirectly affirms Paul's reliability. Moreover, although Paul had the characteristics of a prophet, Christians didn't really view him in the same category as Moses or Isaiah, but instead viewed him in the category of apostles like Peter or James. And so it is highly unlikely that this Hadith in Sahih Muslim even had Paul in mind. If this narration amounts to a rejection of Paul, then it likewise rejects Peter and John and all of the apostles of Jesus. Suddenly we are left with no apostles at all. Clearly the context of this Hadith in Sahih Muslim has nothing to do with Paul whatsoever. Commenting on Surah 6114, the respected Islamic commentator Al-Qutbi grants the apostleship of Paul, quote, It was said that this verse was revealed about the apostles of Jesus, may peace and blessings be upon him. Ibn Iskak stated that of the apostles and disciples that Jesus sent to preach, there were Peter and Paul who went to Rome, Andrew and Matthew who went to the land of the cannibals, Thomas who went to Babel in the eastern lands, etc. Notice that this ancient Muslim tradition has Paul as a true apostle. If Muhammad and the early Muslims taught that it was a priority to view Paul as a false usurper whose teachings were to be avoided, then we would not expect to find these ancient Muslim traditions which grant Paul's reliability. If it were a clear Muslim doctrine in the 7th and 8th centuries to reject Paul as the corrupter of Christianity, then one would not expect to find comments like this from Al-Qurtubi and Ibn Iskak. In a separate work, The Life of Muhammad, the 8th century Muslim historian Ibn Iskak reports a tradition informing us about a popular Muslim view of Paul, quote, Those whom Jesus son of Mary sent, both disciples and those who came after them, in the land were Peter the disciple and Paul with him, 
Paul belonged to the followers and was not a disciple to Rome, Andrew and Matthew to the land of the cannibals, etc. Similarly, the 9th century Islamic exegete and historian al tabari has this to say of Paul, quote, Among the apostles and the followers who came after them were the apostle Peter and Paul who was a follower and not an apostle. They went to Rome, unquote. Brother Sam Shimon has offered a detailed discussion on the subject of early Islam's view of Paul, wherein he states that with respect to this kind of identification of Paul as a follower and not a disciple, that this is in no way meant to discredit Paul or defame him. Shimon notes that the translator of al tabaris history, Moshe Perlman, comments on this saying that, quote, In Islamic terms, the messengers or apostles paved the new path. Their work is continued by the tabi'un, the followers, members of the next generations who lead the faithful, unquote. Therefore, by identifying Paul as a follower and not an apostle, this has nothing to do with questioning Paul's status or reliability. It has to do with his sequential chronology. It is very interesting that although later generations of Muslims are quick to attack the Apostle Paul, the historical evidence shows that there was an early strand of Islamic tradition reported by some of Islam's greatest sources granting the reliability of the Apostle Paul. al tabari also states that Paul was martyred for his faith, which further shows his credibility as well as early Islam's support of Paul and Jesus' apostles. Quote, Abu Jafar says, They assert that after Tiberius, Palestine and other parts of Syria were ruled by Gaius, son of Tiberius for four years. He was succeeded by another son, Claudius, for 14 years, following which Nero ruled for 14 years. He slew Peter and crucified Paul head down for four months, but Laius, Vitellius, ruled thereafter." Unquote. What must be stressed about all of this data is that if the Orthodox Muslim understanding at that time was an emphatic recognition that Paul was a usurper or corrupter, we simply would not see references like this about Paul being an apostle or follower of Jesus. These writings demonstrate that the anti-Pauline sentiment we see from Muslims today is not based on any clear teaching of Muhammad or early Islam. It is the product of a process of development in trying to solve the problem as to why Christianity is different than Islam. For further reading on the issue of early Islam's view on Paul, as well as a comparison between Paul's theology and Jesus' theology, proving that they taught the same things, see the following articles. According to certain texts like Quran 7157 and Islamic traditions, Muhammad is claimed to be prophesied in the Jewish and Christian scriptures. Since Muhammad's time, Muslims have therefore fervently searched the Bible for anything that can sound like a prophecy of Muhammad. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 18, verse number 18, and he says, I shall raise thee up a prophet from among thy brethren, like unto thee, and I shall put my words into his mouth, and he shall speak all that I command him. This prophecy says that there is a messenger, a prophet to come from among the brethren, of Prophet Moses, peace be upon him, and he shall be like Prophet Moses, peace be upon him. And Almighty God will put his words into his mouth, and that prophet to come will speak all that Almighty God commands him. The prophecy of the book of Deuteronomy befits no one better than the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. However, this prophecy is about Jesus, as Peter in Acts 3.22 testified, not Muhammad. We know this because although the Muslims argue the Hebrew term brothers here, aki, can mean a person from any nation related to the Jewish people, the fact is the context shows the word should be understood in its other sense, i.e. a person of the same people or a person of Israel, something Muhammad was not. This is because in context the Hebrew word is clearly used in reference to people from among the nation of Israel. For example, in Deuteronomy 17.15, we're told about Jews selecting a Jewish king for themselves from among their brothers and not from a foreigner, which shows brothers here refers to fellow Israelites. And in Deuteronomy 18, 1-2 and 5, were told the tribe of Levi would not be given a land allotment like their other brothers, i.e. Israelites in different Jewish tribes. Thus, in context, brothers clearly refers to people from the 12 tribes of the Israelites and not a foreigner like Muhammad. This is how the author is using the Hebrew term brothers in the context. However, in light of Deuteronomy 18, 15 and 18 saying the prophet will be like Moses, Muslims claim Muhammad was more like Moses than Jesus was, and thus Muhammad must be in view. If we analyze Prophet Moses and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon them, both of them, they were born naturally. They had a mother and father. On the other hand, Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, he was born miraculously without any male intervention. However, when Deuteronomy 18, 15 and 18 teach this prophet would be like Moses, we are not left to guess in what sense. The text provides its own criteria. Verse 18 explains in what sense he will be like Moses, quote, I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. This is how the prophet would be like Moses, and it was Jesus who did this in a greater and more profound way than Muhammad, as Jesus himself proclaimed, quote, I do nothing of my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me, unquote. And, quote, whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me, unquote. Muhammad, on the other hand, often spoke his own words, such as his convenient revelations that suited his passions, as we have proven, and he spoke the words of Satan in the Satanic Verses episode we discussed. Now, Muslims also cite Song of Solomon 5.16 and claim that it mentions Muhammad. It says, His mouth is most sweet, and he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem, unquote. Muhammadim, they translated as altogether lovely, but the word Muhammad is there, in the Hebrew language, in the original. However, just because a Hebrew word sounds similar to the name of a person in a different language, that does not mean it's a prophecy of that person. As David Wood observes, quote, We must conclude that since the Hebrew word for mouse is Akbar, 
we should translate the Arabic sentence Allahu Akbar as Allah is a mouse. Why aren't Muslims embarrassed that their top apologists are using arguments which if taken seriously would prove that their god is a rodent? Also, the context of Song of Solomon 516 has nothing to do with Muhammad. In that text, Solomon's bride is complimenting Solomon in a romantic fashion calling him lovely or desirable. Muhammad was anything but lovely or desirable. As we demonstrated in this film, Muhammad was a demon-possessed, child-raping, adulterous, thieving, mass-murdering, perverted, women-beating, torturing, tongue-sucking, jihadist, false prophet, who invented convenient revelations. Fourthly, the same Hebrew word, makmad, in the singular, appears in 2 Chronicles 36.19, referring to precious vessels being burnt and destroyed, and in Isaiah 64.11, referring to pleasant buildings of the Jews being laid waste. Does this mean that Muhammad was burnt, destroyed, and laid waste? Next, according to various Muslims, Isaiah 9.6 is actually a prophecy of Muhammad. The text reads, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The 8th century Muslim scholar Ali Tabari argued government shall be upon his shoulders really meant the sign of prophecy shall be on his shoulders. In other words, it's allegedly talking about Muhammad's hairy moles on his shoulders as an alleged sign he is a prophet. However, Isaiah 9.6 is clearly about Christ, not Muhammad. As noted, the ancient Jewish Targum of Isaiah affirms this text is about the Messiah, as does Targum Jonathan and Midrash Rabbah Deuteronomy. Moreover, this person is called Mighty God, which is what Christians call Jesus. Muslims do not call Muhammad Mighty God. Lastly, the Hebrew word Hamisra does not mean sign of prophecy will be on his shoulder, as though it were referring to Muhammad's hairy moles. It means dominion and rule will be on his shoulder. The same Hebrew word is used in the very next verse, Isaiah 9-7, where it says, Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. If Muslims were right, this would mean the increase of Muhammad's mole would never end, and that would be one large mole. Further, it's mentioned in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 29, verse number 12. The book will be given to thee, and it will be said to him, Pray, read this, but I will say, I am not learned. This is exactly what happened when the first revelation was revealed to Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. And when Archangel Gabriel revealed the first word from Surah Iqra of Surah Allah, chapter 96, verse number 1, and he said, Iqra, read. The beloved Prophet said, Ma Anabi Khari, I am not learned. This is exactly the fulfillment of the prophecy in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 29, verse number 12. However, when Isaiah 29, 11 to 12 mentions one being given a book while being told to read, to which the person responds by saying they cannot, this has nothing to do with Muhammad. In context, the book which could not be read is not the Quran, but instead a vision of Isaiah which is metaphorically described as being sealed in a scroll the Jews could not understand due to being blind. And the vision contained in this metaphorical scroll or book is of God allowing the nations to attack Israel for its disobedience as a judgment, and then at the last moment stopping the nations from doing so as a rescue. So when verses 11 to 12 mention those who are told to read the scroll, i.e. understand the vision, and yet they can, this symbolizes blind, disobedient ancient Israelites who did not understand Isaiah's vision. That's the context. As Old Testament scholar Jeffrey W. Grogan notes, quote, The whole point of verses 11 to 12 is that Isaiah's own God-given vision was a closed book to the people of Jerusalem. He who could not read, the ordinary inhabitant of Jerusalem, was at once removed further still from understanding, unquote. Further proof this is about disobedient ancient Israelites not understanding Isaiah's vision is seen in the next verse, verse 13, which says, And the Lord said, Because this people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me, and their fear of me is a commandment taught by men, unquote. These are the blind people described in verses 11 to 12 who could not understand, i.e. read, Isaiah's vision sealed in a metaphorical scroll or book. So are Muslims really going to say this is actually about Muhammad, and that Muhammad only honored God with his lips, but that his heart was far from God, and that Muhammad taught commandments of men and not God? John chapter 16, where it says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, Jesus says. It is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you, but if I go, I will send him. And when he's come, he will convict the world in respect of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not in me, and on and on. He says, if I don't go, the comforter will not come unto you. We say that comforter is Muhammad. There are many reasons that the spirit of truth or helper, which is sent in John 14 to 16, can't be about Muhammad, but is instead about the Holy Spirit of God. First, the expression spirit of truth used in the text was current in pre-Christian Judaism and referred to a literal spirit God placed in his people. Second, the spirit was promised to the disciples in John 14, 16, i.e. he, the Father, will give you, the disciples, another helper. Since Muhammad was not around at the time of Jesus' disciples, this can't be about him. Thirdly, this helper is explicitly identified as the Holy Spirit in John 14, 26, the same Holy Spirit mentioned throughout the Gospels, who is not Muhammad. Fourthly, in John 16, 14 to 15, Jesus said, He, the helper, will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine, Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you." Unquote. Did Muhammad teach that all the Father has belongs to Jesus? No. The criteria for the Comforter to come is that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, should depart. Only after he goes can the Comforter come. And when we read the Bible, we come to know that the Holy Spirit was already there with Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. He was there before he came into this world. If you read the Bible, it mentions that the Holy Spirit was there when John the Baptist was being baptized. The Holy Spirit was there in the womb of Elizabeth. So, surely the prophecy cannot refer to the Holy Spirit. 
However, this argument is refuted by Jesus' teaching in John 14, 17, since although the Holy Spirit already dwelled with the disciples and people like John the Baptist, when Jesus ascended, the same Holy Spirit would then be in the disciples forever, which is different. Notice verse 17 carefully, quote, You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you, unquote. There's a difference between the Holy Spirit first dwelling with the disciples and then being in them forever. So an appeal to Muhammad is not necessary. According to the Quran, Muhammad was accused of stealing various stories. For example, in Quran 25.5 we read, And they say, Legends of the former peoples which he has written down, and they are dictated to him morning and afternoon. The fact of the matter is many stories of the Quran have been traced back to various uninspired texts. That much of the Quran was plagiarized from earlier uninspired Jewish, Christian, and Gnostic texts has been proven in W. St. Clair Tistal's book, The Original Sources of the Quran, and other works. Such uninspired original texts include apocryphal gospels, midrashim, targumim, and apocryphal Gnostic works. The Quran mentions various biblical figures, yet many of its stories about these figures are not found in the inspired Jewish and Christian scriptures. Well, where then do they come from? The story of Abraham being delivered from fire which Nimrod created to destroy him is found in numerous passages of the Quran. According to the story, Abraham's father used to make idols, and Abraham sold them. Abraham disliked this and mocked the purchase of such idols. Abraham then preached monotheism and tried to convert his father and the people. His father refused. Then news spread about Abraham's preaching and it reached Nimrod. Nimrod then put Abraham in a fire from which Abraham escaped. This Quranic story comes from Midrash Rabbah, which is an uninspired Jewish homiletical interpretation of the Bible from around the 5th century. It states, Terah was a maker of idols. Once he went out somewhere and seated Abraham as salesman in place of himself, a person would come wishing to purchase, and Abraham would say to him, How old art thou? And he, the other, would say to him, Fifty or sixty years. And he, Abraham, would say unto him, Woe to that man who is sixty years of age, and wisheth to worship a thing a few days old. He, Terah, delivered him over to Nimrod. He, Nimrod, said to him, Let us worship the fire, if thou bandiest words with me. Lo, I worship not but the fire. Lo, I cast thee into the midst of it, and let the God whom thou worshipest come and deliver thee from it. Abraham went down into the furnace of fire and was delivered." Unquote. Now the interesting thing which proves this story is false, and how it reached Muhammad, is that when translating Genesis 15.7 from Hebrew to Aramaic, which says Abraham was brought from Ur of the Chaldeans, Jonathan ben Uzael wrongly rendered the Babylonian word Ur into the Aramaic word light or fire. The pattern is Muhammad tells a story, and we can trace the story back to some kind of forgery or some other historically inaccurate account. And a, a funny example is, uh, it has to do with um, something Muhammad said about Abraham. Um, basically, in the Bible, Genesis 15, we're told that God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldeans. In the Babylonian language, Ur, means city, just the city of the Chaldeans. Uh, but in the first century, a Jewish rabbi named Jonathan ben Uziel was translating Genesis 15 into Aramaic, and he came across the word Ur. He didn't know how to speak Babylonian, so he confused the Babylonian word Ur, which means city, with the Hebrew word Ur, which means fire. And this mistake caused him to mistranslate the passage. Instead of saying that God delivered Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldeans, uh, Jonathan's mistranslation said that God delivered Abraham out of the fire of the Chaldeans. Now, why is this important? Well, Jewish writers ran with this idea of Abraham escaping the fire. And so the Talmud eventually contains stories in which Abraham was thrown into a fire by the Chaldeans and was miraculously rescued by God. These stories were uh, popular in Arabia during the time of Muhammad, which is crucial because in the Quran, Surah 21, we read about Abraham being delivered from the fire. Now, Muhammad claimed that he got the story from God, but we know that the story of Abraham being delivered from the fire was based on a mistranslation of the word Ur. So what makes more sense here? That God also mistranslated the word Ur, or that Muhammad was getting some of his stories from the people around him? Uh, this is why it's not surprising to read in uh, chapter 25, verse 5 of the Quran, that Muhammad's contemporaries were accusing him of copying various tales in the Quran from earlier writers. Now, in Quran 27, 17 to 44, there is a story of Solomon and Bathsheba. Here the Quran says Solomon trained birds in battle to drop stones on enemies. Then Solomon could not find his hoopy bird, and he got upset. But the hoopy bird then came to Solomon, talking to him, and told him about this woman named Queen Bathsheba. Then Solomon sent the hoopy bird with a letter to give Bathsheba. After a quarrel, Bathsheba ended up at Solomon's palace, and when entering Solomon's court, she lifted up her dress, uncovering her legs, because she thought the floor was made of water, when really it was made of glass. Now, this exact tale comes from the earlier uninspired Jewish second Targum of Esther, aka Targum Sheni, which says, quote, One day the king Solomon, observing that the mountain cock or hoopy was absent, ordered that the bird be summoned forthwith. When it arrived, it declared that it had, for three months, been flying higher and thither seeking to discover some country not yet subjected to Solomon, and had at length found a land in the east exceedingly rich in gold, silver, and plants, whose capital was called Kitor, and whose ruler was a woman known as the Queen of Saba, Sheba. The bird suggested that it should fly to the queen and bring her to Solomon. The king approved this proposal, and Solomon accordingly caused a letter to be tied to the hoopy's wing. On being informed of her arrival, Solomon sent his chief minister, Benaiah, to meet her, and then seated himself in a glass pavilion. The queen, thinking that the king was sitting in water, lifted her dress, which caused Solomon to smile." Unquote. So clearly, this is the exact story found in the Quran. Because of this Targum's reflection of persecution from Byzantine Catholics and due to linguistic reasons, the Targum expert Bernard Grossfield dates it to the early 7th century, at the end of the Byzantine period, before the rise of Islam. 
This dating is confirmed by the German scholar Beat Ego. In fact, the Encyclopedia of Religious and Philosophical Writings in Late Antiquity, edited by Jacob Neusner and Alan Jeffrey Avery Peck, notes most scholars today agree with this dating. Since this targum was composed prior to the rise of Islam and later spreading of the Quran, it could not have borrowed the story from the Quran. The Quran borrowed the silly tale from the Targum orally. Now in Quran 1922-26, a story is told of Mary being pregnant with Jesus and then traveling to a far place to give birth, where she then rests under a palm tree. God tells her to shake the trunk of the tree so dates would drop from it. Then she ate and drank and became refreshed. This tale is found in the uninspired apocryphal book, The Gospel of Pseudo-Matthew, aka History of the Nativity of Mary and the Infancy of the Savior. It says, quote, Mary was fatigued by the excessive heat of the sun in the desert, and seeing a palm tree, she said to Joseph, Let me rest a little under the shade of this tree. She looked up to the foliage of the palm, and saw it full of fruit, and said to Joseph, I wish it were possible to get some of the fruit of this palm. And Joseph said to her, I am thinking more of the want of water, because the skins are now empty, and we have none wherewith to refresh ourselves and our cattle. Then the child Jesus said to the palm, O tree, bend thy branches, and refresh my mother with thy fruit. And immediately at these words the palm tree bent its top down to the very feet of the blessed Mary, and they gathered from its fruit, with which they were all refreshed." Unquote. Again, this is the same story. As to the dating of this apocryphal book, Mark Ehrman argues for a date of composition in the first quarter of the 7th century, which is prior to the rise of Islam and the spread of the Quran. He notes, quote, M. Berthold has argued that Pseudo-Matthew shows evidence of literary dependence on the Vita Agnitas of Pseudo-Ambrose, which itself was used in the E. Virginate of Elhelm of Malmesbury in 690. On these grounds, Pseudo-Matthew must obviously date to some time in the mid 7th century at the earliest. In the most thorough analysis to date, Gisgel has maintained that even though direct literary dependence on the rule of Benedict cannot be demonstrated, there are enough general similarities to suggest that the book was written when monastic orders were beginning to expand in the West by someone invested in them. Largely on these grounds, he makes a convincing argument that the text was produced in the first quarter of the 7th century by a monk in the Latin-speaking West." Unquote. Thus again, we have the Quran orally borrowing fables from uninspired earlier books. Next, in various Quranic verses, we see Jesus speaking in his cradle. For example, Quran 1929-30 says, quote, but she pointed to him. They said, how should we speak to one who is a child in the cradle? He said, I am indeed a servant of Allah. He has given me the book and made me a prophet, and he has made me blessed wherever I may be, and he has enjoined on me prayer and poor rate as long as I live. The idea of Jesus speaking to his mother from his cradle comes from the Arabic gospel of infancy of the Savior. In that document we read, quote, Jesus spoke, and indeed, when he was lying in his cradle, said to Mary his mother, I am Jesus, son of God, the Logos, whom thou hast brought forth, as the angel Gabriel announced to thee, and my father has sent me for the salvation of the world, unquote. Muhammad simply altered the wording to fit his theology. This document is dated from the 5th to 6th century. The same idea of Jesus speaking from the cradle can also be found in the earlier Infancy Gospel of Thomas, which the aforementioned Arabic Gospel of Infancy utilized. The Infancy Gospel of Thomas says, Being an infant, he, Jesus, uttered such things. This document is dated to the end of the 2nd century. It is a Gnostic text, and its story of Jesus speaking as an infant with wisdom was made up or invented to promote the Gnostic idea of Jesus' extraordinary gnosis or wisdom. Thus, Muhammad incorrectly assumed these uninspired apocryphal invented Gnostic tales he heard orally were reliable and included them into the Quran. What a disaster. Again, Muhammad did not have the Bible translated into Arabic, so he could not check if such stories were reliable and biblical. Now, in Quran 349 and 5109 to 110, we are told about Jesus creating birds out of dust and then breathing life into them. This idea comes from the same sources just mentioned. The accounts state, quote, He, Jesus, had made figures of birds and sparrows, which flew when he told them to fly. And, then he took from the bank of the stream some soft clay and formed out of it twelve sparrows, and there were other boys playing with him. Then Jesus clapped together the palms of his hands, called to the sparrows, and said to them, Go, fly away, and while you live, remember me. Now in Quran 18, 8-25, we are told about the legend of the companions of a cave. In this story, a group of seven youths and their dog take refuge in a cave from danger, and miraculously they are able to sleep in it for about 300 years, after which they wake up and leave. This legend of seven sleepers or companions in a cave actually comes from two uninspired Syriac homilies of Jacob of Sarag in the late 6th century, as well as Gregory of Tours' Latin version from the late 6th century. The story spread rapidly into other languages after its composition, showing how attractive the silly legend was. Lastly, the story of Iblis, i.e. Satan and Adam, is found in various texts of the Quran. In this tale, God commands the angels to prostrate before Adam, but Satan refuses because he said he is better than Adam since Adam was only created from clay. Then Satan is expelled from heaven. Now, the expert on Quranic origins and oral composition, Andrew Bannister, tells us which uninspired pre-Islamic texts this story comes from, quote, The oldest extant version of this story is found in the Vitae Adei et Avei, 13.1-16.3, which some scholars argue could originally be as old as 100 BC, although the current Latin text dates to circa AD 400. In this version, the story is told in the first person, with Satan explaining to Adam why he was cast out of heaven. Satan reports that it was Michael who had brought Adam before the angels and commanded them to worship him. Satan refused, protesting that Adam was younger and inferior, so Adam should be worshipped by him. Michael continued to insist upon obedience, but Satan and many angels refused, following which God cast them out of heaven. There are many Jewish versions of Iblis and Adam, including allusions to the tale in both Second Enoch, 
and a myriad rabbinic uses of the story. Ginsberg discusses these, several of which combine it, and the account of Adam naming the animals as Desurah too. Satan protests to God that he and the angels had been created from Shekinah glory itself and were now being asked to prostrate to a thing made from dust. It is at this point that God asks Satan to demonstrate his superiority by naming the animals. He fails, Adam succeeds, and Satan is cast out of heaven. Bannister also notes the stories found in some uninspired Christian documents like the 3rd century The Gospel of Bartholomew, 4, 51-55, and the 6th century The Book of the Cave of Treasure. Bannister concludes, quote, Thus it is clear that various forms of the Iblis and Adam's story enjoyed a wide provenance in the centuries preceding Islam and were well known within both Jewish and Christian communities. When the Quran emerged in the 7th century, it did so in an oral culture in which Iblis's traditions were freely circulating, and thus there existed a large pool of commonly known stories and traditions to fish from." Unquote. In fact, to seal the deal, Bannister has shown the three common elements that appear in all seven Quranic versions of the story are the same three common elements present in the pre-Islamic sources which tell the story. This proves the Quran lifted this fable from these earlier sources. Now, the only difficulty is that although all these various stories we mentioned are the same, there is no textual overlap when you examine the Quran and the stories in these pre-Islamic documents side by side. In other words, Muhammad or someone he knew did not copy from the original documents word for word. This is where Andrew Bannister's new research comes into play. In his groundbreaking book, An Oral Formulaic Study of the Quran, which is based on his PhD work, he proves not only that the Quran was recited and transmitted orally, but that it was actually composed orally in live performance with formulaic diction, i.e. short repeated phrases or groups of words that can be reused to express a key idea. This shows Muhammad was an oral performer or preacher, fishing from a pool of oral material in his culture, which can be traced back to these uninspired Jewish Christian and Gnostic texts. With the help of computerized linguistic analysis, Bannister has proven this. He notes, quote, Oral formulaic analysis proceeds by analyzing a text looking for the presence of repeated formulaic phrases in a text. Formulaic diction is a tool frequently used by oral performers to facilitate composition at speed, live in performance. To further establish this, Bannister also established the oral culture surrounding the Quran and the existence of folk memory in Islamic sources, i.e. Muhammad's ability to produce Quranic sayings as necessity demanded it, often in response to a question or challenge from an audience. His conclusion based on his study is that large portions of the Quran were constructed live in oral performance based on earlier oral legends. Some features in the Quranic stories he brought out proving this are performance features, multiple versions of the same story exhibiting flexibility and fluidity in their telling, frequent audience asides scattered throughout the Quran, and also highly elusive referencing. He found the Quran's overall formulaic density ranges from 52.18% to 23.55%. A density comfortably beyond 20% is often considered to indicate formulaic borrowing or that a text was composed orally from stock phrases or elements. Formulaic density refers to the percentage of a given text that consists of short repeated phrases indicating oral composition. He found there are 99 surahs of the Quran with a formulaic density of 20% or higher. 69 of these have a formulaic density of 40% or higher. 45 of these have a formulaic density of 50% or higher. 14 of these have a formulaic density of 16% or higher. And one surah, surah 61, has a formulaic density of 77% or higher. This is groundbreaking and shows the Quran is not from God. Instead, Muhammad composed its surahs in performance fashion, using common oral formulas borrowed from fables or stories traced back to uninspired apocryphal Jewish, Christian, and Gnostic texts. This destroys the Quran and Islam. Almost all Muslims believe that after Muhammad died and his alleged revelation ceased, the Quranic surahs were then compiled by the first caliph Abu Bakr and then standardized and distributed by Caliph Uthman. They believe the Quran they read today, based on the Arabic 1924 Cairo edition, which is the standard around the world, is exactly the same as the one Caliph Uthman allegedly standardized and distributed in the mid-7th century. Islamic writer Ijaz Nakbi gives the Muslim view. Uthman appointed 12 members headed by Zayd bin Thabit, the same scribe used by Abu Bakr, to write the Quran in the mode of the tribe of Quraysh, the one used by the Prophet in his recitation. The intent was to preserve the Quran exactly as it was revealed and organized at the time of the Prophet Muhammad. Uthman relied on two sources, the written text that had been previously ordered by Abu Bakr and the various oral traditions of Muslims who memorized it during the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad. In Islamic history, there is no variation between these two sources, so the Uthmanic recension is largely a codifying of a single version of a text. This version, the Uthmanic recension, is the version of the Quran that has remained unchanged and is the one currently in use." Unquote. However, this common Muslim view has now been called into question by the evidence. Muslims believe they possess various Qurans Caliph Uthman had created in the mid-7th century when he allegedly standardized and distributed the Quran after Muhammad died. To them, this proves the Quran of Uthman has been perfectly preserved, reaching us today. As the Islamic writer Murad Hoffman claims, Uthman's copy is on display at the Topkapi Museum in Istanbul. The second one is preserved in Tashkent." Unquote. However, world authorities of early Quranic manuscripts are now admitting after their studies of such manuscripts that Muslims do not actually possess any of the Uthmanic Qurans. For example, Muslim scholar Akmeladin Isanalu wrote, quote, One of the most important questions of Quranic history is the whereabouts of the Mushafs attributed to Caliph Uthman and whether any of them reach the present day. Unfortunately, we do not have a positive answer to this question." Unquote. Now, here's a problem. Muslims make four claims about the Quran. They say, first of all, that the Quran is eternal. It's always been. That's the first claim. And ask Muslims if that's true, and they'll have to say yes. Secondly, that it was sent down over a period of 22 to 23 years to a man named Muhammad between 610 and 632, so in the 7th century. So, 
eternal. It's always existed on these eternal tablets, and that's in Surah 85, Ayah 22. So chapter 85, verse 22 in the Quran, it says that. Now it refers to those tablets. So it's eternal. It's never been created. It's the uncreated Quran. It exists on those tablets, but was sent down piecemeal to a man named Muhammad in 610 to 632 there in uh, Mecca and Medina. But it was not compiled. It was not written down in a, in a uh, codex or codex form particle form until 650 at the time of Uthman, the third caliph. So roughly 18 years after Muhammad died, it was then written down in its final form. And this book they have, that I have here, they say, is the same that is, was written down at the time of Uthman in 650, mid seventh century, and is exactly the same that was revealed to the Prophet over 22 years, and is exactly the same as that eternal tab that exists in heaven. So those are the first three claims they make, okay? And then number four, and this is probably the most, the most difficult one for them, they say that the Quran that I have in my hand right now, this Quran, the Arabic part, is exactly the same, letter for letter, word for word, Every bit of it, exactly the same, sentence for sentence, verse for verse, chapter for chapter, as that which exists in those eternal tablets. You claim that it was complete in the 7th century and unchanged. Therefore, show me a manuscript from the 7th century that's complete and unchanged. From the 7th century that is complete and unchanged. Now, Muslims claim they do have Qurans that are complete and unchanged. And here's one of them right here. This is the top copy. Here's a picture of one that I'm showing you in the screen. That's the book copy manuscript. That is, uh, they claim, is from Uthman. You can see, in fact, if you look carefully, you can see, uh, let's see, where is it? Down here, sorry. Right down here. You can see it's blood stain. Now let me bring up the camera bench better. Can you see it in the bloodstain? Mm -hmm. That's the bloodstain of Uthman, they claim. This is in the Tokkapi Palace there in Istanbul, in Turkey. That, they claim, is that's just one page of the entire Quran that's complete and unchanged from the 7th century. So that's the Tokkapi manuscript. I confronted Shabir Ali with that, and I said, okay, I want you to look at those manuscripts, and I want you to tell me what has been found out about those manuscripts. Now, he, did, he, did, ah, he didn't know, and he wasn't aware what I was going to do next. I said, listen, there are two Muslim scholars, Dr. Tahir al and Dr. Ikmal al Dr. Tahir al and Ikmal al are both from Turkey. They both control the, the Tokkapi manuscript. They have access to all, had access to all six manuscripts from 2002 to 2007. They looked at all of them, and this is what they concluded. They said that this one here, the Tokkapi, is not from the 7th century. It's from the mid-8th century. If you look at the style of writing, you can see it's a much later style of writing. It's a it, it's a uh, Abbasid style of writing. Akmeladin in Sanlu notes, quote, Judging from its illumination, the top copy Mushaf dates neither from the period when Mushafs of the Caliph Uthman were written, nor from the time when copies based on those Mushafs were written. Confirming this is Quranic manuscript scholar Tayyar al who says, quote, Even though we would like to publish the sacred text as the Mushaf of the Caliph Uthman, our research indicated that it was neither the private Mushaf of Caliph Uthman, nor one of the Mushafs he sent to various centers, unquote. They also say that this manuscript here is also complete and unchanged. This is the Samarkand manuscript that's in Tashkent in Uzbekistan, and it's different than the Tokkap, you can tell it's much bigger script, but they claim that that one is complete and unchanged also, but it's from Tashkent one here. They say is early 8th century, again, not 7th century, early 8th century, but it only goes up to Surah 43. There's 114 surahs in the Quran. More than that, it is so full of manuscript variants, and it's written terribly by somebody who didn't know much grammar. It was, it's an embarrassment, they say. Half the Quran is missing, full of manuscript variants. Strike two. Tayyar Alta Kulich notes this one is not Uthmanic either, quote, Muslims generally believed that this manuscript was one of the four Uthman sent out, and widespread opinion is that he was reading this copy when he was martyred, due to bloodstains on it. But, due to its spelling, it is neither one of the Caliph Uthman's copies, nor his private Musha, unquote. He continues, quote, There are six reasons why it could not be so, including almost no discipline of spelling, different ways of writing the same word, scribal mistakes, copyist mistakes, written by a scribe who had no writing experience, and later added signs after verses. In conclusion, we can say that the Tashkent Somarkand Mushaf was neither the Mushaf which Caliph Uthman was reading when he was martyred, nor any one of the Mushafs that he sent to various centers, nor the copy that was kept in Medina for the benefit of the people." Unquote. Quranic manuscript scholar Francis de Roche dates it to the 8th century. Then they have they have the Husseini manuscript, which is this one here. This is in Cairo. The Husseini, very much like the Tashkent one, the Samarkand. It's very much uh, large letters. That's complete and unchanged, and that's in Egypt, there in Cairo. The Husseini one is a 9th century manuscript. Again, about 200 years after the fact, it has that what we call a monumental text, much larger text. It is not complete. It has full of errors. Tayyar al Takulich notes, quote, It was stated that the Cairo copy might have been written on the order of Abd al-Aziz b. Marwan, the governor of Egypt. However, the reason for reaching this conclusion has not been explained. We share the view that this copy is not one of the Mushafs attributed to Caliph Uthman, unquote. And, quote, it belongs to the end of the 2nd, 8th century and the beginning of the 3rd, 9th century, unquote. The Fetch of one. This is the one that's in Paris. And the man that you see next to it is Dr. Franz de Roche, who is responsible for it. That, they say, is completely unchanged. This one is only 26% of the Quran. Most of the Quran is missing in it. It is from the 8th century, early 8th century. This manuscript is dated to the late 7th century or early 8th century. Thus, it does not come from Uthman, who again reigned in the mid-600s. And then the most exciting one, the one that they like the most, is this one here. This is the Sana Manuscript, which is in Yemen. The Sana Manuscript, which is completely unchanged. Again, the Sana Manuscript, this one here, is probably the earliest. Parts of it could be from the late 7th century, the last two decades. Because if you look at this blue picture here and this picture down here, those two pictures you can see, if you look carefully, you can see that there are layers of writing. This is called a palimpsest. That means it has an underscript and an overscript. And when you look at the underscript, you'll see it does not match the overscript. So there's an evolution in the script. The underscript has been dated to the late 7th century. The overscript, this upperscript, is dated to 705, early 8th century. It is not complete. It has hundreds of manuscript variants. Tear Alta Kulich notes it comes from the end of the first century AH, 
or the first half of the 2nd century AH, and neither is Uthmanic nor written by Ali. So as we can see, we do not have Qurans from Uthman, thus this common Muslim claim is false. Now, I just did two debates this last week, one on Trinity Television, uh, Trinity uh, Channel on YouTube, Skyped, Doc, I, and I Skyped, it was a week ago, last Thursday, I debated Anjum Chaudhry. Anjum Chaudhry is the most radical Muslim in Britain today. He's considered to be the most radical Muslim in Europe today. He is responsible, according to BBC and Gordon Scotland Yard here in Britain, for sending 30% of all Muslims that have left Europe, not just Britain, but Europe, all 30% of every Muslim that has left Europe to go join ISIS has been because of him. That's how influential he is. I've known him for about 15 years. I debated him four times. I debated him last Thursday, and we confronted him with this material. Took two hours. You can go see. I'll send you the URL. You can go look at it. He could not come up with any response to this material. Now, the work of the Semitic languages scholar Arthur Jeffrey demonstrates based on early Islamic traditions that there were various Quranic codices possessed by people like Muhammad's companions. Some of these were incomplete, missing entire surahs, or they contained extra surahs, and in them were thousands of meaningful variants or differences among themselves. And with the modern edition of the Quran Muslims read today, Jeffrey observed, quote, Tradition knows the names of several of these. For example, Salim B. Mukbib, who was killed at the Battle of Yamama, and who tradition says was the first to make such an attempt at setting all his material down in codex form. Ali B. Abi Khalid, who is said to have endeavored to arrange the revelations in their chronological order. Anas B. Malik, whose codex may have been based on that of his uncle, Abu Zaid, who was well known as one of the early collectors of revelation. Abu Musa al-Ashari, whose codex was a large one and was familiarly given the name of Ubab al-Kulub and various others, including the two famous codices of Ubay b Kab and of Abdullah b Masud, from both of which a great body of variant readings has survived. We know that the codex of Ibn Masud omitted surahs 1, 113, and 114, and that both the codices of Ubay and Abu Musa included two short surahs, which are not in our present text. While a considerable body of variant readings from these codices is to be gathered from the grammatical, lexical, exegetical, and Masoretic literature of the latter generations, which still remembered and discussed them, there were once indeed a number of special works under the name of Kitab al-Mashihif, which specially discussed the stage of the old codices, and it was a fortunate accident which enabled the present writer to discover and publish the text of the sole surviving example of these, the Codex Book of Ibn Abi Dawud. The mass of variant readings that has survived to us from the codices of Ubay and Ibn Masud shows that they were real textual variants and not mere dialectical peculiarities." Unquote. Jeffrey provided a list of the thousands of variants from these early Qurans in his work Materials for the History of the Text of the Quran. The number of variants in all these early Qurans is so large they fill up around 350 pages of Arthur Jeffrey's book. In regards to copious mistakes in the 8th century Qurans Muslims falsely claim are Uthmanic, as well as other fragments and partial codices from the same period, these count as textual variants. Regarding the Pope copy manuscript, Tayyar Altakulich notes, quote, there are deviations from grammatical rules and spelling mistakes in the Mushafs attributed to Caliph Uthman. Regarding the Samarkand manuscript, Muslims also falsely claim as Uthmanic. Alta Kulich says there are, quote, scribal mistakes and copious mistakes. Muslim apologist Adnan Rashid claimed the only variants in these early Quranic manuscripts are minor spelling mistakes or scribal errors, but that there are no major word or phrase variants, and that this is what allegedly makes the Quran superior to the Bible. There is no new verse, there is no old verse, there are no, um, major variants there are spelling mistakes uh, common spelling uh, scribal errors and apart from that there are no shocks uh, but in the bible it's, it's a totally different story however this is a complete lie regarding variant words or phrases which affect the meaning of the text in early qurans in the lower or earlier text of the sana palimpsest which is an incomplete codex comprising about half the quran there are many variants differentiating it from the standard 1924 cairo edition of the quran muslims use today for example benham Siddiqui notes the lower text of this early quran disagrees with the modern edition of the quran in surah 2 196 here the sana palimpsest says do not shave until the offering reaches its destination while the modern edition muslims use says do not shave your heads until the offering reaches its destination in the same verse the sana palimpsest says fasting or alms or an offering while the modern edition says, fasting or an offering. Also in Quran 2, 201, the Sana Palimpsest says, Our Lord give us in this world and in the next. While the modern edition Muslims use today says, Our Lord give us good in this world and good in the next. In fact, Siddiqui and Gadrauzi list many more variants in the lower text of this manuscript, which affect the meaning of the text. Such variants show this Quran does not come from Uthman. Such variants should not exist in this text if the Quran was complete, perfect, and standardized at the time of Uthman. In fact, these scholars note the Sana Palimpsest represents a textual tradition different than the Uthmanic textual tradition, which refutes the Muslim claim that there were no different textual traditions prior to the Quranic standardization of Uthman, but that the Quran was perfect from the time of Muhammad to Abu Bakr to Uthman. As Siddiqui and Gadrauzi say, the textual tradition to which it, the son of Palimpsest, belonged, and the Uthmanic tradition, must have diverged sometime before the spread of the Uthmanic tradition in the mid-7th century." Unquote. This is groundbreaking. One of the variants among the supposed Uthmanic manuscript listed in Tayyar Altakulich's work is that while Quran 3, 158 in the modern edition reads, if you should die or be slain before him, you shall undoubtedly be gathered. Yet, the great Paris manuscript reads, quote, if you should die or be slain, you shall not be gathered, unquote. In regards to word or phrase variants in the earliest Quran manuscripts, Keith Small notes, quote, Magana notes one instance of an omitted word in a palimpsest, Fidelli notes three omissions in palimpsests, two of which are phrases, and an omission of a word in a normal manuscript, E. Quinn notes additional and missing passages in the inferior script of another palimpsest. These larger omissions in the palimpsests, though, were probably not accidental. 
Instead, they probably represent a different form of the text, possibly from before the basic standardization of the continental text." Unquote. He lists the following sources for these findings. Moreover, with regards to diacritical marks changing the meaning of a sentence, in the Tok copy manuscript in Quran 1438 it says, You know what we conceal and what he revealed. While the modern edition Muslims read today reads, You know what we conceal and what we reveal. In the Petropolitanus manuscript, or BNF Arabi 328a, in Quran 1437 it says, Our Lord, I have settled some of the descendants in an uncultivated valley near your sacred house, our Lord, that they may establish prayer and make hearts among the people inclined toward them. However, in the standard edition of today it says, Our Lord, I have settled some of my descendants in an uncultivated valley near your sacred house, our Lord, that they may establish prayer. So, make hearts among the people inclined toward them." Unquote. This changes the meaning of the text so that the repentance of the people is no longer a result of Abraham settling people near God's sacred house, as in the Petropolitanus manuscript, but instead their repentance is something Abraham is requesting of God, as in the standard edition of today. Thus, the idea all you find in the earliest Quran manuscripts are minor spelling errors or copyist mistakes, and not word or phrase variants that affect the meaning of the text, is false. In fact, commenting on whether or not we can trace the Quran back to Muhammad in light of these kind of textual variants, corrections, and Islamic history, Quranic textual critic Keith Small notes, quote, how much the meaning of the text of the Quran was changed by this editing is impossible to quantify, one way or the other. The idea of one precise version of the Quran going back to Muhammad cannot be substantiated in this situation." Unquote. Then there's a new study that's just come up, which shows that every one of the ten earliest manuscripts is done by Dr. Dan Brubaker. He did his doctoral thesis on this material. He looked at the ten of the earliest, manus of the earliest manuscripts that existed, and this is what he found. He found tapings. There's tapings on the manuscripts. Now these tapings look like maybe they were to patch up something that had, that had been, maybe um, patch up that something had been torn. But when you look on the back side here, you notice that everything's okay. So these are deliberate tapings to cover up what they did not want people to see. That's the problem. Then he found more than that, he found insertions. Here you can see some examples. These are insertions, these are words that are inserted above a little line, sometimes in small spaces. These are words that should be there but are put there for obvious reasons because they want to change the script. Hundreds of these, not just a few, hundreds. Erasers, where they erased, you can see they erased there, they erased there, these are all erasers. They just erased words or phrases to change the script. Then they took Erasers overwritten, so they've erased it and then they've overwritten over top of it. There you can see some examples of that. Erasing and writing over top. Hundreds of those. Overwriting without apparent base. Here they've just written over top without even erasing. So you can see both the lower and the upper script. That's rather clumsy of them. Then you have what you call selective coverings. If you look here carefully, there, 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 there. Those are coverings. Coverings, obviously, to hide a word or a phrase. And there's sometimes where they've done selective coverings. Here's a long guff where they've taken a whole line, covered it off, and then just put two letters over top of it. These are coverings with written writings over top. And then finally, they have multiple changes where they have many on the same page. Now, he, he just looked at these 10 manuscripts and he came up with 800 corrections. 800 corrections, but what was more damaging was that these corrections continue up until the 9th century. They're not all from the 8th century. They continue, they're still correcting the crime, they're still manipulating it, they're still changing it, standardizing it, making it uniform up until the 19th century, 200 years after Muhammad. In light of the presence of these changes and variants in the earliest Qurans, Brubaker notes the manuscripts, quote, show few signs of meticulous conformity to a standard. An odd fact indeed, considering the care Muslim historical accounts attribute to the standardization campaign of the Caliph Uthman prior to 36 AH or 656 AD, unquote. This is severely damaging to the Muslim claim that these earliest Qurans are reflective of what Uthman had written. They can't be since they do not meticulously conform to such a standard. Brubaker has found many hundreds of changes and included lots of them in his thesis. Many of the changes bring the ancient manuscripts into conformity with the standard 1924 Cairo edition of the Quran, and others bring it out of conformity with it. We will now cover a few of the ones that show variants affecting the meaning of the text. In regards to insertions, in the late 7th century or 8th century, partial codex called BNF Arabi 327, in Quran 2386, it originally lacked the word al-Saba, which means the seven a word which is in this verse in the modern edition of the Quran. This early Quran was later changed by a scribe to then include the word, bringing it in conformity with the modern edition. So originally, this manuscript did not read as the modern edition reads. Moreover, in the 8th century Sana Mushaf Sharif manuscript, in Quran 4915, it originally had the word Mu'minu, which means they believe. But then a later scribe added the letter Nun, changing the word to Mu'minun, believers. In the top copy Mushaf of the 8th century, the word Allah is added by a later scribe. In Quran 66.8, in regards to erasers, in the 8th century St. Petersburg Hajazi manuscript, two words were erased after the word what, and before the words do you worship. In Quran 26.70, only after this erasure is the text the same as the 1924 Cairo edition of the Quran Muslims use today. So what was censored and erased? In the 8th century Sana Mushaf Sharif manuscript, letters are erased between the words you all and of whom, in Quran 7, 158, the modern reading does not contain what was erased here. In the Tobkapi Mushaf manuscript of the 8th century, something is erased between the words two-third and the night. In Quran 73, 20, whatever was erased is not in the edition of the Quran currently in use. Regarding the 8th or 9th century al Husayni Cairo manuscript, something is erased after the word Fasaka. In Quran 49, 6, moreover, while for this verse the word Fasaka is used in this manuscript, conversely, the word Fasak is instead used in the 1924 Cairo edition of the Quran Muslims use today. In regards to erasers overwritten, in the Paris Petropolitanus manuscript, in Quran 3, 171, there is an eraser overwritten where the word
word favor is added later by a different scribe when it was not originally there. Moreover, in the 8th century St. Petersburg Hejazi manuscript, there is an entire line erased and then overwritten in Quran 7 189. The resultant writing matches with the 1924 Cairo edition Muslims use today, which means whatever was originally under the newer text is not in the Quran in use today. In the same manuscript, part of the word he listens was erased and then written over to then read they listen, bringing it into conformity with the standard modern text. What is interesting is he listens in this manuscript is probably accurate and the they listen of the modern Quran is probably not. This is because the preceding word he who originally suggests a singular object as in this manuscript, not a plural object as in the modern Quran. In regards to overwriting without erasers, in the 8th century Sana Mushaf Sharif manuscript in Quran 3104, there is a combination of letters that do not make sense written over some text, which in the modern 1924 Cairo edition of the Quran reads, the commanding in the top copy Mushaf of the 8th century, in Quran 7032, the first instance of they in the text is written over top, replacing something which is not discernible. Because of the change, it now agrees with the Quran in use today. Regarding covering the 8th or 9th century Al Husayni Cairo manuscript, in Quran 2 187, covers something between the words so eat and until. The edition of the Quran Muslims use today reads eat and drink until. What was originally covered in the area which now reads and drink, we will never know. In the same manuscript, on one page there are numerous phrases covered, in Quran 2 191 193. What was originally covered, we will never know. In the same manuscript in Quran 3, 161, what in the modern edition reads, he brings, and judgment, is covered and censored. Why? In regards to covering overwritten, the 8th or 9th century Al Husayni Cairo manuscript in Quran 11, 7 has a covering with the word clear written over it. So these are but a small handful of the many hundreds of intentional changes Brubaker has uncovered. Such intentional changes in the earliest Quranic manuscripts refute the idea the earliest Quranic manuscripts come from a uniform, complete, perfect Uthmanic Quran. He notes the evidence shows, quote, a process over time of a movement toward a standard that was not entirely complete during the period represented by the manuscripts I have considered. The theory of a single written standard by 656 AD or 35 to 36 AH seems inconsistent with what is seen in the manuscripts." Unquote. He continues, There can now be no doubt that the manuscripts of the Quran have undergone some alterations, and that simple standardization of orthography of the technology of written Arabic is insufficient to explain every instance of this alteration. Neither do the early Muslim historical, exegetical, and Quran literature seem to fully account for the range." Unquote. When the manuscripts do begin to appear, they all begin to appear in the early 8th century, mid 8th century, up into the 9th century. And yet, they still are not standardized, they still are not uniform. They have to be corrected, hundreds of corrections, insertions, erasers, coverings, tapings, writings over top. There was no complete Quran, and that every one of the Qurans that we've looked at, every one of them is different from each other, and not one of them is exactly the same as the Quran we have today. There certainly was no complete Quran in the 7th century, and there is no such thing as a Quran that's unchanged. Every Quran has been changed. So when was the Quran finally written down in its final form? The Quran we're using today comes from less than 100 years ago. That's this Quran right here. That's the Arabic. That was canonized and finalized in 1924. It's less than 100 years old. Which means Muhammad had nothing to do with the Quran. And if Muhammad had nothing to do with the Quran, then who in the world is Muhammad and what is his purpose? How damaging this is for Islam. Because every one of the radical Muslims, the Abu Bakr Baghdadis, the Sheikh Al-Bakri Muhammadis, the Boko Haram, the Al-Qaeda, the, uh, the, certainly the ISIS group, all of them are absolutely dependent on two things. They are absolutely dependent on this book being God's eternal word. And they're absolutely dependent on Muhammad being the eternal prophet, the greatest prophet, the seal of all prophets, the greatest model for all mankind. Without the Quran, without Muhammad, they are left on high and dry. And we've just destroyed everything that they are dependent on. These are, their, these are not my manuscripts. These are their manuscripts. This is their material. Therefore, we're going from strength to strength. We've never had it this easy. In 33 years of working in Islamic world, I've never had it this easy. And can you can see the conclusions are not, not good for Islam. Islam, I believe, this material that I just shared with you in the last 15 minutes, this is the material that's going to destroy Islam. Now, Islam teaches on the Day of Judgment there will be scales for good works and for sins. If the person has more good works than sins, they will enter paradise. Thus, good works cancel sin. Moreover, in the Hadith literature, we are told that a man who murdered 100 people was admitted into paradise by Allah because when he died, he was on his way to go to a place to learn about repentance, though he did not actually repent yet. These teachings call into question the Islamic God's attribute of justice. Is a judge truly just if he simply overlooks sin or says good works cancel out sins? If he does not punish sin, then he is not a perfect, just judge. Therefore, Allah's attribute of justice is defective, rendering Islam false. In Christianity, however, God is a just judge because he both admits people to heaven and punishes their sin. He does not simply overlook their sin. The believer's sin is imputed onto Christ, the perfect, willing, spotless sacrifice, who pays for it on the cross. Therefore, the true Christian God maintains his attribute of justice as a perfect judge, 
while also saving believers. Now, Muslims will often say it is unjust for Jesus, an innocent man, to die or atone for the sins of others. However, according to Yahweh, the true God, sin is a debt which must be paid. And because he loves his people, he set up a way for a spotless sacrifice to pay that debt so we don't have to in hell. It is not unjust because God set up reality that way. Plus, Jesus voluntarily gave his life for his people to pay their sin debt. Moreover, the Islamic sources themselves teach Jews and Christians will be thrown into hell in the place of Muslims. Sahih Muslim 66, 65 through 66, 68. Um, you have several passages where uh, Muhammad declares that Muslims with sins as heavy as a mountain will, uh, will approach on, on Judgment Day and Allah will take their sins and put them on the backs of Jews and Christians. So Jews and Christians, according to Muhammad, will be punished in hell for the sins of Muslims. Allah is going to take away the sins heavy as a mountain from the Muslims and put them on the Christians. And you know, here it's, it's, it's just interesting because Muslims condemn Christianity as unjust for Allah to punish Jesus for the sins of Muslims when that's what Muhammad said, but Muslims don't know it because they don't read their sources. That's why we have to tell them. Finally, the Quran teaches God ransomed Abraham's son with a mighty sacrifice. This means a sacrifice, an animal sacrifice according to the Muslim scholar Ulama Usmani, was made in the place of Abraham's son as a ransom, so he did not have to die. This is substitutionary sacrifice. Therefore, again, the Muslims are inconsistent when they gripe about Jesus' atonement. Now, because the true Christian God is holy, he demands perfect conformity to his law in order for someone to enter paradise. Sin will not enter paradise with him, for he is too holy. It was only one sin that led to Adam and Eve being banished from the Eden paradise. The way believers can attain this perfect holy standard is having Christ's perfect record of righteousness imputed to them by faith, union with Christ. Jesus fulfilled the law with his perfect life of righteousness, and his perfect record of righteousness is imputed to the believer's account by faith. So it is as though the believer obeyed the law perfectly and can therefore be admitted to paradise. In Islam, however, God is not truly holy because he allows Muslims into heaven, even though their record says they have not obeyed all of Allah's laws perfectly. Just as long as they have more good deeds than sins, they can enter. This renders Allah's attribute of holiness deficient. Uh, the problem with Islam's view of salvation uh, really begins with a faulty view about God, man, and the fall. Uh, I'll just take one of those since uh, we have some time constraints, but since the God of Islam is not triune, he's not, it should be obvious, an essentially loving being. Since there is no one there for Allah to love prior to creation, uh, love for Allah is really an afterthought. Uh, furthermore, Allah's love is contingent, not only in the sense that it depends on the existence of creatures in order for there to be an object for Allah to love, uh, but contingent in the sense that according to the Quran, Allah does not first love sinners who in turn, and as a result, love him. Uh, rather, sinners must love Allah, who in return might then love them. Uh, moreover, in order to be loved by Allah, a person must be righteous, according to Islam sources. Allah loves those who are righteous and doesn't love those who are not righteous. And, and this means that it's not the love of Allah that transforms corrupt sinners. It's man, by his righteousness, that uh, moves Allah to love him. It's man's love, then, that's transformative. And it's Allah who's really being transformed by the transaction. Okay, this is not only a defective view of salvation, but it undermines Islam's claim that Allah is a self-sufficient being, and it makes Allah and his attributes and nature contingent on human action. Uh, so instead of being immutable and the great initiator, Allah becomes the ever-mutable and not-so-great responder to man. In this film, we have proven from the early and authoritative Islamic sources that Muhammad was a satanic false prophet. We showed his gross immorality and ruthlessness, his doctrine and practice of offensive jihad, and what he has brought to the world. We saw Muhammad's absurd teachings, false prophecies, and historical, logical, and scientific inaccuracies. We saw the evidence Muhammad was demon-possessed. We observed how the Bible gives us a trustworthy picture of Jesus, that Jesus died and rose, and that Jesus is God. We have seen that the first century biblical data on Paul is unanimous and clear. We saw that the early Muslim utilization of the Ebionites' testimony as an argument is hopelessly fallacious in light of the evidence and the consensus of scholarship. And we saw that there is a very early strand of Islamic tradition that grants the validity of the Apostle Paul. We witnessed that Muhammad and Islam are not predicted in the Bible, and we observed where the Quran stole its stories from, as well as the textual unreliability of the Quran. After all is said and done, Muslims have a serious decision to make. If we just focus on the passages that Muslims want to bring up, namely, no bearer of burden shall bear the burden of another. Even in these passages, notice what they say. They don't say, no one can bear the burden of another. They say, no bearer of burden shall bear the burden of another. In other words, no one who already has a burden of sin can bear the burdens of others. Why? Because you have to answer to God for your own sins. You can't go taking away the sins of other people. Well, what would this leave open? This would leave open the idea of someone who has no sin being able to bear the burdens of others because he has no burden on his own. And so, according to Islam, there's only one person ever who was sinless, and that's Jesus. And so the message of Christianity and Islam can be compared like this. According to uh, Christianity, the one person who could ever bear the burdens of others did it. And the message of Islam is that the one person who could ever bear the burdens of others didn't do it. And yet they claim that they have a superior view of Jesus. Well, to understand the Christian view of salvation, it's necessary to know the problem that man has according to the Bible. That is to know what man needs to be saved from. According to God's word, men and women are guilty and corrupt. And as guilt-ridden sinners, we're liable to punishment. And as corrupt sinners, our natures are polluted, and this corruption extends to every part of us. Our minds are darkened, our wills are enslaved to sin, and our emotions or affections are, sent on, are set on the wrong things. Now, the gospel, the good news that Christ was born, lived, died, was buried, rose again, 
that he ascended into heaven and that he received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit and poured him out upon us all, uh, that answers to or satisfies those, or satisfies those two fundamental problems. Uh, you see, the work of Christ, that is his life of perfect conformity to the law of God, and his substitutionary atoning death, wherein he was uh, subjected to and endured the wrath of God in our stead, that provides the grounds for God to remove our guilt and justify those who believe. On account of Christ, God freely forgives, uh, forgives our sins, uh, and he declares us righteous upon believing. That is, he imputes Christ's righteousness to us and declares us righteous on that basis. Now, given uh, our inborn corruption, whereby uh, we're indisposed to God in truth, uh, we would never look to Christ for salvation, uh, we would never seek to bring our lives into accord with the truth of the gospel, uh, because of this, it's necessary for the Spirit to effectually call, draw, and uh, bring us to Christ, which he does by regenerating us, giving us a new heart, illuminating our minds uh, to know the truth as it is in Jesus, renewing our uh, wills uh, to receive Christ as he's offered in the gospel, and creating in us holy affections, a love for Christ and holiness. So the Christian view of salvation is centered on the grace of God, who freely remits our sins and accepts or uh, accounts us as righteous uh, in his sight on account of Christ, and gives us a spirit whereby we are transformed in our inner man and then strengthened throughout the course of our lives and enabled to pursue holiness in the fear of the Lord. You want a book that talks about a man, not just any man, God who became man. That's Jesus Christ. <laughs> Why? You want to follow somebody that's consistent, somebody who does bring peace, somebody who died for you. Can you imagine God dying for you? Yet that's exactly what God did in the form of Jesus Christ. He took on human form. He humbled himself. And he became a man, became a servant, to die for you. Ah, that's the man for today. I give you Jesus, and I give you his gospel. God bless you. Come on home.